This is Audible. Harper Collins presents Skullduggery Pleasant Bedlam by Derek Landy. Read by Kevin Healy. This book is dedicated to Laura J. Because apparently having a book dedicated to you doesn't count unless it's a skullduggery book. Hey, I get it, I do. But does that mean I can never stop writing these? Because that's going to be pretty difficult, seeing as how everyone dies at the end of this one. Oh man, now look what you've made me do. I've ruined the ending for all the nice people. Don't worry everyone, this book has a happy ending. Super happy, with rainbows. Do you think they bought it? Yeah, me too. Phew, that was a close one. It's a good thing you're cute. It really is. And from the everything came the universe, which grew and spread and took its place beside the others. And life grew and spread. Chapter One Magic The place dripped with the stuff. It gathered in the corner booths, spilled over the long, lacquered bar, and crawled its way across the floor, grinning its slow, idiot grin. It was in everything. The music, the drinks, the words spoken and the laughs they provoked. It was stitched into clothes and etched into jewellery. It was in the quaffed hair, the lipstick. That's what sorcerers did now. Free from the old rules, they took their magic and they experimented. They pushed their powers into sigils scrawled on squares of paper. They shared and swapped, dipped in and dabbled. For some... It meant a night of unforgettable wonder. For others, it meant sinking into a cold, dark place with no walls and no floors and no way to climb out. But the party went on. The party always went on. The sorcerers looked at Valkyrie when she walked in. They knew her. They all knew her. Valkyrie Kane, the arbiter, the detective, her dark hair loose, still wearing her jacket, still cold from outside. Twenty-five years old, six feet tall and made of muscle and sinew, a pretty girl with a nasty streak. And where she was, he was, emerging from the other side of the bar, Skullduggery Pleasant, the arbiter, the skeleton detective, wearing a black three-piece with a blue shirt and black tie, his hat pulled low over one eye socket. If bad news had a name... It answered to skullduggery. The conversation faded just for a moment, then swelled again, as if acting innocent was going to save anyone. They talked and laughed, every one of them hoping that they weren't the person the arbiters were looking for. Not tonight. Please, whatever God you believe in, not tonight. Valkyrie took off her jacket. There were those who were impressed and those who weren't, but they all looked... They looked at her shoulders, carved from granite, and peeked at her abs when her T-shirt rode up, carved from marble. They saw the work she'd put in, the sacrifices she'd made, the punishment. Most of them would never know what it took to go through that. None of them knew the pain that drove her. Christopher Rain, at least, knew of the effort involved. He was a man who loved his muscles as much as he loved his suits. The suits were from Italy, The muscles came straight from Detroit. Valkyrie and Skullduggery sat at his table and didn't say anything. Skullduggery took off his hat. Rain watched them, smiled, nodded to Valkyrie. Thought you'd be bigger. No, you didn't, she said back. He looked away, raised a hand. I got a girl could bench press you. His girl stood up. She was taller than Valkyrie. Bigger arms. Her thighs stretched her trousers. Valkyrie barely glanced at her. I'm not here to outflex your gym buddies. I'm here to talk to you about Dr. Nye. I know you are, said Rain and laughed. (laughs) Everyone knows you are. You've been looking for that messed up freak since before Christmas. That's over two months now. Why is that? It's a family matter. A family matter involving Nye? Youch! He chuckled. 
You ever think that maybe it don't want to be found? We don't much care, said Valkyrie. We're going to find it anyway. We've heard you might know where it is. Rain shook his head. I don't associate with the Krenga. They may talk like they're kind of human, but they're not. They're monsters. Intelligent monsters, hell yeah, but monsters. You can't trust a monster. Valkyrie put a square piece of paper on the table. It had a sigil drawn on it. I don't know what that is, said Rain. Of course you don't. People are calling it a splash. Oh, said Rain. Oh, I heard about this. Little jolts of magic shared between friends, am I right? Just enough to make you feel good. Sure, Valkyrie said. Completely harmless fun if you don't count the potential side effects. Rain's smile widened. Side effects, Miss Detective? Oh, you're talking about those mages who lost control for a bit, right? Hurt a few people. Such a shame. Yes, it was, said Valkyrie. She tapped the piece of paper. This is one of yours, isn't it? One you've sold. What a positively outrageous accusation. I am deeply, deeply hurt. We talked to some people, said Valkyrie. We did our homework. These little splashes started appearing six weeks ago. We traced them right back here. Back here? Rain said, eyebrows rising. Back here, said Valkyrie, nodding. Wow, I mean, I'm assuming you have evidence? You've been watching too many mortal cop shows, Christopher. We don't need evidence. All we need is the suspicion, and then we let our sensitives take a peek inside your mind. That would be worrying, if indeed I was involved in a criminal enterprise, and I didn't have the best psychic barriers that money can buy. For the first time, Valkyrie smiled. I'm a bit of a sensitive myself, she said. I've only just started to find out what I can do, but I bet I could break through those pesky barriers of yours. I think I'd like to see you try. How'd you do it, Christopher? His face fell. Have we stopped flirting already? Oh, that wasn't flirting. See, we know you don't have anyone in your crew who could come up with these splashes. Something like this is relatively easy to replicate, but not at all easy to create. We think you had outside help. Ah, said Rain. You think Dr. Nye is responsible. That's what we think. And so you're hoping that I still know where that gangly, no-nosed freak might be hiding out. That's exactly it. Rain finished his drink and a waitress appeared, taking the empty glass and replacing it with a fresh one. Skullduggery watched her hurry away. Do you have mortals working in your bar, Mr. Rain? He asked. Sure do. I got a few of them. It's perfectly legal and they're cheaper than hiring one of us. No mage wants to wait tables or scrub toilets, you know. Back to Dr. Nye, Christopher, said Valkyrie. I told you, I don't associate with Krangarians. I'm a business owner. I run a bar. I'm not a criminal. I don't deal drugs, magical or otherwise. I am a law-abiding citizen of Roarhaven, and I pay my taxes, the same as everyone else. Now, I just met you, and I like you. But right now, I'm feeling... Hmm, what's the word? Harassed. I feel like you're harassing me. You're welcome to buy yourself a drink and stay, chat, make new friends. I would love to see you loosen up. But I'm afraid I'm going to have to call a halt to the interrogation. You don't have much of a say in it, said Valkyrie. Rain's gym buddy came over then the tall woman with all the muscles. This is Panthea, said Rain. She's one of the door staff here. She is well within her rights to throw you out of this bar. All she needs is an excuse. Valkyrie sighed and stood. The chatter stopped. Only the music continued. Skullduggery started to rise, but Valkyrie put a hand on his shoulder as she stepped round him. You want to take the first swing? she asked, looking up at Panthea. Panthea sneered. 
So you can arrest me for assaulting an arbiter? Oh, I wouldn't arrest you for something like that. So, I could knock you the hell out and I wouldn't land in a jail cell? I doubt you'd be able to, said Valkyrie, but sure. Panthea smiled. So, how do you want to do this? Valkyrie asked. Want to go outside? Want to clear a space? Want to just throw each other over tables? I can do whatever you want. Not the third one, said Rain. Please, these tables cost money. I'll give you the first shot, Valkyrie said. One clean shot, right across the jaw. See if you can knock me out. Panthea grinned. A shot like that? You'll be eating through a straw. If I could just interject, Skullduggery said, attempting to rise again. Once more, Valkyrie put a hand on his shoulder, keeping him down. Not right now, she said. I'm having a conversation with the pretty lady. Panthea arched an eyebrow. You think I'm pretty? You have gorgeous eyes. Compliments won't stop me from beating you up so bad you crawl home to your mammy. I wouldn't expect them to, beautiful. Panthea folded her massive arms. Okay, well, you can stop, because I am many things, but beautiful is not one of them. Are you kidding? Valkyrie said, with your bone structure. I've got a busted nose. Your nose has character. It's cute, and it makes the rest of you even cuter. Panthea sneered again and looked Valkyrie up and down. Your arms are amazing, she said at last. You think so? You're hitting all the right angles, Panthea said, nodding. Well, your arms are phenomenal. Yeah, said Panthea, but it's hard to find clothes that fit. Oh, God, I know. I'm confused, said Rain. I thought you two were going to fight. Panthea hesitated, then glanced at her boss. I don't think I can, Mr. Rain. I like her. Ah, oh, Valkyrie said. Thank you. I like you too. I'm looking for a gym to train at here in Roarhaven. Where do you go? Fit to fight, down on Ascendance Street. Hey, said Rain. I go there. I don't want her at my gym. Valkyrie and Panthea ignored him. Actually, said Panthea, I only work doors part time. The rest of my day I spend down there as a personal trainer, so... Valkyrie bit her lower lip. Do you think you could fit me in? Definitely. Rain stood up. OK, what the hell is going on? We're flirting, said Valkyrie. This is what flirting is, Christopher. Panthea, you can't flirt with her, Rain said, scowling. She's an arbiter and a... a... customer. Panthea frowned. Is she a customer if she hasn't even bought a drink? You have a boyfriend, Panthea. So what? Valkyrie said. I have a girlfriend. Doesn't mean we can't indulge in a little harmless flirting. Yeah, said Panthea. Lighten up, Christopher. Skullduggery finally stood. This night has not gone the way I had envisioned, he said. Mr. Rain, the whereabouts of Dr. Nye. I don't know, Rain said, all trace of good humour having left his eyes. I don't know where that freak is, and I don't care. If it did come up with the splashes, and I'm not saying it did, or that I'd even know if it did, then it took its money and it departed without leaving a forwarding address. And how did you contact the good doctor in the first place? I told you, I'm not a criminal. But if I were a criminal, which I am not, then I'd still have nothing to tell you, because it would have come to me with the proposal. I see, said Skullduggery. Valkyrie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, she said, and pointed to a man sitting at a table nearby. That guy. The man paled instantly and sat up straighter. You've been pretty handsy with the wait staff, Valkyrie said, walking over. A little pat on the backside here, a little pinch there. He shook his head quickly. Valkyrie loomed over him. You think that's a nice thing to do? She asked. 
You think that's acceptable? The man cleared his throat. <clears> throat> I, I... Stand up, please, Valkyrie said. The man hesitated, then stood. You mind if I give you a little pat? She asked, and she slapped him, the heel of her hand crashing into the hinge of his jaw. He went up to his heels and toppled backwards, unconscious, before he hit the ground. Oh, man, said Rain. You can't do that. Panthea, she can't do that to a paying customer. The paying customer assaulted staff, Panthea said without moving. If you see Dr. Nye, please let us know, Skullduggery said, picking up his hat and walking to the door. Be sure to tip your waitress, Valkyrie said to the rest of the patrons, joining Skullduggery on his way to the exit. Panthea came up behind her, handed over her jacket. Valkyrie slipped it on, gave Panthea a wink and left. That, Panthea said once the door had closed, was pretty badass. Chapter 2 You're mad at me, Valkyrie said as they left the bar. I'm not mad at you, Skullduggery replied. I made the situation worse. Rain didn't know anything that could help us. We knew that was a possibility before we set foot in the place. I nearly started a fight. You did technically assault a man, Valkyrie scowled. Not him, Panthea. I almost started a fight with Panthea. I wanted to. I wanted to smack someone. You certainly managed that. She stopped walking. It was a cold February night. They were saying it might snow. There's something wrong with me, she said. Skullduggery turned to her. Yes, you've got a serious case of humanity. I'm afraid there's no cure. I'm not joking. Neither am I, Skullduggery said, and put his arm round her, pulling her into his chest. You're coping as best you can with Alice's situation, but you're angry, not with me, because no one could be angry with me, but with others, and yourself. Is that what we're calling it now? Alice's situation? What would you prefer to call it? Valkyrie didn't know. She doubted she could find a pithy way to encapsulate the killing of her own sister and the subsequent damaging of her soul. She shrugged. Alice's situation is fine, she murmured, sagging against him. But how are we going to find Nine now? We found it back in September when we weren't even looking for it. But now, when we need the bloody thing, it's vanished off every radar we can think of. We'll find Nye because that's what we do. We find things. Clues. Truth. Inappropriate humour at inappropriate times. Trouble, she said. Yes, said Skullduggery. We find trouble. No, said Valkyrie, stepping away from his hug and nodding ahead of them. Trouble! A city guard patrol car was parked in the next street over. Its engine was silent, its lights off. Beside it was a small shop. The door had been kicked open. Crashes came from inside. They ran across the road. Skullduggery was first through the door, Valkyrie right behind him. She readied herself for a fight, an unpleasant part of her hoping that the cops were heavily outnumbered and tonight was the night when she'd get to cut loose. She had a lot of anxiety to work through. Instead, they arrived to find three city guard officers trashing the place in the dark. Two men and one woman. The woman noticed them and hissed to the others. They stopped what they were doing and turned. Valkyrie recognised one of them. Sergeant Yonder. She didn't like him. Well, said Skullduggery, this should be good. Yonder didn't say anything for a few moments. When at last he spoke, what he said wasn't very convincing. This is official city guard business. You can't be here. We're arbiters, Skullduggery said, stepping over the remains of a smashed shelf. We can be anywhere we want to be. Yonder bristled. Your jurisdiction! 
is absolute. That's what you were going to say, wasn't it? You two, identify yourselves. The woman squared her shoulders. I'm Officer Lush, she said. And I'm Officer Rattan, said the third cop. And what exactly is going on here? Skullduggery asked. We had a report of a break-in, said Yonder. We came to investigate. Valkyrie picked her way across the floor. Did you find anyone? Yonder glared. The suspects had fled before we arrived. And the mess? It was like this when we got here. Who owns this shop? Skullduggery asked, and their attention switched back to him. I don't know, said Yonder. Do you think perhaps it might be a mortal? Yonder shrugged. Because we've heard stories, Valkyrie said, and they all looked at her. You know, all those pesky mortals from Dimension X. The Leibniz universe, Skullduggery corrected. She ignored him. You know how they were all given the empty houses in the West District? That's quite close to here, isn't it? They've only been there for five or six months, but they're already working hard to make a new life for themselves, away from Mevolent and all the nasty, nasty sorcerers from their home dimension. Well, we heard that there were some nasty sorcerers over here, too, and they were robbing these mortals. Not robbery, Skullduggery said. Extortion. Valkyrie snapped her fingers. That's right, extortion. Their little businesses would be targeted and threatened, and they'd have to pay these nasty sorcerers to not trash them. Yonder didn't seem overly sympathetic. That's too bad, he said. Protection rackets are the bane of small business. Have these crimes been reported to the city guard? Well, that's the problem, Valkyrie said, passing Lush. It seems the nasty sorcerers doing all this damage are city guard officers. Like you guys. That's a serious accusation, Lush said. Valkyrie smiled at her. I'm in a serious mood. Yonder's radio barked to life for a moment. When it went quiet, he nodded. OK, duty calls. You two have a good night. He went to walk out, but Skullduggery stood in his path. Yonder narrowed his eyes. You're impeding a sergeant of the city guard. I'm just standing here. Yonder went to walk round him, but Skullduggery stepped into his path again. Now I'm impeding you. Did I ever congratulate you, by the way, on your promotion? Congratulations, Sergeant Yonder, Officers Lush and Rattan. You're all under arrest. Surrender your weapons and we won't have to hurt you. There was a heartbeat of silence, and then Yonder laughed and looked at his friends, and they laughed too, as if Valkyrie and Skullduggery couldn't read the intent in their eyes. Yonder went for his gun, and Lush went for hers, and Valkyrie punched her in the throat and shoved her back. Rattan had his gun out, and he was aiming at Skullduggery, but Skullduggery was throwing Yonder to the floor, and Rattan couldn't get a clear shot, so he switched targets, swinging the gun round to Valkyrie. Valkyrie's hand lit up, and lightning streaked into his chest, blasting him backwards and filling the air with ozone. Still gasping, Lush pulled her gun and Valkyrie grabbed her wrist with one hand and punched her in the face with the other. She ripped the gun away, tossing it into the shadows, and Lush snapped her hand out and a wall of air took Valkyrie off her feet. She hit the ground and rolled, looked up in time to dodge a fireball. Energy crackled around her body. The fine hairs on her arms stood up. Lush threw another fireball and Valkyrie straightened, holding out her left hand, her magic becoming a shield that the fireball exploded against. Lush ran for her gun, but Valkyrie caught her in the side with a streak of lightning that spun her sideways and sent her down. Valkyrie pulled her magic back in and quelled it before it scorched her clothes. That was getting to be a problem. Yonder was lying on his belly, his hands cuffed behind him. You can't do this! He raged. I'm an officer of the city guard! Not for long, Skullduggery said. Yonder rolled onto his side so he could glare at him. No one will believe you. Commander Hawk knows you've had it in for me from the beginning. He'll take my side. 
He won't have a choice, Valkyrie said, walking over. He'll do what Supreme Mage Sorrows tells him to. Yonder snarled. You're so smug, aren't you? You're in with the Supreme Mage, so you get to strut around doing whatever you want. Let me tell you, let me be the one to tell you, that time is coming to an end. You hear me? Things are going to change around here. Despite her worries, despite her anxiety, despite everything that had happened and everything she had done, Valkyrie looked down at Sergeant Yonder and found she still had the capacity to laugh at stupid people. Chapter 3 Omen, Miss Gnosis said, leaning forward, her elbows on her desk and her fingertips pressed together. We need to talk about your future. Omen darkly nodded. The office, filled with the morning sun, was nice and neat and smelled of some exotic spice that was not too pungent. Miss Gnosis had books everywhere. Her desk was packed full of stuff. She looked like she had a lot going on. Omen, she said. He looked up. Yes? Your future. How do you envision it? I haven't really thought about it too much. I realise that. Miss Gnosis said in that cool Scottish accent. She pushed a form towards him. Do you know what this is? It's the SYA. And what does SYA stand for? Senior Year's Agenda. Very good. Miss Gnosis sat back. What age are you now, Omen? Fifteen. So you've got another two years of school after this one, and maybe two years after that before your surge. Do you have any idea yet what discipline you want to specialise in? Well, I... I mean, I suppose being an elemental would be, you know... He trailed off. Do you want to be an elemental? Miss Gnosis asked. You don't sound too enthused. Yes. No, I, I mean, sure. Is there anything else you'd rather be? Omen shrugged. Back your brains, Omen. Is there any discipline other than elemental magic that you would like to do for the rest of your life? Because that's what we're talking about here. The discipline you're focused on when you have your surge... Is the discipline you're stuck with from then on? She hesitated. You do know how the surge works? Yes, miss. Good, good. Like, it'd be cool to be a teleporter, Omen said. I'm always late for stuff, and I get car sick on long journeys, so that would solve a lot of my problems. Teleportation is one of the tricky ones, Miss Gnosis replied. You generally have to be born with the aptitude for it, like never was. Yeah, I know, Omen said, a little glumly. See, miss, the problem is I'm just not very good at most things. Ah, Omen, don't be so hard on yourself. It's true, though, I'm not. I'm no good at energy throwing or... Proper names, please. Sorry. I'm no good at ergokinesis... And I did want to be a signum linguist, but I just find it hard to understand all the letters. Which is a problem when it comes to language, Miss Gnosis said. But you still got time to decide. What I want you to do is come up with a list of seven disciplines, realistic disciplines, to take into your final two years of school. Then you can figure out which one you want to specialise in. And what if I can't? Then you'll still have two or three years after you leave in which to make your decision. You're putting a lot of pressure on yourself to have this worked out. But do you want to know a secret? Nobody has it worked out. We're all just playing it by ear. No one knows what the future has in store. Augur knows. Your brother's situation is slightly different. Sensitives know what's in store. No, they don't, 
Miss Gnosis said. Sensitives can see a future, not necessarily the future. But what about that? What about becoming a sensitive? Omen's face soured. We're doing one of Miss Wicket's modules right now. And how's that going for you? She paired me up with Augur, because siblings have a strong psychic connection, and twins have an even stronger one. I'm aware. And we did that test. You know, the one where we sit opposite each other, and I look at a card with a pattern on it, and he has to, like, read that pattern in my mind, and then we switch. Augur got every single one right. And how did you do? I fell off my chair. Oh. I think it's a balanced thing. <laughs> Miss Wicked says psychic stuff can upset your equilibrium, so... Anyway, today we're going to try to talk to each other using only our minds. You might be better at that. I don't see how. Miss Gnosis smiled. Omen, come on. A little self-belief wouldn't hurt now, would it? It's just... We're the only set of twins in the class and Augur can do it all brilliantly and I'm kind of holding him back. I doubt he sees it that way. Omen gave a little grunt. Miss Gnosis let him out a few minutes early, which allowed him to get to the toilets without being caught in the sudden crush of students. In fact... He had time to take the scenic route to his next class, past both the north and the east towers. He descended the staircase in the main building, quickening his pace ever so slightly, and arriving outside his next class just as the bell rang. Doors opened, and each room vomited forth a never-ending torrent of teenagers dressed in either black trousers or skirts with white shirts and black blazers. A few of Omen's fellow fourth years passed, their blazers, like his, had green piping. He nodded to them. They ignored him. He shrugged. He took his seat in the next class. Never came in, looking half dead from exhaustion, and sat next to him. You doing okay? Omen asked. No, never said, gazing blearily at her desk. Did we have homework to do? Omen took out his books. Yes. You didn't do it. Never gave a groan as an answer, and peered at Omen through one eye. Why are you smiling? Omen shrugged. It's just very unusual to have you being the one who's struggling while I'm doing all right, that's all. Maybe it's a sign that I'm finally getting my life in order, that I'm finally becoming the person I'm meant to be. Or, never said, this could not be about you and actually be about me and how hard it is to juggle being fabulous at school with being fabulous at having adventures. So, really, it could be either. All those adventures taking a toll, are they? Never laid her forehead on the desk so that her hair covered her face. I'm bruised and battered. I get into fights now. Real, actual fights. Me, a pacifist. You're not a pacifist. Well, no, but I hate fighting. I hate the pain aspect. Also the effort aspect. Fighting would be so much easier if you could do it from your phone, you know? Damn these physical bodies. And now, never said, sitting up and flicking her hair back. I wouldn't go so far as to damn my physical body, Omen. I'm blessed with this form. See these cheekbones? I will never take these for granted. But I do ache... I mean, I can't be expected to follow your brother into every single battle, can I? He's the chosen one. He's got the strength and the speed and the skill. I just have the bone structure and the attitude. Case and Mahala aren't chosen ones, said Omen. How do they do in these battles? They've been doing this for longer, never countered. They're better at it than I am. There you go, Omen said. You just have to give it time and then you'll be as good as they are. Never lolled her head back and looked up at the ceiling. Three days ago, we were fighting this guy, a child of the spider. Ever seen one of those people? They're creepy enough in their human form, but when they change... You actually saw him transform? Oh, yes, 
said Never. It was gross, like seriously disgusting. He sprouted all these extra legs, his body contorted, his face became a spider face. And the sounds, great Caesar's ghost, the sounds, squelching and tearing and popping and more squelching. And at the end of it, he's twice as big as us and a spider, a spider, Omen. You're not afraid of spiders, are you? I tend to get slightly arachnophobic when they're three times the size of me. Understandable. So we were fighting this giant spider and I realised I'd forgotten to do the biology homework. You thought about biology when you were fighting a giant spider? Well, yeah, said Never. It just popped into my head. The module where we studied insects and arachnids. And then we had that chapter on the children of the spider and how we still don't really know how they came to, like, be spiders. Yes, said Omen. I remember the lesson. Do you? Omen hesitated. No. Thought not. Anyway, I asked Augur about the homework. While you were fighting? Oh, wow, no. I've still got a long way to go before I can have light-hearted discussions while trying not to die. I just don't have the stamina. I'm out of breath the entire time. So I waited until after, and you know what he said? He'd done the homework? Well, yes, but do you know how he'd done the homework? I would imagine by doing it in his spare time. Will you please stop spoiling my stories by knowing what I'm going to say? Sorry. Never sighed and continued. He did it at night. The previous night, after we'd sneaked back to our dorm rooms. Four o'clock in the morning and he's making sure his homework's done. The same with Case and Mahala. So, so why didn't you do that? Never frowned. Because I was sleeping. But why didn't you? Because I was sleeping. Never repeated. I love my sleep, Omen. It's one of the eight things that I do best. You can't expect me to not sleep because of homework. We all have our limits. The lines in the sand we do not cross. That is mine. Omen nodded. It's a great honour just to be around you sometimes. Mr. Shu walked in and closed the door. Can I copy off you? Never whispered. Oh, Omen whispered back. Sorry, no. I didn't do the homework either. Why the hell not? Omen shrugged. I was thinking about other things. Never glared. Right then, said Mr. Shu. Let's start off with last night's prep. Who can give me the answer to the first question? Never? Never sagged. Chapter 4 Razia was bent over the sink in the ladies, doing her makeup, because that was practically the only room in the whole of Coldheart Prison where the light was good enough. And Abyssinia was in there with her, the two of them just spending time together, not bothering to talk, just two Sheilas hanging out, enjoying the silence, alone with their thoughts. And then Abyssinia said, I don't know if I do. Razia stopped applying her mascara and frowned. Had Abyssinia been speaking this whole time? Had Razia been answering? Was this another one of those conversations she forgot she was having halfway through? Struth, as her dear old dad used to say. Her dear old dad used to say a lot of things, though. Her dear old dad could talk the hind legs off a kangaroo. Was that a saying? Was that a popular phrase back in Australia? She couldn't remember. Her past got so hazy sometimes. She wasn't even sure if she had a dear old dad, at least one that she'd known. She had a vague image of a nasty man, quick with his fists. But she didn't like that image, so it went away, and was replaced by Alf Stewart, the cranky but lovable old guy from Home and Away, the greatest television show ever made. Yep, a much better dad to have, she reckoned. Maybe. She hadn't seen that show in years. Did they still make it? Oh, bloody hell. Abyssinia was still talking. Now Razia had completely lost track of what was going on. 
The only thing she knew for sure was that her mascara wasn't all done, so she went back to applying it. Knowing Abyssinia, she was probably talking about her long-lost, now recently recovered son, Kason. She was always talking about him. Razia got it. She totally understood. Kason was family, after all. Nothing more important than family. And it was nice seeing Abyssinia so happy. Those first few weeks, when Kason didn't do a whole lot more than have bad dreams while sedated, were the happiest she'd ever seen Abyssinia. She was so proud of her son for sticking it out, for surviving all that pain. It had reinvigorated her too, having her son around. Suddenly her attention was back on the plan, because the plan secured Kason's legacy. That focus had slipped a little, but now it was back on track. In less than two weeks, it would all kick off. Razia couldn't wait. She hadn't killed anyone in ages. But now that Kason was up and about, it had quickly become clear to anyone paying attention that he was a weird one. That wasn't easy for Razia to admit. She'd always seen herself as the weird one in Abyssinia's little group of misfits. So to voluntarily hand over the title to a newcomer, even if he was the long-lost son of the boss, just felt wrong. But there was no denying it. Kason was an oddball. She couldn't blame him, of course. He'd been tortured pretty much non-stop for ninety years. That would lead anyone to hop on an imaginary plane and take a sojourn from reality. His flesh was scarred. His silver hair, so like his mother's, grew only in clumps from a damaged scalp and his eyes always seemed to be focused on something not quite in front of him and not quite in the distance. The fact was, though, he could have been a lot worse. According to Kason, this was all down to his jailer, Serafina. She knew that if he retreated deep enough into his mind, there wouldn't be much point in torturing his body. So every few weeks Kason would be given the chance to recover, to get strong, and then it would happen all over again. The whole thing was just so delightfully sadistic. Razia hoped one day to meet Serafina. She'd been hitched to that malevolent fella from ages ago, the one who'd caused all that bother with the war and all. Razia reckoned she could learn a thing or two from someone like that. Abyssinia sighed. <sighs> what do you think? Razia blinked at her in the mirror. Abyssinia clearly wasn't asking about her hair, because it was the same as it always was, long and silver. The red bodysuit, maybe? Abyssinia's recently regrown body was still pretty new, and the suit did a lot to keep it maintained, but she'd been wearing variations of it for months, and so Razia didn't think she had chosen now to ask how she looked. Must be Kason again. Well, Razia said, the real question here, Abyssinia, is what do you think? Abyssinia exhaled. I think we press ahead. Yeah, said Razia. Me too. This is what we've been working towards, and I shouldn't let new developments derail us from our goals. I've been promising you a new world for years and I'm not going to abandon you, not when the end is finally in sight. Good to hear. But I just don't know what to do about the darkly thing. Razia did her best to look concerned. She did this by pursing her lips and frowning at the ground. She didn't see what the problem was. The darkly prophecy foretold a battle between the king of the Darklands and the chosen one, Augur Darkly, when the boy was seventeen years old. That was still something like two years away. Plenty of time to kill the darkly kid before he could kill Kason. It all seemed simple enough to Razia. Abyssinia, like most people, had a tendency to overthink things. Prophecies are dodgy, Razia said, applying a bit of red rum lipstick. If a prophecy foretells what happens in the future if nothing changes from this point onwards then all you have to do to avert that prophecy is not do what you otherwise would have done. Bam! On the other hand, 
how can you be certain that what you don't do is in fact what leads to the prophecy being fulfilled? Fair dinkum, it's a complicated business, but like most complicated businesses, it's also deceptively simple. Abyssinia frowned. I don't think that's entirely true, though. What do I know? Razia asked, shrugging. With the back of her hand, she smudged the lipstick to one side, then down to her chin. Perfect. I'm nuts. Chapter 5 Valkyrie let herself into her parents' house, went straight to the kitchen, and found her mother reading at the table. Oh, good God! Melissa Edgley said, jerking upright. Valkyrie laughed. <laughs> Sorry, thought you'd heard me. Melissa got up, hugged her. You don't make a sound when you walk. I suppose that's all your ninja training. I don't have ninja training. Sorry, her mum said. Your secret ninja training. Valkyrie grinned and eyed the notebook on the table. What are you reading that has you so engrossed? This, said Melissa, is your great-grandfather's diary. One of several, in fact. Your dad found them in the attic, packed away with a load of junk. Ah, diaries, said Valkyrie. The selfies of days gone by. What are they like? They're beautiful, actually. Beautiful handwriting and beautiful writing. So that's where Gordon got his talent from. Well, he didn't lick it off a stone. Melissa hesitated, then looked up. Your dad's in the other room. He's, uh, not in the best of moods. What's wrong? Melissa waved the diary. He's flicked through a few of these. Your great-granddad was a firm believer in the legend that the Edgleys are descended from the Ancient Ones. The last of the Ancients, Valkyrie corrected. But why does that make him grumpy? He knows it's all true now. And that, her mother said, is the problem. Valkyrie took a moment. Ah, she said. Maybe I should talk to him. That might help. Valkyrie walked into the living room. Desmond was sitting in his usual chair. The cricket was on. Hello, father, she said. Hello, daughter, he responded, not taking his eyes off the screen. She sat on the couch. Enjoying this, are you? Yes, actually. Who's playing? Desmond nodded at the TV. They are. Good game? Not sure. Who's winning? Don't know. What are the rules? No idea. I didn't know you even liked cricket. He sat up straighter. This is cricket. She settled back. Mum told me about the diaries. Desmond muted the TV. My granddad had the best stories, he said. The three of us would sit around his armchair and he'd just... I don't know. Regalus, I suppose. Regalus with family legends about magic men and women doing all these crazy things, all because we were descended from the last of the ancients. But my father... Well... He'd grown up with those stories and he was sick of them. He suffered from a, I suppose you'd call it a deficit of imagination. And he used to ridicule the old man every chance he got. In front of us, I didn't like that. Right, said Valkyrie. And Fergus followed suit, turned his back on Grandad and his stories. He'd always needed our father's approval more than Gordon or me. So siding with them against what they both saw as nonsense and fairy stories was one way of building a bond Fergus felt he was missing. I wonder what he'd say now if we told him the truth. I don't think I could do that to him. Valkyrie didn't say anything to that. It wasn't her place. Me? I love the stories, Desmond continued. They meant something. They meant there was more to life than what I could see around me. They meant I could be more than what I was. Because of my granddad, I wasn't restricted like my friends were. I had, I suppose, a purpose, if I wanted to seize it. 
So you believed him? Said Valkyrie. I did, Desmond said. For a few years. When I was a kid. But I got to age ten, I think, and my dad sat me down and told me there were no such things as wizards and monsters. How wrong he was, eh? Desmond smiled. Gordon was the troublesome one. Always had been. Even his name rankled our dad. Fergus and I had good, strong Irish names, but Gordon... <laughs> My mother insisted on naming him after the doctor who delivered him. It was her first pregnancy and there were complications, but that doctor worked a miracle, and the future best-selling author came into the world and brightened it with every moment he was here. Our granddad passed all those stories, all that wonder, down to Gordon, and he just absorbed it. He believed, like I did. But unlike me, he never allowed our father to trample that belief. That's what he had that I didn't, I suppose. A strength. Desmond shifted in his chair. All those stories, they're in the diaries. You should read them. I will, said Valkyrie. Desmond took in a breath. It was shaky. He expelled it slowly and looked at her. I'm glad we know about the magic, he said. It's terrifying, knowing that you're out there, endangering your life, and it makes the world a scarier place, but I'm glad nonetheless. I wish I'd kept believing when I was younger. I really do. Still... I'm thankful Gordon did. Our granddad needed someone to believe him. Valkyrie didn't know what to say. So she got up and hugged her dad. He hugged her back and then shrugged himself out of his bad mood and turned off the TV. Cricket is a silly game, he said, and none of it makes any sense. Where's your mum? Kitchen, she said, and followed him out. Are you in a better mood? Melissa asked when they walked in. I am, Desmond responded, kissing the top of her head. Sorry for snapping at you earlier. She looked up, surprised. You snapped at me? Didn't I? When? Earlier? I don't recall that. Well, maybe I didn't snap as such, but I was Kurt, and for that you have my most sincere. When were you Kurt? He frowned at her. Earlier, he said again, when we were talking about the diaries. I was Kurt when we were talking about the diaries. You didn't notice. I noticed you being a little grumpy. He looked offended. That wasn't me being grumpy. That was me being Kurt. That was my inner darkness shining through. Weren't you scared by the glimpse of the monster lurking beneath the surface? Not really. Oh, Sorry, dear. You're just too cuddly to be scary. I am frighteningly cuddly, he admitted. But I'm sure I was dark too, once upon a time. You were pretty dark that day you threw that guy through a window, Valkyrie said. That's what I'm thinking of, said Desmond, clicking his fingers. I knew I'd done something cool. My cool dad, Valkyrie said wistfully. So, are you going to read the diaries? I am, he replied. I will. I owe it to my granddad. It might even give me an insight into what you get up to, saving the world every single day. I don't save the world every single day, Valkyrie responded. I take time off. I go for walks. I go to the gym. I train. Wait now, said her mum. Where's the part in that schedule where you have fun? I have loads of fun. Do you have any friends? Do you go to the cinema? Go out for dinner? What about boys? Valkyrie opened her mouth to speak, but nothing came out. Her dad narrowed his eyes. You're hesitating. Why are you hesitating? It's because we're not going to approve, isn't it? What is he? Is he a werewolf? Is he a mummy? Dad, is he a cannibal? God, no. Why would I go out with a cannibal? Love is blind, Stephanie. If you love someone, 
That means you're willing to overlook flaws in their character, like cannibalism and being too pretty. Your mother possesses one of those flaws. I leave it to you to figure out which one. Such a charmer, said Melissa. I'm not dating a cannibal, Valkyrie said. Are you dating someone? Her mum asked. Valkyrie nodded. And? When are we going to meet him? It was on the tip of her tongue. It's not a him. So easy. Such an easy sentence to say. All she had to do was open her mouth and say it. But she took too long, and now her dad was nudging her mother's shoulder. It's your fault, he said. She won't bring him home to meet us because she's afraid you'll embarrass her. This is always a problem when you have one really cool parent and one lame parent. Melissa shook her head. I preferred you when you were grumpy. I wasn't grumpy. I was dark. I'm going to say hi to Alice, Valkyrie said, turning on her heel. We're not finished with this boyfriend stuff, her mum called out after her. Valkyrie retreated, away from the possibility of disappointing her parents, even though she knew they'd understand. They were liberal, progressive people, after all. They'd handle the truth about magic without unduly freaking out. She was sure they'd have no problem with the whole girlfriend situation. But even so, it made her tummy flip as she climbed the stairs. Chapter 6 her sister's door was open. Alice sat in the corner of the room, peering into the hamster cage. Hey you, Valkyrie said. Stephanie! Alice cried, scrambling up and launching herself forward. Valkyrie laughed and caught her and hugged her. Hey, gorgeous girl! Are you staying for dinner? Alice asked, face buried in Valkyrie's hip. I can't, Valkyrie said, prizing her off. I've got to go to work. With skullduggery? Yep. But I couldn't pass without calling in to say hi to the best little sister in the world. Do you want to see me dancing? I'd love to, but I don't really have time. Did you learn any more moves? Yeah, a few, Alice said. Do you want to see them? Tomorrow or the next day, said Valkyrie. And bad dreams? Alice laughed. You always ask me that. I know I do. I'm interested. I never have bad dreams. Not even about the horrible man. Ew, said Alice, making a face. No, I don't think about him. He was smelly. I still haven't told Mum or Dad about him. It's still our little secret. Valkyrie forced a smile. Thank you, she said, feeling the guilt start to weigh down on her. She quickly walked over to the hamster cage eager for a change of subject. So how's Spongebob? Alice laughed. That's not his name. Is it not? Are you sure? It's Starlight. Starlight the hamster? Yes, I think I remember something about that. Where is he? Is he hiding? There he is, said Alice, pointing at a lump of fur in the corner of the cage. Hello, you, Valkyrie said, hunkering down. She poked a finger through the cage and petted little Starlight. He was cold. He's dead, said Alice. Valkyrie stopped petting him. She withdrew her finger and said, Oh, he died during the night sometime, Alice continued. Last night I fed him. Well, Dad fed him. And I cleaned out his cage and I put new hay in a new newspaper because he likes playing in newspaper and he rips it all up sometimes and then he died, I think. Valkyrie let herself sit, her back against the wall. And when did you find out that he'd died? A few minutes ago, Alice said. Like ten or five? I can show you my dancing if you like. Let's just wait a moment, sweetie. How are you feeling? Alice shrugged. I'm fine. Did you love Starlight? Alice nodded. Did you love him a lot? Like loads, said Alice. I used to close my bedroom door and let him out so he could run around and then he'd come over to me 
and climb onto my lap and I'd pet him. Like, I didn't love him as much as I love mum and dad and you, but I still loved him. Will you miss him? Um, yes. Are you sad? Yes, Alice said and nodded again. Valkyrie held out her hands and when Alice took them, she pulled her gently down. Come here, she said. Sit. When Alice was seated, Valkyrie gave her a soft smile. When you say you're sad, do you actually mean you're sad? Or are you saying it because you think I'm expecting you to say it? Alice didn't answer. It's okay, whispered Valkyrie. You're not in trouble. I'm just interested. Um, Alice said. I'm not really sad. Valkyrie nodded and kept nodding, waiting for the panic in her chest to settle down. OK, she said. OK, thank you for telling me. Will you miss him? Yes, Alice said with absolute certainty. I'm going to miss him loads. And do you know what missing him means? Have you ever missed anyone before? A shy smile broke out. Not really, Alice said. Missing someone is when you get sad that somebody isn't there anymore. Do you think you'll get sad now that Starlight isn't alive and you can't pet him and cuddle him? The tip of Alice's tongue came out and took up temporary residence at the corner of her lips. Um, maybe. Valkyrie switched on her aura vision, reducing her sister to a dark outline, throbbing weakly with a dim, almost imperceptible orange. It was so spread out, so diffused, that it was barely there at all. She switched off the aura vision before it made her sick with guilt, pulled Alice in and wrapped her up in a hug. You know what love is, don't you? Of course, said Alice. And you love me? With all my heart. And I love you too, with all my heart. They sat there, hugging. Is it okay that I don't get sad? Alice asked softly. Valkyrie kissed her head. I'm going to fix that. You don't have anything to worry about. I'm going to find someone who can help you. And I'm going to fix everything. Alice nodded and didn't respond. And Valkyrie hugged her closer and tried not to cry. Chapter 7 It's nice here, isn't it? Axelia looked, said. Omen looked up. He'd been daydreaming about being good at things, about being as cool as Skullduggery, or as tough as Valkyrie, or as capable as Augur. He hadn't even noticed the tram emptying the closer they got to the humdrums. It was only Axelia and him left on it now. He looked out of the window. I suppose, he said, although to him this part of Roarhaven looked pretty similar to most of the other parts apart from the fact that it was right beside the enormous wall that encircled the city. Was that what Axelia was talking about? Did she like walls? The wall's pretty, he tried. The wall's ugly, Axelia said immediately. It's horrible and grey and horrible. That's what I meant. It blocks out the sun in the mornings for this whole part of town. It's so horrible. Omen agreed. But the rest of it, said Axelia. It's so nice. It's peaceful, isn't it? Quiet. Omen nodded, but he wasn't quite sure that was true. The humdrums were where the mortals lived. The more than 18,000 refugees who had trudged through the portal from the Leibniz universe to escape their very own Mevolent, who was still alive and terrorising the ones left behind over there. Roarhaven had taken them in, mainly because there was nowhere else to keep them, and the High Sanctuary had assumed responsibility for turning them into productive members of society. Axelia had grown up in a magical community in Iceland, where she'd had very limited interactions with mortals. 
Omen was beginning to think that maybe she viewed mortals, and these ones in particular, as quaint, somewhat primitive beings. It was ever so slightly condescending, he felt, and possibly ever so slightly racist. The tram stopped, and off they got. The humdrums was definitely quieter than other parts of the city. No one here had cars, because no one could drive yet. Back in their own dimension, these mortals had been the serfs to the ruling class of mages. They'd lived in huts and hadn't had access to technology. Here they were free. They worked and were paid. They'd been introduced to the delights of television and the internet. They could walk the streets without being accosted by sorcerers. Hello, said Omen to a passing mortal. Would you like a pamphlet? The mortal shrank back, but took a pamphlet and hurried on. The bag over Omen's shoulder was weighed down with these pamphlets. This week they were handing out information about the First Bank of Roarhaven, China's sorrows' pride and joy. Even mortals could save their money there, according to the pamphlets. It was perfectly safe and truly wonderful. Omen doubted this would work. The mortals here were more inclined to stash their money under their mattresses than hand it over to some huge institution where they didn't know the rules. But volunteering for this stuff got Omen out of the last class of the day, so he didn't mind too much. They folded pamphlets and stuck them through letterboxes and chatted whenever they regrouped at the end of a street. Axelia had already handed in her senior year's agenda. She wanted to be an elemental, she said. There were a lot more of them flying these days, like Skullduggery did. She'd always wanted to fly. Flying would be cool, Omen admitted. But he was wary of the fact that it required so much concentration. His mind was inclined to wander, after all. They made their way to the square in the middle of the sector. It didn't have a name yet. The mortals intended to vote on one in the coming months. The High Sanctuary even offered to have a statue erected to someone they admired, mortal or mage. They were still deciding on that as well. Ornia was waiting for them with a few other mortals. She waved as they approached. Her companions, one girl and three guys, left her to it. As they passed, one of the guys rammed his shoulder into Omens. Before Omen knew what was happening, he was being loomed over and forced backwards. What? said the guy who'd rammed him. What? Omen blinked up at him. What? What? demanded the rammer, his teeth bared, his eyes wide. I'm sorry? The guy's friends were pulling him back and Axelia was suddenly standing between them and Ornia was running up. Hey! Axelia said. Hey! Back off! The guy glared at her, glared at Omen and allowed himself to be dragged away. Are you okay? Ornia asked. Omen, did he hurt you? No. Omen lied, rubbing his shoulder. Who was that? That's Buok. Axelia frowned. Buok? Buok, yes, said Ornia. He's... I don't know. He doesn't like sorcerers, and he wants everyone to know it. He just gets very angry sometimes, living here surrounded by magic people, it makes him unhappy. Well, I'd stay away from him if I were you, said Omen. You really don't want to be around someone who's that volatile. He's my boyfriend, Ornia said, wincing. That's your boyfriend? I thought your boyfriend was nice and sweet and happy. Didn't you tell me that? And look, is all of those things, Ornia replied. When sorcerers aren't around... Also, I think he doesn't like you because you wanted to kiss me. That's hardly fair, said Omen immediately. When I wanted to kiss you, he wasn't your boyfriend. And why would you even tell him that? Of course he hates me now. Ook needs to learn that you are not his property, Axelia said. Oh, he knows, Ornia replied. He's just being stupid. He's really very sweet and kind. He makes me happy. She sighed. But what he did just now was terrible, and he'll either apologise to you, or he won't have a girlfriend anymore. 
You'd break up with him? Flexelia asked. That's the expression I was searching for, said Ornia, pointing at her. Break up with him, yes. I still don't know the proper phrases. In our culture, we don't even have equivalents. Anyway, yes, I'll break up with him if he doesn't say sorry. That's okay, said Omen. It's no big deal. He doesn't have to. Ornia reached into Omen's bag, took out a handful of pamphlets and flicked through them. Of course he does, she said. There's a polite way to behave and a rude way. I'm not going to go out with someone who's rude. Axelia grinned. I like you more and more every time I see you. Ornia grinned back. I like you too. Does anyone like me? Omen asked hopefully. Sure we do, said Axelia. You carry the bag. Chapter 8 The car hit a pothole and Valkyrie cursed, glared at nothing in particular and carried on. The roads around here were getting worse. No mortal officials bothered with them because, as far as they knew, these were tiny country roads that led nowhere. And no magical officials bothered with them because these were, technically, mortal roads and mortals had to take care of themselves. Those were the rules. Valkyrie slalomed very carefully round the next set of potholes, fully aware that she was using her irritation about the potholes to push her worries about Alice into the back of her mind. As long as it worked, she didn't much care. She turned onto a wider road. An old man nodded to her. She nodded back. The road was better here. The giant potholes that Swiss cheesed the surface were nothing but illusions. She could drive right over them and suffer not one jolt. The air shimmered ahead. She drove through the cloaking shield and the walled city of Roarhaven appeared before her. The cleavers let her through Shudder's gate and she swiftly weaved her way towards the circle. She gave Old Town a miss, that was the only area where the traffic built up, and approached the High Sanctuary from the south. She took the ramp down into the car park then walked across and stood on a tile and it shot off the ground, twirling as it ascended. It clicked into place in the floor of the marble foyer and she stepped off. Skullduggery was waiting beyond the steady stream of mages, wearing a black three-piece, black shirt, red tie, with a red band on his black hat. You look like a gangster, she said, joining him. Good afternoon to you, too. Should I have dressed up? We get to see China so rarely these days that I feel I should have dressed up. Maybe wore a hat of my own. Skullduggery shrugged. When in doubt, wear a hat. That's what I always say. You do always say that. A young woman approached, well-dressed, her fingers swiping a tablet screen. She tapped it off and held it by her side as she reached them. Arbiters, she said. Please follow me. The Supreme Mage is waiting. Lead on, said Skullduggery, and they followed her from the foyer. You're the new administrator, are you? She glanced back. I am. My name is Cerise. The Irish Sanctuary has not had the best of luck with administrators, Valkyrie said. They're like drummers in Spinal Tap, you know. Spinal Tap, Detective Kane? There's a high turnover, is what I mean. You sure you want this job? I have been a student of the Supreme Mage since I was sixteen years old, Cerise responded. It is an honour to serve her now. But to handle the day-to-day -day running of the whole High Sanctuary? The High Sanctuary is run by mages more talented and resourceful than I, Cerise said. All I have to do is run them. Valkyrie didn't say anything but she thought that was a pretty good answer. Cerise led them to a set of double doors, solid and plain, and she bowed again as they passed her. The chamber was small. There was a table at its centre with six chairs round it, four of which were occupied. China Sorrows sat on the far side of the table, her posture perfect, her head up, her blue eyes unfocused. Detective Pleasant, Detective Kane. Welcome, Aloysius Vespers said as soon as they entered. 
The English Grand Mage came over and shook their hands. He was one of the only sorcerers Valkyrie knew who wore actual robes, like a wizard in a movie. His white hair was long and his beard was braided. He had small teeth. Please, he said, indicating the chairs. Sit. The chairs were sturdy and hard, no padding. This was a chamber for doing business and making decisions, not for idle conversation and time-wasting. The American Grand Mage, Gavin Prator, poured them each a glass of water. He slid one to Valkyrie, started to slide the other to Skullduggery, then must have realised Skullduggery didn't drink, because he picked up the glass and took a sip from it himself without missing a beat. Should we begin? Sturman Drang said. We are all busy, are we not? And time is not on our side. It never is, said China, blinking her way out of the whispering and disconnecting from the city around her. Skullduggery, Valkyrie, thank you for coming. It's so hard getting an appointment to see you, Skullduggery replied. So, when you call, we're all too happy to oblige. I assume you want to talk about the problem in the city guard. China waved her hand. I'm meeting with Commander Hawk later today to discuss the fate of Yonder and his little friends, but I definitely see jail time in their future. That is not why I called you here, however. She tapped the table and the wooden surface flickered and small screens came to life beneath the grain. The screens showed a photograph of the American president, Martin Flannery, walking across the White House lawn, deep in conversation with a slight man in an ill-fitting suit. The man next to the president is Bertram Wilkes, Flannery's personal aide. Grand Mage Prater? A little under six months ago, Prater said, Wilkes disappeared. The official line is that he resigned due to the workload and planned to travel extensively in order to recharge his batteries. He has not, as far as we know, been seen since three days before he left his job, but that has been difficult to ascertain due to the fact that he has no family and, apparently, no friends to note his absence. It is our belief, however, that Wilkes was a mage, and we believe he was murdered. Skullduggery shifted ever so slightly in his seat. Go on. Prater tapped the table, and a black-and-white photograph appeared of a group of friends smiling for the camera. We retrieved this from a woman we believe Detective Kane interviewed last year in San Francisco. Valkyrie recognised a few of the faces. Richard Melior, Savant Vega, Azadine Smoke, and a friend of Tempers, Tessa somebody. Four others too, one of them being Bertram Wilkes with radically different hair. We don't know his actual name, said Vespers. All we know is this Wilkes persona, which, as you can imagine, is a well-executed forgery. But, judging by the company he kept, it is not far-fetched to conclude that he may well be associated with Abyssinia. So you think Abyssinia sent him in undercover to the White House, Skullduggery said. Why? We don't know, China responded. But we believe that the American president had him killed. You think Flannery knows about sorcerers? Valkyrie asked. We do. So how bad is this situation? We have had worse scenarios, said Drang. World leaders, law enforcement officials, media organizations, they have all learned of our existence and we either find a way to guarantee their silence, or we resort to more extreme measures to keep our secret. Valkyrie frowned. What do you mean, more extreme? Nigh is not the time, said China. How extreme have we gone? China sighed. <sighs> Lengths, she said. Sanctuaries have gone to lengths to preserve our anonymity. 
we may have to go to lengths again here, as Flannery is not the most stable of mortal leaders. Whether Flannery knows about us or not, Skullduggery said, we've got to find out why Abyssinia felt the need to send a spy into the Oval Office. Do we know anything at all about Bertram Wilkes? The only lead we have is this person, China said, her fingernail tapping the table. A new photograph appeared, a tall man leaving a house, his dark hair shot through with grey. We've identified him as Oberon Geil, an American sorcerer who has just completed a three-year sentence in Iron Point Jail for robbery. That is roughly the sum total of the information we have about him. This is Bertram Wilkes's house that Mr. Guile is leaving, said Prater. We've been watching it for months, and Mr. Guile is the only person we've seen coming or going. This photograph was taken three days ago, and we've been keeping discreet tabs on him since then in the hope that he leads us to something more concrete. But our feeling now is that we must act. Which is where we come in, Skullduggery said. I am fully aware that, as arbiters, you do not work for me, China responded. But I would greatly appreciate it if you would make contact with Mr. Guile and find out what he knows and what he's after and how it connects back to Abyssinia and whatever dastardly plan she's hatching. Does that sound acceptable? It sounds positively acceptable, Skullduggery said. And in the meantime, you're going to be looking into corruption in the city guard and seeing how far it's spread, yes? China settled her gaze on him. Yes, she said eventually, a hint of reluctant amusement in her voice. I was just about to announce that. Valkyrie and Skullduggery stood up to leave. One more thing, China said. I have a favour to ask, actually. Skullduggery tilted his head. This should be interesting. I find myself somewhat conflicted of late, China began. Abyssinia is obviously a threat that must be taken seriously. We don't know what her plans are, but we can rest assured that they will not be in our best interests. She sees herself as a ruler, the princess of the Darklands and, I am sure, its future queen, and she will not stop until both the mortal world and the magical world are under her control. Whereas China would only be happy once the magical world stayed under her control was something Valkyrie decided not to say out loud. Abyssinia's actions and the actions of her little gang of killers are to be condemned. However... I must admit to being cautiously happy that Kason has been broken free from his almost century-long torture. As everyone in this room knows, I raised him, and he was almost like a son to me. Valkyrie kept her mouth shut. But more trouble is stirring, said China. Seraphina Day wants Kason back. She seems to think that because he killed her dearly departed husband, she owns the poor boy. So, as part of her efforts to recover him, she's coming here. I don't suppose she's planning a quiet visit, is she? Skullduggery asked. Gina smiled. Not entirely. She expects crowds, a red carpet, a reception, dinners. And that is what I have to request of you. I don't eat dinner, Skullduggery said. And you don't have to, China responded. I'm going to be greeting her on the front steps of the High Sanctuary on Saturday at noon. My esteemed Council of Advisers will be in attendance, of course, and I would greatly appreciate it if you too would be there also. Why? Valkyrie asked. A show of strength, China said. A show of solidarity. And also because we're arbiters, Skullduggery said, and we operate outside the jurisdiction of any one sanctuary. 
in theory, we're the only people with the authority to challenge someone like Serafina Day. There is that too, China conceded. Skullduggery looked at Valkyrie and she shrugged. We'll be there, she said. I'm not going to pass up the opportunity to meet the woman who married Mevolent. I can only imagine what kind of freak she's going to be. Chapter 9 Mr. President, we were thinking that maybe you need a cat. Martin Flannery, the President of the United States of America, the most powerful man in the world, the most important man in the world, and the most famous man in the world, swivelled his chair round and looked at the aide who had spoken. The Oval Office was full of people, his chief of staff, his directors of communication, his press secretary, aides and advisers and assistants, and one or two others. All their voices blurred into one after half an hour. This guy had caught his attention. What? he said. A cat? the aide repeated. Flannery didn't know his name. Aide's names were rarely important. Or a dog. A pet, basically. We feel it might soften your image. What's wrong with my image? The aide paled. Nothing? Flannery leaned forward, elbows on his desk. Then why do I need to soften it? The aide looked around for help. None came. That pleased Flannery. He liked to see people flounder. We just thought, the aide said, not nearly so confident now, that it might be a good idea to present a, uh, a more relatable image to the voters. They seem to relate to me fine when they voted for me, Flannery said. You think they've forgotten that? You think they've forgotten who I am? I, I didn't mean anything by it, sir. You know your problem, the lot of you. You're approaching it all wrong. People don't want to relate to me. They want to emulate me. They want to be me. I offer them what nobody else does. I offer them glamour, celebrity. I offer them opulence, and that's what they want. When they're paying for groceries or standing in line for a hot dog or watching the game, they think about me, and they know that if they put in the time and the effort, they could have what I have. This was a lie, of course. In order to have what Flannery had, they'd need his money and his keen understanding of power, a talent that allowed him to take risks that the average person couldn't even begin to comprehend. He was so far beyond them that it had stopped being funny a long time ago, but the fantasy seemed to keep them happy. The conversation turned to matters of policy, and Flannery's mind drifted to Dan Tucker, the vice president and the interview he'd given that made it sound like he was mocking Flannery's intelligence. Flannery would have to talk to him about that, or get his chief of staff to talk to him. He was sure it had just been a mistake. It had to have been. Then he thought about the big plan that he'd come up with, and he thought about Abyssinia and about how much he despised her. She was a witch, and she treated him with disrespect. Because of that, he didn't like talking to her. He quite enjoyed it when she rang his private phone and he didn't answer. That was a power move. His father had taught him all about power moves and Flannery had added a few of his own over the years. He was an expert at power moves. When the meeting was done, he dismissed them all and left the Oval Office. He went down the corridor and kept going until he entered the residence. He went into the dining room and shut the door then turned on the TV to find out what the press was saying about this whole Dan Tucker mess. It was not good. Everything OK, Martin? Flannery yelled and jumped. Crepuscular Vise sat at the table, halfway through a meal. His shirt sleeves were rolled up and he wasn't wearing his hat. His bow tie had butterflies on it. Flannery didn't like to see him eating. Having no lips made it unpleasant. How did you get that food? He asked, looking away. I picked up the phone and ordered it, Crepuscular answered. 
and then, in a startlingly precise impression of Flannery's own voice, said, Bring me a steak, fried to a crisp, with some fries, no vegetables. You're not a difficult man to impersonate, Martin, even though I was restricted to the terrible orders you regularly make. Steak, well done. That's a crime against cattle. With no idea how to respond to that, Flannery decided to let it go. To cover up this momentary weakness, he jabbed a finger at the TV. You hear this crap? You hear what they're saying? Crepuscular sawed through another bit of meat, then popped it between his teeth. I did. They're saying Tucker insulted me, Flannery said, feeling the anger rise again. They're saying he called me stupid. He's the vice president. He wouldn't do that. I'm the one in charge. He wouldn't be vice president if it wasn't for me picking his name out of a hat. You might not want to tell him that part. You're supposed to help me, Flannery grumbled. Isn't that what you said you'd do? Isn't that what you promised? Crepuscular didn't say anything. Good. That meant Flannery had him on the back foot. Not responding to a challenge showed weakness, which was why Flannery always responded to opponents with insults or scorn. Crepuscular, for all his arrogance, hadn't learned that yet. As far as I can see, Flannery continued, you haven't lived up to your part of the deal. This shouldn't be happening. The media shouldn't be reporting this stuff. What are you going to do about it? I get enough incompetence with my staff. I do not need it from you. Flannery stopped and waited for Crepuscular to respond. Crepuscular finished eating and dabbed at his lipless mouth with a napkin before he stood. He pushed the chair back into place and unfolded his shirt sleeves, buttoning them at the wrist as he came forward. He reached out and his hand closed round Flannery's throat and he walked him backwards. You seem to be mistaking me for someone else. Crepuscular said. Flannery wasn't a particularly athletic man, and he'd never played sport or learned how to box or wrestle, and in many respects he'd never had to actually lift anything heavy in his life. But even so, he was surprised at the ease with which Crepuscular pinned him to the wall. His height, his weight, his importance, none of it meant anything. To Crepuscular, Flannery was nothing but a weakling. You seem to be mistaking me for Mr. Wilkes, Crepuscular continued. He was the one you barked at and complained to and insulted. He was the one who scurried after you. Do you think I'm him, Martin? Is that what you think? Flannery tried to answer, but all he could do was gurgle. He could barely shake his head. I'm the one who killed him, Martin. Crepuscular said, I'm the one who snapped his neck after he'd finally had enough. I remember the look on your face when he stood up to you. Your bullying didn't seem to work on him then, did it? Darkness clouded Flannery's vision. He was aware of his own spittle on his chin. He was aware of the ridiculous sounds he was making. He was aware of his hands tapping weakly against the scary man's arm. His head pounded. His legs were jelly. And then Crepuscular moved him away from the wall and swung him round, and the backs of his knees hit something and he collapsed into a chair and Crepuscular was walking away. Flannery doubled over, gasping for air. You're doing a great job, Mr. President, Crepuscular said, his voice coming from somewhere behind the drumming of Flannery's own heartbeat. Don't let the liberal media get you down. They don't understand you. They don't see why the people love you. And they do love you. More than any other president since Lincoln. Nodding, Flannery straightened up in his chair. Crepuscular had put his jacket on. He was wearing another one of those checked suits he liked so much. He put on his hat and straightened his bow tie. Ten days, he said. Ten days 
and your plan goes into action. Ten days and the world changes, sir, and you go down in history. Are you looking forward to that? Flannery nodded quickly. Then who cares what they say in the news? And who cares what Vice President Tucker may or may not have called you? None of it matters. The only thing that will matter in ten days' time is the small naval base in Whitley, Oregon, and all the people who died there. Chapter 10 It was a messy business. Crying. Sebastian hated it. His tears would fog up the lenses on his mask, and his face would get all wet and dribbly and there wasn't anything he could do about it except wait. Eventually, the mask would soak it all up, just like it did when he perspired, or sneezed. Sneezing was the worst. Well, sneezing was the worst so far. Every night, before he went to sleep, he prayed that there would be no reason for him to throw up the next day. His suit. God, he hated that thing. The beaked mask that made him look like a crow. The heavy coat. The hat. Why was there even a hat? Why was the hat necessary? He hated it all. He longed to touch his own skin, to rake his fingers through his hair. Ever since he'd put the suit on, he'd been unable to scratch himself. Itches drove him mad. And breathing. Oh, how he missed fresh air. How he missed the taste of it and the feel of it. A breeze, what he wouldn't give to feel the slightest breeze against his face. But the worst thing about this whole mission was the loneliness. The sheer, terrifying loneliness of his situation. Every other day he'd get an update on the continuing search for Dark S. He'd stand there and nod while Forby took him through the details of what he was doing, pretending to grasp at least some of the fundamentals when it came to scanning an infinite number of dimensions for the slightest trace of Darkess's energy signature. He was sure Forby now regarded him as an idiot and probably regretted voting for him to be the leader of their little group. But, for Sebastian, it was one of the few chances he got to interact with a real live person. So he loved it. He loved every mind-numbingly confusing second of it. And every week they'd have their meeting. They'd all get together at Bennett's or Lily's or Kimora's, never at Ulysses's house because his wife didn't approve, and never at Tarry's because he said his place was always a dump. But they got together and they chatted and either Ulysses or Lily would bring cake. And even though Sebastian didn't need food, his suit took care of his nourishment and he couldn't eat even if he wanted to. It was good. He had friends. But then the meeting would end, and they'd all head back to their families and to their lives, and Sebastian would return to the empty house he'd made his own and sit there, in the dark, in the silence. Metaphorically, of course. Every house in Roarhaven came fully furnished and hooked up to electricity, so he actually sat in a warm, brightly lit house, watching TV or reading a book. But no amount of TV and no amount of books, as wonderful as they were, could ever provide him with the friendship he needed, that he'd once had, but he'd left behind. For the mission. For the damn mission. For the mission he was failing at. Of course he was going to fail. It was inevitable. He was going to let them all down. The world needed Darkess. They needed her power, even if they didn't realise it. And it was all up to him to find her. All up to Sebastian Tau, the plague doctor, the idiot who was going to ruin everything. There was a doomsday clock somewhere in the world, and it was ticking steadily down. A knock on the door snapped him out of his melancholy. He opened it. Bennett stood there, holding two bottles of beer. Hey, buddy, Bennett said. I was passing and... Sebastian frowned behind his mask. There's nothing beyond this house except more empty houses. Well, I meant I was in the neighbourhood and... <sighs> Bennett sagged. The fact is, my TV packed up on me and there's a game on tonight that I've been looking forward to, so I was wondering if I could watch it with you. Sure, 
Sebastian said, the brightness in his voice surprising him. Come on in. I'm afraid I can't offer you anything because I don't eat or drink. That's why I brought these, said Bennett as they walked into the living room. They're non-alcoholic, don't worry. I have to drive home. Wise man, said Sebastian. He sat in the armchair, searching for the remote, while Bennett took up his position on the couch. I'm pretty sure I have the sports channels. I vaguely remember flicking past a football game once. He found the remote and sat back. It's nice and quiet here, Bennett said. Yeah, Sebastian responded. No traffic outside. No neighbours. Bennett sipped his beer. It's been pretty quiet at my place too. Christmas was particularly hard. I'm just used to, you know, decorations and the tree and the music and all the fuss and the... the feeling, you know? But the house was very quiet this year. Very quiet. I didn't bother with any of the... things... That was Odetta's area. How is Odetta? She's good, Bennett said with a sad smile. She really seems to be happy with Conrad. He doesn't say much, you know. Or anything, really. Apparently hollow men can grunt if they churn their gases in a certain way. But I've never heard him make a sound. He treats her well, though, I think. I don't know. He doesn't do a whole lot except stand there. Right. Makes you wonder how bad a husband I must have been if Odetta chose a hollow man over me, eh? Bennett said and laughed. <laughs> but no, she's good. She's happier. And Case is living with them. He's doing well at school. He's a good kid. He is, Sebastian agreed. Do you spend much time with him? Not as much as I'd like. And now, with my new job and all... I've got to focus on not getting fired, so that cuts down on the father-son thing. You want my advice, Sebastian said. Spend more time with him. He deserves all the attention he can get from parents who love him. Yeah. We never know how much time we have left, Bennett. Bennett took another sip of his beer. This is true. If I had family, I'd be cherishing every moment I had with them. You don't have family? Not any more. You want to talk about it? Not especially. Sore subject? Yeah. OK, said Bennett. But if you ever do need to talk, that's what friends are for. Thank you, Sebastian said, fighting the sudden rush of warmth that threatened to bring tears to his eyes. He clicked on the TV so, what channel is the game on? Do you ever doubt what we're doing? Sebastian lowered the remote. What do you mean? What Forby's doing with the machine and all? Looking for Dark S? No, well, yes, but not the search itself, just the likelihood of finding her. Sebastian sighed. <sighs> it's tricky, he admitted. I've got this little voice in my head and every day it whispers to me maybe Dark Hess is dead. Maybe the faceless ones tore her apart years ago. Or maybe if we find her she won't want to come back. Sebastian frowned. You think that's a possibility? Don't you? I don't know. It never occurred to me that she might not want to return. I mean, this is her home. That she left? Well, yeah, but she left under false pretenses, didn't she? Which brings me to my next point, Bennett said. What if she comes back to finish the job? If we find her, if we tell her that she was fooled into thinking she'd ended all life on earth, what if she only comes back to do it for real? That, said Sebastian, is a possibility. We all know that. But do you believe it? No, said Bennett. But can I be trusted? Can any of us be trusted? We saw what Darkess can do. We saw her power and it unlocked something in us. A love and a devotion that could quite possibly be self-destructive. 
I don't think she'd kill us if she returned, but I might be wrong. We all might be wrong. Sounds like you're going through a crisis of faith, my friend. Bennett suddenly looked flustered, like he'd miscalculated. I mean, I mean, I, I'm still devoted to... Sebastian held up a hand. I didn't mean it as an accusation. Of course you're doubting all this. Everything you've said is 100% true. These are the thoughts that go through my mind a thousand times a day. Bennett relaxed. So how do you handle it? I... Believe, I suppose. I choose to believe that it'll work out, that we'll find her, we'll bring her home, and that everything will be okay. We're not alone here, Bennett. Bennett finished his first beer and put the empty bottle on the coffee table. Well, neither are you. I hope you know that. Sebastian smiled. Thank you. So, which channel is the game on? I don't know, Bennett answered. I don't even like football. I came over here because I was lonely and I thought we could hang out. Do you have any video games? I'm pretty good at... Bennett's phone beeped at the same time as Sebastian's buzzed. They looked at their screens at the same time. It was a message from Forby. I think I've found Darkess. Chapter 11 Valkyrie got back to Grimwood House at a little past nine. She got out of the car and Zena ran up to her and they cuddled until the dog calmed down enough for Valkyrie to open the front door. She flicked on the lights, dumped the day's post on the hall table and fed Zena. She ate leftovers in the quiet kitchen, washed the plate and put it away, then went upstairs to have a shower. Her phone chimed when she got out. It was temper fray asking them to meet him the next day. She messaged him back, then dressed in pyjama bottoms and a light top. On her way back down the stairs, the doorbell rang. She padded across the hall in her bare feet and opened the door. Tanith Lowe stood there in jeans and a warm coat, open over a Prince t-shirt, her blonde hair tousled. Valkyrie leaped forward, wrapping her in the biggest hug she could muster, Holy crap! Tanith wheezed. I missed you, Valkyrie said into her shoulder. I miss my lungs, said Tanith. I'm sure they were there a second ago. Valkyrie released her and jumped back, looked her up and down. Your hair's shorter, I love it. Where have you been? Away. What have you been doing? Things. How are you? Tormented. I want to hear every last little detail. She made them each a cup of tea and they sat on the couch, legs curled beneath them. Look at you, Tana said. Right up until you answer that door, I still had this picture in my head of you as a, not a kid, but a girl. But you're a proper grown-up, aren't you? Technically. How skullduggery? Same as ever. We've been dealing with a bit of a thing lately. Abyssinia. You heard of her? Tanith nodded. I try to keep up with what's happening. Is it true she's Skullduggery's ex? That is true, yes. Wow. Must have been quite a shock to learn he had an ex-girlfriend back in the scene. How about you? How about me what? Any boyfriends I should know about? Not right now, said Valkyrie. She took a breath. There is a girlfriend, though. Really? Tanith said, drawing the word out as her eyes got wider. You dark horse, you. When did this happen? A few months ago. Her name's Melitza Gnosis. She's a teacher at Carival Academy. Necromancer. Ooh, said Tanith. A bad girl. Valkyrie laughed. Not really. So, is this it? The full switch? Girls only from now on? Ah, uh, I still like boys too. You played that close to the chest, didn't you? I'm usually good at picking up on things like this. But you've surprised me. Valkyrie shrugged. You meet the right person at the right time, and you discover brand new things about yourself. 
I was a little surprised too, to be honest. But there you go. Have you told your folks? Valkyrie hesitated. Tanith smiled. Yeah, that tends to be the hard part. Coming out to other sorcerers isn't a big deal. We're all at it. But those limited lifespans mean that mortals tend to be a little more... conservative. Some of them. They're going to be cool about it, Valkyrie said. Of course they are. But I'm still nervous. Of course you are. How about you? Valkyrie asked, sitting back. Boys? Girls? Both? Neither, said Tanith. Been too busy for distractions. Is that why you're back in Ireland? Tanith sipped her tea, then put the cup on the saucer and the saucer on the coffee table. Yeah. Are you in trouble? When am I not? Anything I can do to help? Tanith shook her head. I got myself into this, Val. I'm going to get myself out. How brave, said Valkyrie. How noble. How dumb. If I can help, let me help. You have friends. I know I do, Tanith said, her voice quiet. She let a few seconds go by before speaking again. Have you heard of Black Sand? Sure, Valkyrie said. The terrorist group in Africa? Tanith did not appreciate that. They're not terrorists, Val. You can't believe everything the sanctuaries tell you. They're a resistance group. And what are they resisting? OK, Tanith said, shifting slightly. China wants control of the African and Australian sanctuaries, right? I mean, that's fairly obvious. Of course, said Valkyrie. She already controls one cradle of magic. She'd love to control all three. But she's not actually doing anything about it, is she? She would like control, but she's not trying to take control. That would be like declaring war on your allies, and she's not going to do that. Right? Except she is. Tanith, just listen. I could get you proof, but this isn't your fight. I need you to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. She can't just take them over, as much as she'd love to, so she's being sneaky about it. As far as I can tell, she's focusing on the three African sanctuaries first. She's got spies and double agents working in a, quite frankly, bewildering array of schemes designed to usurp the Council of Elders and replace them with her own people. Then they'll bow to China as their supreme mage and she can focus her attention on Australia. And Black Sand? Black Sand are resisting, Tanith said. They're targeting her schemes and disrupting them wherever they can. And you're involved with them, aren't you? They needed fighters and I... You needed somewhere to go, Valkyrie finished. Tanith looked away. I was lost, she said. With what happened to Ghastly and Billy Ray, I couldn't stick around, you know? I was looking for a fight, and they offered me one. But a few months ago, sanctuary forces rounded up a load of friends and families of Black Sand members. Innocent people, Val. Valkyrie frowned. They would have been interrogated by sensitives, she said. They can't be that innocent. They knew what was happening, but they had no part in it. And now the sanctuaries, who have no idea were doing all this for them, to keep them independent, have decided to make an example out of them by sentencing them to thirty years in prison, each. So you're here to convince China to release them? No, said Tanith. That'd never work. And she wouldn't be interested anyway. I'm here to offer up the Black Sand Leader in exchange for the people they've imprisoned. The Black Sand Leader, Valkyrie repeated. Yes. Valkyrie closed her eyes. Tanith, please tell me you're not the Black Sand Leader. I can't exactly do that, Val. Valkyrie groaned. She put her cup on the coffee table and leaned forward. They'll throw you in prison. 
Not one of the good ones either. Iron Point, maybe, or Cold Heart, if it was under sanctuary control. I know. The other convicts will kill you, Valkyrie said. You won't last a week. Oh, ye of little faith, Tanith said with an unconvincing smile. I give myself two, easy. Let me talk to China. Me and Skullduggery, we'll sort it out. You won't be able to, Tanith said. This is bigger than your friendship with her, Val. You know her. I know her. From her point of view, she'll have no choice but to be seen as ruthless and lock me away in the worst prison she has. The fact that she hates me and I hate her will have nothing to do with it. She's set herself on this course, just like I have. Valkyrie blinked. But, OK, wait, so why are you here? I mean, what's the plan? I told you the plan. No, you told me the stupid plan where you go to prison. I mean, the good plan where all this is taken care of and you stay out of prison. That plan doesn't exist. Not yet it doesn't, but that's because you've just come to me about it. I'll come up with a good plan. Skullduggery will. Well, he'll watch as I come up with a good plan. Skullduggery's not very good with plans, Tanith agreed. Don't do this yet, said Valkyrie. Promise me that, OK? Give me a little time to think of something. Val, I appreciate the offer, but there's really nothing you can do. Give me time. Innocent people are in jail cells as we speak. A few more days isn't going to matter, Valkyrie said. It'll give them time to maybe work out in the yard or something, start a diet, make new friends. Don't rush into this. No one's rushing, believe me. Valkyrie clutched Tanith's hand. Help us. Help you what? Help us with this thing, she said, this Abyssinia thing. We need all the help we can get. There are bad guys all over the place, more of them than there are of us. Help us with this. And then if your thing hasn't been sorted, or we don't at least have a good plan, then you can continue with your stupid one. Val, give me a chance to help you, please. Tanith sighed, and Valkyrie grinned. Chapter 12 Tanith got on her motorbike and rode away, and Valkyrie locked up the house and went to bed, Zena curled up on the floor beside her. She woke almost two hours later to Zena barking madly at two people stumbling through the bedroom. Valkyrie sprang out of bed, hands crackling with energy. Her bedroom was not her bedroom. Her bedroom was a town at night. Cars were on fire. Bodies lay on the streets, gunshots and screams in the distance. The stumbling figures were the Darkly brothers. She took the magic from her hands and knelt beside the dog. It's okay, she said. It's not real. It's okay. Zena stopped barking, but kept growling. The brothers changed direction, and the town shifted around Valkyrie, keeping them in view. The effect was dizzying. She'd seen this before. It was part of a vision of the future she'd had multiple times, but never like this, never focusing on just this one event. Something was different about it. It felt more real. It felt more urgent. She knew why. It was closer. It was going to happen, and it was going to happen soon. Augur was bleeding badly. Omen dragged him on. The people in the helmets and blackbody armour came after them, Guns up, swarming across the road. Professional. Relentless. They opened fire. Three bullets struck Omen, and he went straight down without even crying out. And Augur turned to help him, and another burst of bullets sent him spinning. Stop! Valkyrie snarled. Stop! The vision slowed, and then froze. Valkyrie stood. This was new. She'd never done this before. She'd never even considered that she could do this. Zena came forward too, sniffing at Omen, confused when she detected nothing but empty space. Valkyrie moved towards the people with the guns, but they were beyond the walls of the bedroom, and as much as she tried to shift the vision to bring them closer, it wouldn't budge. 
She doubted she'd be able to glean anything new from them anyway. They wore no badges, no patches, no identifying markings. The only thing she knew about them was that they were well-armed and that they killed teenagers. The vision flickered. It was breaking down, and giving her a headache while it did so. Grimacing against the pain, she looked around for a clue as to where she was, where this was happening, was going to happen. There was a car parked by the side of the road, just beyond the wall behind her bed. The vision flickered again. She just had time to glimpse the license plate before the vision washed away, leaving her pressed against the wall. Oregon. Omen Darkly was going to die in America. Chapter 13 Lunchtime. Omen finished eating, grabbed his bottle of rock shandy, and went looking for someone to talk to. Mr. Peckant passed and scowled for no reason other than scowling at Omen was what he did. Omen was pretty sure it was becoming Peckant's favourite hobby. He found Never on one of the benches in the second floor corridor, talking to Grey Keller. They laughed, and Grey got up and made another joke, then laughed again as he walked away. Omen sauntered over, took Grey's place on the bench, and wriggled his eyebrows. Never frowned at him. What's your face doing? It's weird, and I don't like it. My face is asking you a question, said Omen. It's asking... Is there anything going on that I should be aware of? And my answer is, undoubtedly, never said. Like, a serious amount is going on that you should be aware of. Schoolwork is only the beginning of it. I mean about Grey. What about Grey? You and Grey. Oh, said Never, taking a drink from his bottle of water. No, Grey is lovely and everything and undeniably cute, but he isn't interested in me. You want me to talk to him? Never looked horrified. About me? Great googly moogly, no! Why would you even suggest that? I have a few classes with him. We chat occasionally. I could tell him how cool you are. First of all, he knows how cool I am. Everyone knows how cool I am. Look at me. Second, He's not interested in me because, from what I can tell, he's not interested in anyone. Being interested in people is just not his thing. Huh, said Omen. I wonder what that's like. Never grunted. I'm sure it has its problems, the same as everything else. Speaking of everything else, any movement in your love life? Not really, Omen admitted. I met Ornia's boyfriend yesterday. Ornia, never said, squinting. He clicked his fingers. Mortal girl from Evelyn's dimension. Got it. Yes. And how was her boyfriend? Large, said Omen. And I'm pretty sure he wanted to fight me. Well, he did just meet you so I can understand the impulse. Oh, cheers for that. Never grinned. Did you puff out your chest and square up to him? No, Omen said, frowning. Was I supposed to? Not really. Goodbye, Omen. I'm proud of you. I'm not sure what for, but okay. A fifth-year girl whose name Omen didn't know walked by. She smiled at Never. Never winked back. Omen frowned. Is that something I should be aware of? We're just friends. Never said casually. That was a flirty look she gave you. How would you know? I've seen them in movies, Omen replied a little defensively. You are surprisingly well versed in romantic comedies, said Never. But we're just friends, really. It might lead to something more, or it might not. Whatever. Omen sagged. You're so lucky. I know, said Never. But remind me... How, exactly? You're bisexual. I wish I was bisexual. Never laughed. <laughs> Feeling cheated, are we? Well, yeah. I mean, it's like I'm cutting off half my potential love interests without even thinking about it. 
If I liked boys as much as I liked girls, I'd at least have the chance to... to... well, to be turned down by more people. But that's not the point. I wouldn't worry about it, Omen. Most sorcerers eventually turn by because they grow tired of viewing relationships from a traditional mortal perspective. They gradually allow themselves to be free. The key word being gradually. It just takes a little time. But what if I'm not by? Omen asked, keeping his voice low. What if I'm one of those sorcerers who's like straight or gay their entire lives? Never patted his shoulder. It won't be so bad. I'll still invite you to parties. You promise? Omen, I'm going to be having so many parties you won't know what to do with yourself and I want you there, standing in the background, maybe handing out canapes. The dream. The dream, Omen said, and they tapped their bottles together just as the bell rang. Oh, crap, Omen muttered. You just remembered what class we have now, didn't you? Omen grumbled in reply and got up and trudged after Never. They made it to their seats just as Miss Wicked walked in. Omen liked Miss Wicked. She was scary, but in a good way, or at least a mostly good way. But this latest module was not proving to be a strong point for him. The class went quiet before the door had even closed behind her. She went to her desk turned on her heels and watched them. Mad Cap Fenton, a self-proclaimed class clown, stood, a confused expression on his face, and walked to the front of the class and started to write on the board. Omen glanced at Never, then at Augur. They both looked as mystified as Omen felt. Mad Cap wrote, Telepathy, and then returned to his seat. Omen and everyone else stared at him. After a moment, Madcap blinked and said, Whoa! Miss Wicked flicked her wrist and her telescopic pointer shot out to full length. The tip, covered with a tiny rubber ball, quivered mere centimetres from Diana Wist's eye. Miss Wicked swept her arm back and tapped the board. Telepathy, she said. The transmission of information from one person to another via psychic link. This can take the form of images or words or simple feelings or all three at the same time. Entire conversations can be held and distance is no obstacle. Minds can be read. Secrets can be unlocked. Control can be taken. She whipped the pointer away from the board and levelled it at Madcap. Why did you write this word? I... I don't know, he answered. You wrote it because I told you to, Miss Wicked said. I entered your mind and I gave you an instruction. October Klein's hand went up, somewhat tentatively. Excuse me, miss, isn't that light not allowed? Miss Wicked looked at her. October swallowed, but managed to continue. Aren't you supposed to kind of ask a student's permission before you enter their mind? You gave me your permission when we began this module, Miss Wicked said, or at least your guardians did. Did none of you read the form you took home for them to sign? No one? You disappoint me, class. I thought you were strong, independent individuals. It appears I was mistaken. October frowned. My parents had no right to give permission for something like that. Indeed, they didn't, said Miss Wicked. But they did it anyway, didn't they? Because until you grow up, take responsibility for yourselves and everything that comes with it, including, but not limited to, reading the small print, then other people are going to continue to make your decisions for you. In this case, they granted me permission to enter your minds for the purposes of this module, which means I can read your thoughts from the moment you step into this room, and I can do so without warning. So... And I mean this quite sincerely. Clean up your thoughts, everyone. A blush wave passed over the class and hit Omen particularly hard. Even Augur took to just staring at his desk. We'll touch on other aspects that a fully rounded sensitive would need in later modules, Miss Wicked continued.
You will be given the chance to try out telekinesis, pyrokinesis and astral projection. But telepathy is where we begin, because telepathy is where the real power lies. Apart from communication, apart from reading somebody's thoughts and controlling their minds, you can alter an enemy's memory, take possession of their body and change their very personality. She smiled. What's throwing a little ball of energy compared to something like that? She whacked the pointer against her desk. Pair up. This next hour is going to be interesting. Chapter 14 Around the corner from Decapitation Row, tucked under an arch, was a charming little café with cakes in the window. It had a bell above the door that tinkled when Valkyrie entered. The place only had five tables, and only one of them was occupied, right at the very back. Melitza stood as Valkyrie walked over. Hey you, Valkyrie said, kissing her. Am I late? Not at all, Melitza answered. Really? Of course you're late. You're always late. But that's all right. They sat, and Valkyrie looked around. I've never been here before. Is it good? I have no idea. Hello there, the waiter said, appearing at their table. He smiled as he handed them the menus. The soup of the day is leek and potato. Could I get you some drinks to start? I'll have a glass of still water, Melitza said. Me too, said Valkyrie. The waiter smiled again. Absolutely, coming right up. He gave a little bow, which transformed into a turn, and then he swept away. A little dramatic for a café in the early afternoon, but fair enough. How did your meeting with Temper go? Melitza asked. We haven't had it yet, Valkyrie said. Oh, I thought it was this morning. Any idea what it's about? None at all. He was being cagey, though. She shrugged. I'll find out soon enough. And then you're heading off to America? Valkyrie nodded. We shouldn't be too long. We just have to find this Oberon Guile guy and work out if he's got anything to do with that missing White House aide. Just a normal day at work, all in all. She gave Melitza a smile. Melitza tucked a strand of red hair behind her ear. Something's up. Valkyrie frowned at her. How can you tell? You just have that look about you. So what's on your mind, pretty lady? Valkyrie sighed. I don't know. Everything. I've got so much going on that it's hard to keep it all straight. Then tell me what's uppermost in your mind. Well, I suppose right now that would be Omen and Augur. I'm worried about them. Melitza leaned forward slightly. Is this the vision again? I had another one last night. It's about to happen. Any idea when? Soon? Weeks? Maybe days? Omen's going to be shot and killed. Augur's going to be shot. I don't know what happens after that. Any other details? It happens in America? Melitza frowned. Okay. Then we make sure they don't go to America in the next few weeks, and boom! Lives saved. I don't think it's that easy. Of course it is, Melitza said. You know better than anyone how much future timelines can change because of the slightest alteration. Actively stopping them from leaving the country. That entire timeline will probably be rewritten just like that. She clicked her fingers. Maybe, said Valkyrie. The waiter came back, produced the bottle of water with a flourish, and filled their glasses. Have you decided what you'd like to order? he asked. Valkyrie snatched up the menu. Oh, sorry, let's see. Take your time, said the waiter. Take all the time you need. How are the wings here? Melitza asked. The waiter shrugged. Fine. Melitza smiled. You don't sound overly enthused. He sighed. 
they're grand. Order them if you want. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow. Okay, Melissa said slowly. Then I'll have the wings, I suppose. The waiter made a note. Valkyrie closed the menu and handed it back to him. And I'll have the chicken. What a wonderful choice, he responded, smiling broadly. He bowed, backed away, turned and disappeared into the kitchen. I think he fancies you, Melissa said. Oh, then that's a wonderful way to impress me, by being rude to my girlfriend. I do like it when you call me that. I know, Valkyrie said, giving her a smile before getting back to the subject. So what are the Darkly boys getting up to these days? You don't know? I haven't spoken to Omen in weeks. You really should, you know, said Melissa. This is when the teacher in her came out, when she used that disapproving tone. He's such a nice lad. And it's not really fair that you only check in on him when you've wrapped him up in whatever might get him killed next. I don't only talk to him then, Valkyrie answered, a little defensively. I just... I don't have a reason to talk to him at any other time. Friendliness isn't a reason. We're not exactly friends, though, are we? He's fourteen. Fifteen? When did he turn fifteen? New Year's Day. Valkyrie winced. You think I should send him a birthday card? Almost two months late? Probably not. And you don't have to be friends in order to be friendly. Valkyrie sighed. <sighs> yeah, maybe. So are you going to tell me how they've been? Omen's struggling with classwork because he doesn't put in the effort, as per usual and is also trying to figure out what he wants to do with his life. And Augur? Augur's the chosen one. He's off doing chosen one things, having adventures, risking his life, fighting bad guys. How does the school allow that stuff to keep happening? Melissa shrugged. What choice do we have? Besides... Everyone, and I mean the school and his own parents, sees this as a vital part of Augur's training and development. This is all building up to that momentous day when he'll have to confront the King of the Darklands. Don't worry, said Valkyrie. We're keeping an eye out for anything to do with Abyssinia, and if Kason does graduate from Prince of the Darklands to King, we'll step in. And do what? and do something incredibly drastic and foolhardy that will alter the future so Augur won't have to confront anyone. But that's if you can find Kason, Melitza countered. Unless I'm very much mistaken, Cold Heart Prison is still flying about somewhere, and none of you lot even know where to look. Finding hijacked prisons is not my job. The door opened and a man came into the café. Melissa had her back to the door, but her eyes widened and she sat up straighter. Death, she whispered. Valkyrie reached forward, patting her hand. It's okay, she said. There's no danger. It's just a vampire. The vampire walked over. Dark-haired, with delicate features and a thin scar running down one side of his face. He stopped beside their table. His tone was quiet. Please forgive the intrusion. It's been a while, Valkyrie said. Melitza, this is Dusk. He's tried to kill me a few times, and he bit me once. I didn't turn into a vampire, though, obviously. <laughs> We're cool now, though, I think. Aren't we cool? We are, Dusk said. Cool. Melissa smiled up at him. Hello. Hello, said Dusk. Valkyrie, even though we are cool, I feel I must apologize for my past behavior. You're here to say sorry? No, said Dusk. But I am making amends for my mistakes, and I take my opportunities when I can. Don't worry about it, Valkyrie said. I mean, 
Who hasn't tried to kill me, really? A tight smile. That may indeed be the case, but when we first met, I was undergoing a process for which we vampires don't have a name. Oh, Melissa said, and then blushed. Dusk looked uncomfortable, and Valkyrie frowned. What? What is it? I've... I've heard of this, Melissa said. She winced at Dusk. Sorry. Don't apologise to him said Valkyrie. He tried to kill me, remember? Melissa leaned forward and kept her voice low. For roughly three or four weeks every year, a vampire's human side will become dominant. It's, uh, something they don't like to talk about. In polite society, said Dusk. Valkyrie folded her arms. So your human side was dominant when we first met? Then why were you so intent on murdering me? Dusk hesitated to answer. Instead, he looked at Melitza. She cleared her throat. Vampires are rather cold creatures, both physically and emotionally. If Mr. Dusk was intent on murdering you, like you say, then that was probably due more to his human side than his vampire side. Seriously, Valkyrie said. The worst thing about a vampire is his humanity? I'm afraid so, said Dusk. Wow, Valkyrie said. That's depressing for pretty much all of the human race. I was wondering if I could have a word with you, said Dusk. In private, if you don't mind. It will not take long, I assure you. Melissa stood. I have to pee she announced, and walked away. Valkyrie motioned to the chair, and Dusk sat. What's on your mind? she asked. A gentleman came to see me, he said. He said his name was Kason. Valkyrie sat up straighter. You're working with Abyssinia? No, Dusk answered. I stay out of human affairs as much as possible. The Supreme Mage uses me and my fellow vampires when she needs us, but by and large she, and by extension the city guards, leaves our district alone. I like this arrangement. I do not wish to see it change. Then why did Kason go to see you? He came to see me because he heard of our interactions, and he wants to see you, Dusk said. He asked me to pass on the message. Why does he want to see me? I do not know. Why does he think I'd say yes? He merely stated that you two are not actually enemies, so you have no reason not to. Huh, said Valkyrie. He had a point. He would like to meet you at 10 a.m. on Saturday, in the Fangs. The directions are written here. He slid her a folded piece of paper. Naturally, he would expect you to come alone. Naturally. He stood. I apologize again for my behavior in the past. Well, I suppose I'm sorry for, you know, she indicated his face. Dusk smiled. My scar is hardly your fault. I blame Billy Ray Sanguine and that straight razor of his the scars from which never fade. Valkyrie showed him the palm of her right hand. Believe me, I know. Dusk nodded to her and turned to leave. What did you see? she asked suddenly. He stopped moving. When you bit me, she said, you told Billy Ray Sanguine that you saw something in my blood. He said it was punishment enough. What was it? Dusk's response was slow. Measured. It is perhaps best if you do not know. She laughed. <laughs> well, that's not going to work. There are secrets we hide, Valkyrie, even from ourselves. We need to, in order to survive this world. Seriously? Even now, after Dark Hess, after all that? You're saying there's something worse? I will tell you if you truly wish to know. 
but I advise against it. Strongly. Valkyrie had to smile. There's really not a whole lot left that could upset me. He looked at her. Take some time. In a few days, if you still believe you should know, come and find me. I'll tell you what I saw. The waiter came over before Valkyrie could respond, and Dusk took that opportunity to leave. The waiter dumped Melitza's plate on her side, then gently laid Valkyrie's in front of her. There you go, he said warmly. Have your friends left? My girlfriend is just in the bathroom. His smile widened. In that case, can I just say, and I hope I'm not being out of line here or anything, that I am a huge, huge fan. The idea that I'm even talking to you right now is blowing my mind. Right, said Valkyrie. Could I be incredibly cheeky and ask you to sign an autograph for me? Is that terrible? It's probably terrible. He put his notebook and pen into her hands and waited there, still beaming. Melitza retook her seat. The waiter ignored her. She did her best not to laugh. Sure, Valkyrie said reluctantly. Who'll I make it out to? Aixie. H-A-E-C-C-E. Thank you. To Hexy, she murmured as she wrote. He peered at what she was writing. And could you maybe sign it Dark S? The pen stopped. Valkyrie looked up. I don't do that. Oh, just this once. She closed the notebook, held it out for him. I don't do that, she repeated. His smile faded. I'm just asking you to write your name. That isn't her name, Melissa said. Are we talking to you? The waiter said angrily. Valkyrie was out of her seat before she knew what was happening, and the waiter was bent backwards over a table with her hand on his throat and energy burning behind her eyes. She became aware of Melissa tugging at her, trying to pull her back. She released her hold, and the waiter slipped sideways and fell off the table, sending chairs crashing into each other. We'll eat somewhere else, Melitza told him as he tried to right himself. We're not paying for this food, by the way. You can explain that to your manager. Also, you're not getting a tip. I always tip, because I appreciate floor staff and kitchen staff, and I realise that generally you're not paid an awful lot, but you're getting nothing this time. I think you know why. Sweetie, shall we take our leave? Yeah, Valkyrie said quietly. Let's go. Melissa linked arms with her and marched her out onto the street. Once they were out of view, Melissa stopped and turned. Are you okay? She asked. You don't usually fly off the handle like that. I'm good said Valkyrie. I I'm fine. Just, it just got a little angry. Melissa hugged her. Want to go somewhere else? I still have half an hour left of my break. Are you still hungry? What do you want? I want a muffin, Valkyrie mumbled into her shoulder. My baby wants a muffin, Melissa said. My baby gets a muffin. Come on. They started walking, so what did tall, dead and handsome want to talk to you about? Valkyrie smiled. Tall, dead and handsome. That's good. Isn't it? I thought of it when I was peeing. You're very clever. I am a teacher. They walked on, looking for somewhere that sold muffins. Chapter 15 Temper Frey left his sword and his city guard uniform in his locker and dressed in civilian clothes for the meeting. He slipped his badge into his back pocket and his gun into the holster beneath his jacket. If there was one good thing about winter, it gave cops like him a good excuse to wear bulky coats. He took the tram across the city. He liked the tram. It was smooth, efficient and good for the environment. Just like him. He grinned to himself. That was funny. The store where he'd arranged to meet the guy was called the Cabinet of Curiosities. 
if it had existed in any mortal city around the world, it would have been one of those weird little shops that attracted only the most discerning customer, those with dark sensibilities pursuing arcane delights. But because it was in Roarhaven, it was just another store that sold magical junk. Temper nodded to the guy behind the counter and walked to the back, where an over-the-hill surfer type with shaggy hair was trying on lacquered masks over his sunglasses. When he saw Temper coming, he tried to stuff the masks onto a nearby shelf. One of them fell, hit the floor, and broke into two pieces. Ah! the surfer said. Adam Brait? Temper asked. Yeah, Brait said, eyes still on the broken pieces. Oh, man. Don't worry about it, Temper said quickly. I'll pay for the damage. That's a necromancer ceremonial mask, Brait responded. It's worth more than my house. In that case, let's talk over here, Temper said, and led the way to the far corner. You know who I am? Yeah, dude, I know who you are. Of course I do. I mean, I got in touch with you, didn't I? You're the traitor. Temper let that one slide. I guess I am. That's, uh, that's why I called. I figured you'd understand the, uh, well, the implications of what I have to tell you. Sounds ominous. Oh, it is, said Brait. I mean, I think it is. I don't have the full story, and you'll certainly know more about this than I do, but... But I had to tell someone. For years I've been... I mean, I have been devout, you know? My family have worshipped the faceless ones. We've gone to church. We've done the prayers, the offerings... Read the Book of Tears. I got some friends coming, Tamper said. They'll want to hear this too. Brait frowned. What friends? Trusted friends. Don't worry. You're quite safe with them. I don't know, man. I find it very hard to trust people. I'm a naturally paranoid person, you know? He spun suddenly. What the hell is that? That's a wall, Adam. Oh, said Brait, calming down. Sorry, I've also taken a buttload of drugs over my lifetime, so I kind of see things that aren't really there. Good to know. Ah, here are my friends now. Brait turned as Skullduggery and Valkyrie walked in. That's... that's Skullduggery Pleasant. Yes, said Temper. That's Skullduggery Pleasant and Valkyrie Kane. It is. Oh, I don't know about this, said Brait. I don't know. I mean, these guys. Trouble follows these guys around, you know. I don't want to get killed, man. You won't. They came over, and Temper nodded to them. Skullduggery, Valkyrie, this is the gentleman I asked you here to meet. Brait stuck out his hand. Skullduggery shook it. Dude, Adam Brait's my name. I know who you are, of course, and I've waited a long time for this moment. Skullduggery tilted his head. Is that so? You have no idea, man. No idea at all. I just need someone to take me seriously, you know? Someone to believe me. I've been warning people about this for years, but no one has listened. Now, after all this time, I have the three of you. He switched his attention to Valkyrie, shook her hand vigorously. I feel like I know you already. I really do. Oh, hey, I apologize for wearing the sunglasses, you know, not making eye contact. See, I'm in disguise. I think it's safer for me if you don't know who I am. Valkyrie frowned. But you just told us your name. Brait stopped shaking her hand. Oh, hell! Adam has some important information to share, Temper said quickly. 
That's what you told me, right, Adam? Why don't we get down to business? Yeah, man, said Braid. Okay, well, I'm... I, I was telling Tamper here that I am, or I was, up until recently, a devout member of the Church of the Faceless. My family back in California were fanatical, and that's how I was raised. I kind of drifted away in my adult years, but a few years ago, the true teachings were introduced, and I came back. Valkyrie frowned. The true teachings? Peace and love, said Braid. The idea that the faceless ones were bringers of warmth and harmony instead of, you know, oppression and death. Ah, said Valkyrie, you're talking about the great pivot. Am I? It's what we call it, Skullduggery said. The church needed to soften its philosophies in order to be allowed to practice, and suddenly they were all about sweetness and light. Brait seemed a bit put out by that. Ah, uh, that's a... That's a cynical way to view what happened, man. Warmth and harmony have always been part of what the Faceless Ones promised us. Providing we worship them, Skullduggery said. Well, yeah, said Brait. But that's the same with all religions, right? Obey our rules, worship our gods, and you'll be rewarded. And the non-believers will burn in whatever hell we imagine there to be. I think we're getting a little sidetracked here, said Temper. Yeah, sorry, Braid said. My thoughts and feelings towards my religion are not actually relevant to what I have to say. I don't think they are anyway. I don't know... I'm conflicted, but I have to do what I think is right. Temper hoped his smile was both patient and reassuring. Why did you bring us here, Adam? Arch Cannon Creed, said Brait, squaring his shoulders. He's resumed his search for the child of the faceless ones. Temper's chin dipped to his chest. Damn. I'm sorry? Valkyrie said. The search for who? The child of the faceless ones, said Braid. The offspring. The heir. Valkyrie frowned. The faceless ones had a kid. Temper, Skullduggery said. Do you want to take this? I guess, Temper muttered. He took a breath before speaking again. Okay. So, according to the legends, back when the Faceless Ones ruled the Earth, before the Ancients rose up against them, they didn't need human vessels. Back then, for whatever reason, they could survive in this reality in their true forms. But then the Ancients did something to turn the environment inhospitable. And from that point on, the Faceless Ones needed to possess human bodies. Valkyrie nodded. I've seen that happen. Continue. The vessels didn't exactly last too long, so most of the time the bodies would burn themselves out and the faceless ones would vacate them, move on to the next and then the next, leaving a trail of burnt-out corpses behind. But sometimes they vacated the body before it burned out, and if that happened, the person would return to normal. I've understood all of this so far, Valkyrie said. This is good. Go on. So we're left with a few ex-vessels getting back to their old lives, said Temper. And for the most part, everything is the same. Except for the slight alteration that has been made to their DNA. Nothing obvious. Nothing that changes their appearance or behavior. Nothing that changes their personalities. Nothing to mark them out. These ex-vessels have children and pass on this particular strain of DNA. Generation after countless generation, we emerge from the mists of time, venture into recorded history, and still we go on, generation after generation. Valkyrie frowned. So there are people out there in the world with faceless one's DNA? 
Seriously? Temper nodded. An arch cannon creed wants to find them. One, actually, Skullduggery interjected. Yes, said Temper. He's looking for one in particular. To do what? Valkyrie asked. Bring about the end of the world, said Brait, eager to get involved in the conversation again. Call the faceless ones back, man. Have them wipe the earth clean and allow their disciples to live in ecstasy for all eternity, while the rest of you heathens burn and die. His smile faltered, which is obviously not cool. Valkyrie stood there with her hands on her hips, one of those hips cocked. How many? she asked. How many people are out there who are, you know, actually descended from insane supergods? It's estimated that one in seven people carry this particular strand of DNA, said Temper. Valkyrie stared at him. That's... that's like a billion people. There are a billion people with faceless one's genes walking around? Well, Jesus, I mean, how do we stop Creed from finding them? Oh, said Temper. He's already found them. What? He found thousands of them before his experiments were shut down. Tens of thousands. More, probably. He'd been conducting experiments for centuries. We didn't have the terminology we do now, but essentially what he was doing, even back then, was activating these latent genes. There's someone out there, statistically there has to be, with a strong enough DNA strand to become the child of the faceless ones. Once they're activated, they'll be able to call their cousins home. Creed just hasn't found the right subject. And what happened to all the people he's experimented on? We call them the Kith, said Skullduggery. Creed activated their genes, which led to a certain transformation. Their faces were... lost. Lost? Valkyrie echoed. They melted away, said Temper. They were left with, I don't know, smoothness. No hair, no features, no eyes or ears, no mouth. And from what we could tell, their minds were wiped. After they were activated, they didn't need to eat or drink. They didn't communicate. They just stood there. Some of my best friends are still standing in a bunker somewhere. Your friends? Temper smiled weakly. I was a disciple. You knew that already, right? Pretty much. I followed Creed. I was young and stupid, and I needed somewhere to belong. Out of all my friends, he said I was one of his favorites. This gene had been detected in us, and it was strong. We were prime specimens. Creed would activate others, develop this technique or that approach, and then take what he'd learned and apply it to us. One by one, he failed over and over again. Like I said, my friends, I watched them being led away, excited at the possibility of being turned into the child of the faceless ones. Next time I saw them, they'd be standing in a row, without a face, and the activations and the experiments would continue. So I left. I renounced it all and ran. Years later, in order to take over the church, Skullduggery said, Creed had to prove that he'd left his old ways behind. No more activations. No more kith. But he's doing it again, said Brait. This religious freedom act that was passed last year, it's letting him get away with more and more. Where is it happening? Skullduggery asked. If we can catch him in the act or at the very least find some of these new kith. Supreme Mage Sorrows will have all she needs to have Creed arrested. We couldn't arrest him ourselves? Valkyrie asked. We could, but for something like this, something this big, it would be wise to have the support of the sanctuaries. 
I don't know that I can be of any, like, assistance, man, said Braid. I don't know where the latest activations are taking place. It might be in the dark cathedral. It could be in a whole different country. The Church of the Faceless, they got, like, places everywhere. Can you poke around? Temper asked. Nothing too aggressive, just chat to people. See what they think. No one in the church will speak to me anymore, and they certainly won't speak to these two. He has a point, said Skullduggery. Adam, we need to make this quite clear. We are not asking you to put yourself in any danger. We're not even asking you to be a spy. We're asking you to have a few casual conversations with people who might know something. Do you understand? I understand, man, said Braid. So do I need, like, a, a code name? I don't think you understand. No, I get it, I do. Okay, but no. But, Braid continued, I think a code name might be a good idea, like Condor or Rattlesnake or, uh, you won't need a code name because you're not a spy. Valkyrie told him. I could wear a disguise. No, I'm really good with disguises. I bet if I wore a disguise, you wouldn't even recognize me. I'm not talking about sunglasses, even. I'm talking about a proper full-on disguise, like a mustache or something. You don't need a disguise, said Valkyrie, because you'll be chatting to people who already know you. They wouldn't chat to you if they didn't recognize you, would they? Ah, yeah, I guess not. Maybe this isn't a good idea, Skullduggery murmured. No, dude, Braid said quickly. I can do it, I can. I won't mess it up. No one has ever believed in me. No one has ever trusted me with something this important. No one has ever trusted me with anything, man. But you guys do. You guys see something in me. Potential, maybe. True courage, perhaps. A steely-eyed determination, no doubt. I will not let you down. Skullduggery, Valkyrie, and Temper. You're like my three musketeers, you know? And I would be honored to be your D'Artagnan in this time of need. Temper looked at Skullduggery, and Skullduggery looked at Valkyrie, and Valkyrie looked fed up. Fine, she said. You can be our D'Artagnan. One for all, Bray cheered. Don't do that, said Skullduggery. <laughs> Sorry. Chapter 16 Empty your mind, Miss Wicked said, and someone muttered, That was fast. Omen grinned as the class chuckled. Everyone shut up quickly, and Omen knew that Miss Wicked had just used one of her glares. He couldn't see it, of course. He was too busy sitting there with his eyes closed. He heard them all around him. The shuffling of feet, the creaking of desks. The entire class was watching Augur and him sitting opposite each other trying to speak to each other without making a sound. All he had to do was concentrate, Miss Wicked had said. Focus. Twins had a higher chance than most of getting this right. For once, Omen could be ahead of everyone else. If he could just manage this one simple thing. Oh, God. He wasn't concentrating. He was thinking too much. He stopped thinking. Stopped. It wasn't easy. Every time he tried to stop thinking, it was like a thousand thoughts were knocking on the door of his mind, screaming to be let in. He was doing it again. He was thinking about his thoughts. Damn it! OK, he was definitely going to stop now. Definitely. Was Miss Wicked reading his thoughts right now? Was she checking on him? No. That could interfere with what they were trying to do. She wouldn't do that. He hoped she wasn't doing that. He hoped. But what if she was? 
So many thoughts about her, so many images, getting worse, filling his mind, one after the other, an unstoppable flow of images and thoughts, and... Take a breath. She wasn't reading his mind. Relax. Focus. Empty the mind. Empty as a tin can. An empty tin can. Not a tin can full of peas or something. Maybe it once had peas, but now it didn't have anything. It was just... That wasn't working. Not a can, then. A box. A box was better. An empty box. Obviously, an empty box. Maybe it had once been full, but now it was empty. Maybe it had been full of cans of peas. Peas again! Why peas? Why was he thinking of... Omen! Omen shrieked and fell out of his chair. He hit the floor, eyes open, and Augur stood up, a delighted smile on his face. You heard that, right? Augur asked. You heard that? I... I heard it, said Omen. That was so cool, Augur said, pulling him to his feet. It was like there was a tunnel between us. Did you feel it? Well done, gentlemen, Miss Wicked said. Augur, you spoke to Omen. Omen, did you answer? Omen hesitated. I think he was about to, Augur said quickly. I could feel him about to say something, but I think I did something wrong and I broke the link. Is that so? Miss Wicked murmured. Omen, do you think you could re-establish that link? Probably not, he said. Could you try? I suppose. There was a knock on the door. Case poked his head in. Miss Wicked, uh, excuse me, he said, but could I, uh, Augur and Never are needed in the, uh, the, uh, they're needed. Miss Wicked raised an eyebrow. Are they now? Case nodded. Urgently. Please, miss. She sighed. <sighs> Augur, Never, it would appear that you're needed elsewhere. I trust you won't be long. We'll try not to be, said Augur, suddenly all business, and the class watched as he followed Never out of the door. They all knew what was going on. There was something happening, something terrible and something dangerous, and only Augur Darkly and his friends could stop it and save the day. The rest of them had to just sigh with envy and get back to work. Except Omen didn't really sigh with envy any more. He'd been in the thick of the action, and he didn't really want to be there again. Saving the day, in his experience, usually meant a lot of running and quite a bit of hiding, with some really scary bits in between. He was fifteen years old and in school. He had enough running, hiding and scary bits as it was. Chapter 17 Valkyrie roamed the halls of Corrival Academy, listening to the voices that rumbled behind the classroom doors. She wondered how differently she'd have turned out if this place had been around when she was a teenager. Maybe it would have steered her clear of the trouble that had lain ahead of her. Maybe it would have made things worse. Maybe she would have made some friends her own age. That would have been weird. She'd try to get Skullduggery to come with her to talk to Omen while they waited for Fletcher to become available. He'd tilted his head, told her he had someone else to talk to, but wouldn't tell her who, and strode away. She'd shrugged and walked in the opposite direction. For all she knew, he didn't have anyone to talk to, and he was just being mysterious, probably hiding in a toilet cubicle somewhere, waiting for the time to pass. The thought amused Valkyrie for a brief moment, because the truth was she was quietly happy that he'd gone off. There were a lot of things she hadn't got round to telling him yet, but the idea that she should let him know about her upcoming meeting with Kason was pulling on her thoughts. But no, as awful as it was to keep something from him, she couldn't risk him scaring Kason away. There was a part of Valkyrie that wanted to spring a trap on him herself. Having Kason in shackles would bring Abyssinia to her knees, but if there was even the slightest chance that meeting with Kason could offer a solution to everything that had been going on... Besides, as Dusk had mentioned, Kason wasn't actually an enemy. As far as Valkyrie knew... Kason had done nothing wrong. In fact, he could conceivably be labelled a hero. He did kill Mevalent all those years ago, after all. 
So she was going to keep it a secret for just a little while longer. She'd tell Skullduggery afterwards. He'd understand. She was sure of it. Melitza had told her where to go, so when the bell rang, she was standing right outside Omen's classroom. They came out, the chattering youth, and their eyes widened as they passed her. Some stared in wonder, others in fear. Yeah, she could understand that. And then Omen was there, standing in front of her. He'd grown taller since she'd seen him last. Happy birthday, she said. He looked puzzled. Thank you? I was just passing, so I thought I'd drop by, see how you're doing. You... you drop by to see me? Well, we're waiting until Fletcher, uh, that's Mr. Wren to you, can take us somewhere, but yeah, I came to see you while I wait. Is that okay? Sure, Oman said. I'm just... surprised? Why? We're friends, aren't we? He blinked. Are we? Aren't we? I mean, yes, okay, we can be friends, sure. Good. They started walking. The crowds parted for them. So, how are things? Great, Omen said. Yeah, great, just great. Girlfriends? Boyfriends? Neither. Pets? None. You getting nervous about the exams? They're not till June. You should do what I did. Get a reflection to do the studying for you and then absorb all the information afterwards. Or just get the reflection to sit the exams. Yeah, that'd be cool. But we're not allowed. They have ways of stopping reflections from helping us with that stuff. So you have to do all the work yourself? Yeah. Well, that sucks. It really does. They walked on. How's never? Valkyrie asked. Good. Spending a lot of time with Augur and the others. A good teleporter is hard to find, she said. Do you ever join them on their adventures? Omen gave a little smile. No, that's not for me, I don't think. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow. This is a change. I just don't think I'm any good at it, really. I'm not like Augur, and I'm not like you. You guys are special, and determined, and all those cool things, and I'm just... ordinary. Nothing wrong with being ordinary, Omen. Yeah, I know. So, Valkyrie said, figuring she'd skipped round the subject long enough. Any plans? Plans? To go away anywhere? Like holiday plans? Um, no, it's the school term and... Of course, said Valkyrie, of course. Hey, can you do me a favour? Can you stay out of trouble? Sorry? Trouble, she said. If you could stay out of it, that'd be great. What trouble am I in? None, she said. So, what trouble am I going to be in? She laughed. <laughs> None! Wow, you are paranoid. I'm not sure I understand what you're asking me to do. Valkyrie turned to him. OK, look, there's something going on, a case. It's got something to do with America, or at the very least, Americans. He looked doubtful. Do you need my help? No. In fact, we need the opposite. You need my hindrance? We need you to stay out of it. This was puzzling Omen. That was plain to see. But I'm not in it, he said. I don't know anything about it. This is the first I'm hearing of it. I don't even know what it is. I realise that this might be confusing. Oh, good. I was worried. But I need you to promise me. I, I promise, he said. Can I ask a question, though? No. Just one. If you know anything at all about it, Valkyrie said, telling you might involve you, and we don't want that, do we? I suppose not. You just focus on having a boring, ordinary few weeks, and I'll explain it all to you when it's over. Deal? I suppose so. She smiled. 
Finally, she'd done something right. Okay then, buddy. You'd better get back to class. School's over. Oh, she said. Don't you usually have detention or something? He sagged. Yeah, he said, and trudged off. Chapter 18 Valkyrie knocked on the staff room door. Melitza opened it and grinned. Well, this is a lovely surprise. My girlfriend's come to pick me up from work. Valkyrie winced. Actually, I'm here to see Fletcher. No! Melitza gasped, clutching her heart. Mr. Wren, are you trying to sneak away with my woman? I'll win her back if it's the last thing I do. Fletcher warbled from somewhere Valkyrie couldn't see. Melitza grinned again and gave Valkyrie a peck on the cheek. He'll be with you in a second, she said. I've got some students that need extra tutoring, though, so I shall see you tomorrow, my petal. Yes, you will, said Valkyrie, giving her a squeeze before she let her walk away. The door opened further and Fletcher stood there with his ridiculous hair. Hey, he said. Hey. I haven't seen you in a while. Is it just you? Valkyrie shook her head. Skullduggery will be here once he's stopped being mysterious. Fair enough, Fletcher said, ushering her into the otherwise empty staff room. You want anything? We're out of tea, but I can make you a coffee. Ha, <laughs> no thanks. I've heard about the coffee here. So, how are things going? How's life? Taking along, he said. And actually, now that you're here, I have a question. Okay? He hesitated. So, we dated. Yes, we did. We had fun. Loads of fun. You were my first serious girlfriend. And you were my first serious boyfriend. It didn't end too well. This is true. You kind of cheated on me. Not my proudest moment, with a vampire, which turned out to be a huge mistake. Fletcher nodded. It's good of you to acknowledge that. Haven't we been over this, though? Valkyrie asked. I'm pretty sure I apologised about a million times. Three times, Fletcher corrected. Is that all? I counted. Three times seems less than I remember. Well... That's how many it was. I'll take your word for it. She smiled. I feel like you're skirting round a subject, however, and it's not about Caelan the sulky vampire. Did I, uh... Did I turn you gay? Valkyrie laughed. Really, really laughed. She hadn't laughed like that in a long time. No, she said when she'd finished. No, you didn't, you muppet. Because... You never indicated that you were, you know, interested in girls when we were dating. I don't see why I would have. Well, yeah, said Fletcher. But, like, is this a new thing? I mean, I'm thrilled for you. I, I really am. Melitza's so cool and so... so nice. I'm happy you're happy, basically. But did you... was there an awakening or... Wow! said Valkyrie. An awakening? I don't really know what I'm trying to say. Do you want me to sit you down and go through it all? Fletcher brightened. Would you? No, said Valkyrie. I liked boys, and I appreciated how girls looked, but they never really registered with me in that way until I got a bit older. So there was no big bombshell moment when you realised? Not really. Just a growing certainty. And is Melissa your first... Not going to go into too much detail, Fletch. Right, yes, of course. Boundaries. She smiled. I have no boundaries. You should know that by now. But I'm not going to go into detail because Skullduggery's just arrived. Ah, said Fletcher, and turned to Skullduggery, standing in the doorway. Skullduggery, I know you don't indulge in small talk. So all I'll ask is, where do you need to go? Seattle. Skullduggery said. Seattle, Fletcher repeated, clapping his hands. Home to Nirvana, Soundgarden and Jimi Hendrix. 
I can take you to the site of the first Starbucks, which is no longer there, or the Space Needle, which is still there, or the airport, which is still there, too. We'll need to rent a car, Skullduggery said, so the airport would be handier. You got it, said Fletcher, and narrowed his eyes. After a moment, Valkyrie asked, Is everything okay? I've been trying to do what Nero does, Fletcher said. He doesn't need to be in physical contact with other people in order to teleport with them. I can't seem to figure out how he does it, though. Nero's a neoteric, Skullduggery said. That means even he doesn't know how he does it. You should stick to the old-fashioned method. He put his hand on Fletcher's shoulder. It's what you do best. Fletcher looked at his hand, then smiled. Thanks, Skullduggery. Your support means a lot to me. I'm just waiting for you to teleport. Oh, Fletcher said, and Valkyrie laughed at him. Chapter 19 Fletcher took them to SeaTac Airport and then teleported away, leaving them to rent a car. There was snow on the ground, turned to brown mud by the side of the roads. Once they were driving, Valkyrie was able to tell Skullduggery about Tanith's arrival and Alice's hamster and the rerun of the vision about Omen and Augur. She didn't tell him about Kason, though. She was going to keep that to herself until after their first meeting. I've been having this vision since before Abyssinia returned, she said, and not a whole lot about it has changed. Augur's still injured. Omen still dies. The more information we get about it, the better our chances of averting it, Skullduggery responded. The latest detail you picked up was that it happens here, in America, possibly in Oregon. It stands to reason though I make no assumptions, that what we are investigating now is somehow linked to what happens to the Darkly brothers in an indeterminate amount of time. So I would suggest that we continue as we are and learn as much as we can about what's going on. But we've got so many things going on, Valkyrie countered. We've got Alice's soul to heal, President Flannery's missing aid to investigate, and now we have Temper's melty face people to find. Kith. Melty face people is more descriptive. My point is, we can't do everything. Of course we can, Skullduggery said. We're arbiters. We're detectives. We have incredible bone structure. All that is undeniable. But aren't we in danger of missing something if we have all these different things calling out for our attention? I don't want to lose a chance to find Dr. Nye because we're chasing down a lead on Flannery's assistant. He shook his head. Flitting between investigations will keep us sharp and prevent us from developing tunnel vision. It's a good thing to be so busy. I told Omen to stay out of America for the next few weeks, Valkyrie said. Do you think that was a good idea? Yes. Okay. Unless by telling him to stay out of America, you've inadvertently set him on a collision course with the events you saw in your vision. Oh, God. Do you think I have? Probably not. Phew. But maybe. Skullduggery, I swear to God. They turned right at a junction. When it comes to visions of the future, we can't know anything, he said. We could continue on exactly as we are, and not one thing you saw will actually come true. Or we could second-guess every decision we make from now until then, and the future would happen just as you foresaw. From what we know, there are an infinite amount of possible futures that stem from any given moment. Sensitives can glimpse one of these possible futures, but there's no way of knowing how close it is to what will eventually transpire. Valkyrie let his words soak in. They didn't make her feel any better. In fact, they made her glum, which in turn made her wonder. Am I as much fun as I used to be? She suddenly asked. No, Skullduggery said immediately. She shot him a look. You could have taken a little more time to think about it. You've had a lot on your mind for the last thirteen years, he responded. First, 
You found out that your uncle had been murdered. Then you had to help save the world. Then you met some trans-dimensional super-gods, after which you found out that you were this Darkest person that all the sensitives were so worried about. Then you thought you were going to be the Deathbringer. Then Darkest emerged, and then she took over your body, and then you died. And then you had to fight her, and then you were in America for five years to recover. And now you've come back, and you've had to rescue your sister from a serial killer, who blamed you for the death of his serial killer apprentice. And now this whole thing with Alice's soul. But I think there was maybe a three-week gap somewhere in there, before things got too serious, when you were what could be considered... fun. She grunted. <laughs> We've been busy. Yes, we have. And do you think I've become too... serious? It's a serious world. That doesn't answer the question. You're as serious as you need to be, said Skullduggery. And you're as flippant as you need to be. It's a balancing act. If you tip too far one way or the other, you fall off the wire. People like us, Valkyrie... It's our purpose in life to walk that wire. She nodded and looked out of the window. I don't think I'm as happy as I used to be. It would astonish me if you were. I've got issues about everything that's happened. I think I need to talk to someone. You can talk to me. She smiled. Thank you. But I think I have to talk to someone else. You're, I don't mean this in a bad way, but, but I'm a part of the problem, Skullduggery said. Yes. Sorry. Don't be. I'm a bad influence, and I always have been. You need a professional. China has a few on her staff at the High Sanctuary. Valkyrie looked at him. I might make an appointment, so. He nodded. That's probably a good idea. Would you ever consider it? He flicked the indicator and they overtook a slow-moving truck. I'm too far gone, I'm afraid, he said. I have my demons, but they work to keep each other in check at all times. My mind is in a permanent state of finely tuned chaos that I would be loath to disrupt. And you don't think it's too late for me? He angled his head towards her. Your traumas have made you who you are, but they don't define you. You can live with them, I have no doubt. Valkyrie nodded. She was satisfied with that, for the moment. They got where they were going a little over an hour later. An operative from the American sanctuary indicated the car on the other side of the street the one Oberon Guile was sitting in. Valkyrie nodded her thanks to the operative, who ignored her and drove off. I don't think that guy appreciated handing this case over to us, Valkyrie said as they parked. Can we send him a muffin basket or something? No. Then can we get muffins? Sure. They got out and Valkyrie crossed the road, approaching Oberon's car with a bright smile on her face. She motioned for him to wind down the window, and as she reached the car, Skullduggery slipped in the passenger side, gun levelled at Oberon's midsection. Valkyrie leaned in. Hands on the dash, if you wouldn't mind. This is really not a good time, Oberon said, complying. He was stubbly and even better looking in person, and he had a nice accent and a nice voice. It had an edge to it. Who are they? Valkyrie asked. The people in the house you're watching. I'm not watching anyone, Miss Kane, Oberon said. I'm just sitting here in my car. You know who I am? I may not be the most sociable of sorcerers, said Oberon, but I've heard of the skeleton detective and the girl who almost killed the world. My nickname sucks. Oberon looked at Skullduggery. You can put the gun away. I'm not your enemy. I'll decide what you are, Skullduggery replied. 
My partner asked you a question that you haven't answered. Oberon drummed the dashboard with his fingertips. The people in that house are of no concern to you. You want something? Tell me what it is so I can get back to sitting here. But, Miss Kane, would you mind getting in the car? I'm trying not to draw attention to myself. Valkyrie got in the back, then scooted over so she could look at Oberon while they talked. His car was very clean. Bertram Wilkes, Skullduggery said. You were in his house last week. So? So why were you there? Maybe I was his guest. For you to be his guest, he would have had to have invited you in. That would be rather hard to do, seeing as how he's been missing for six months. Okay, then. I broke in, said Oberon. He owes me money. How much? A few hundred. Did you get it? No. When was the last time you spoke to him? Well, Oberon said, how long did you say he's been missing? Six months? So, let's say that I haven't spoken to him in six and a half. Why are you lying to us? Skullduggery asked. I don't really see a reason why I should answer any questions at all, to be honest. I'm not part of your sanctuary thing. You got no jurisdiction over me. We can arrest you. For what? Obstructing an investigation, wasting our time, not being forthcoming. Oberon gave a little laugh. <laughs> That's a crime now, is it? We're arbiters, Skullduggery said. That means we can make up our own crimes. Oberon sighed and scratched his cheek. <sighs> okay, he said at last. I'll tell you the truth, but you gotta do something for me in return. You gotta help me raid that house. Valkyrie sat forward. Who's in there? Bad guys, he answered. I think they might have my son. I haven't been able to confirm that because there's one of me and nine of them. But with you two, I could probably make a go of it. Why would they have your son? Skullduggery asked. You know who Wilkes was, right? His job? President Flannery's personal aide. My ex, Magenta. That's Robbie's mom. She's a sensitive the kind that specializes in persuading people to do things, oftentimes against their own interests. That's a very particular talent to have, and it's one of the reasons we broke up. She's not a bad person by any stretch, but I don't think she could resist some small manipulations to get her way every now and then. That's got nothing to do with anything, though. Four years ago, Right after we split, she mentioned something about taking a job for a mortal politician, Flannery. It paid good money, and it wasn't overly time-consuming, so she could give Robbie the support and attention he needed. I wasn't around much, so I got to see him at the weekends and whenever I was back this way. It wasn't perfect, but it worked. Magenta was used to convince senators to vote a certain way, to push judges to make favorable decisions, that kind of thing. She said Flannery had an advisor, a sorcerer. Wilkes, said Valkyrie. No, said Oberon. Wilkes came later. I don't think Flannery knew that Wilkes was a mage. Or maybe he did, I don't know. But his advisor was somebody else. Where does your child come into all this? Skullduggery asked. A muscle flexed in Oberon's jaw. When Flannery started his bid for the presidency, he needed Magenta more and more. She resisted. She was talking about quitting. That's when Robbie was taken. Valkyrie's eyes widened. Your son has been missing since before Flannery became president? Three years now, 
Oberon said. Every two or three days, Magenta gets to spend a few hours with him. As I'm sure you know, I spent most of that time in a prison cell, so I didn't know that Robbie had been snatched until I got out of Iron Point and received a letter she'd left for me. Why were you in Wilkes's house? I was trying to find what you detectives call a clue. Am I pronouncing that right? Clue? Surely your wife could help you. I haven't been able to speak to Magenta, Oberon said. I haven't been able to get close. She's got the seven as one guarding her. Skullduggery grunted, then turned to Valkyrie. The seven as one are seven sensitive siblings, Valkyrie said, who maintain a psychic link at all times. They're used to guard people and places, making it almost impossible for anyone to sneak up on them without the alarm being raised. Skullduggery tilted his head. How do you know all that? I do get out every now and then, she said, returning her attention to Oberon. So you think your son is being held in the house across the road? I don't know, Oberon said, deflating slightly. I only know that the people over there are sorcerers, and they're involved. Maybe they have Robbie in there, maybe they don't. But they definitely know more about what's going on here than I do, so... If you want to know who's behind all of this, I'd say that helping me bust in there is a great place to start. And I ain't going to give you much of a choice in the matter. I'm going in. He got out of the car and started striding across the road. Oh, I like him, Valkyrie said. I thought you might, said Skullduggery. Go round the back, will you? Let's at least pretend like we're professionals. Chapter 20 Valkyrie put her boot to the door, and it burst open, and in she went, shock sticks swinging, catching the first guy in the jaw, and the second guy in the knee, the back, and then the face. They both fell, and she moved out of the kitchen, down the short corridor. There were a lot of crashes coming from the front of the house, a lot of cries of pain. A woman came hurtling out of a doorway, not even looking where she was going. Valkyrie jabbed her in her chest with both sticks, and there was a flash, and she went flying back. Clear, she heard Skullduggery say. Clear, she responded. She put her sticks away, forming a cross on her back, and stepped into the living room. Five unconscious people in here, one still conscious, bleeding from a busted nose, and sitting on a chair. Skullduggery and Oberon stood over him. What's your name? Skullduggery asked. The man twisted his lip as he was about to answer, and Skullduggery hit him. Rudeness will not be tolerated. Let's just make that clear right at the start. I'm Skullduggery. She's Valkyrie. He's Oberon. What's your name? The man spat out a tooth. Sleeve, he said. Where's my son? Oberon demanded. Sleeve frowned. How the hell would I know? Who's your son? Robbie, said Oberon. His name's Robbie. Ah, Sleeve said. You're his dad, are you? Not much of a family resemblance, if I'm being honest. Where is he? Sleeve held up his hands. I refer you to my earlier reply. To wit, how the hell would I know? You move him around, don't you? I did, said Sleeve. With the rest of these mooks, every week we take the kid somewhere new and guard him, feed him, put up with his nonsense, and take him to see his mommy two or three times a week. But recently we were informed that our services were no longer required. Sadly, I have been made redundant. His voice suddenly filled with hope. I don't suppose you have any other kids we could kidnap, do you? Oberon lunged, and Skullduggery held him back, and Sleeve laughed. Valkyrie hunkered down in front of him. How long were you on this particular job? she asked. Sleeve shrugged. Four months, maybe five. So you're not the first to keep him moving around. And we're not the last, either. Who's your boss? We're freelance. We don't have a boss. 
Then who hired you? Who gave you your instructions? Who did you report to? Sleeve grinned. The answer to all those questions is the same name, and I'll tell you what it is, providing you let us go. I'm afraid that's not how it works. Then you should probably change how it works, because you may have come in here and kicked all our asses, and some of them twice, but from where I'm sitting, I'm the one in the position of power. Careful now, Valkyrie said. We can always send a sensitive into your head, and who knows what they might scramble while they're in there. Sleeve didn't look too worried. You don't think I've got defences for that sort of thing? Sure, those defences don't last forever, but I'd hold out for as long as I could, just out of spite. Let us go. All of us. Even the stupid ones. Then I'll tell you the name of the man you're looking for. With Oberon now at the other side of the room, Skullduggery straightened his tie. We won't do that, he said. But you tell us his name, and when we've verified that you told us the truth, then we'll let you go. That's more like it, said Sleeve. See, girl, this is how you negotiate. May I stand? By all means, said Skullduggery. Sleeve stood. I like your counter-offer, Mr. Pleasant. It shows potential. But we're not going to be able to accept this whole being released afterwards thing. The problem is, yeah, we're criminals, and so decidedly untrustworthy. But you're sanctuary folk, and so you're absolutely untrustworthy. You obviously haven't heard, said Valkyrie. We're arbiters now. We don't report to anyone. Huh, said Sleeve. I didn't know the Arbiters were still a thing. They weren't, Skullduggery said. They are now. But you're still working with the Sanctuaries, Sleeve said, which means you're bound by their rules. Not all of them. Then you can let us go. And once you do that, I'll tell you his name. If I don't, or if I lie, you feel free to hunt us down. Contrary to what you might be thinking, we're really not that smart, so you won't have too much trouble finding us. Skullduggery looked at Oberon, and then at Valkyrie. She shrugged. Okay, Skullduggery said. We won't arrest you. Another smile broke out across Sleeve's face. Knew you were a man with an open mind. I could see it in your eye sockets. He kicked one of his unconscious friends until they stirred. Hey, hey, get up! Wake the others or drag him out! You got two minutes! They stood silently while Sleeve's friends were either revived or hauled out through the back door. It took a lot longer than two minutes. When they were gone and only Sleeve remained, he pulled on his jacket. It was very nice to meet all of you, he said. Detective Pleasant... You're a surprisingly reasonable fellow for a bunch of bones in a suit. Detective Kane, you're a scary lady, and that's all I'll say about that. Robbie's dead. I don't know anything else about you. So all I'll say is that you just need to calm down in general, and maybe people will like you more. Skullduggery took out his gun and aimed it at Sleeve's head. The name... Sleeve raised his hands slowly. We only met him once, he said. He came to see us, told us what he expected, told us when and where to move, and explained how we'd be getting paid. We never saw him again, never saw anyone else working for him. His name? Crepuscular Vise. Skullduggery glanced at Valkyrie, then at Oberon. Never heard of him, Oberon said. I'm not surprised, said Sleeve. I didn't have a clue who he was either, and I still don't. He's tall, about the same height as you fellas, and wears a suit, bow tie, and a hat. But I wouldn't worry about what he's wearing, because his face is... 
It's just wrong. You'll know it when you see it. Nationality? Valkyrie asked. Sleeve laughed. <laughs> Don't you know? Irish, of course. The most evil people in the world are Irish. Chapter 21 What do you think of him? Valkyrie asked, as they waited in the diner for Fletcher to come and pick them up. One eyebrow rose on Skullduggery's facade. The waiter? Oberon, she said, and took a sip of coffee. It was not good. He seems capable, Skullduggery said. He had a glass of water before him that he was never going to touch. He threw around some of Sleeve's people without too much bother. Do you believe him? I have no reason not to. You? Yeah, I believe him. Well, okay then. It was pitch black outside, and the diner was empty of customers, apart from them and a drunk guy in the corner booth who kept getting up to play sad country songs on the jukebox. Algary took another sip of her coffee. It wasn't getting any better. Do you think you'd be able to find out anything about this crepuscular vise? Probably not, Skullduggery said. Oberon's motivations may be pure, and he could have useful contacts in the criminal underworld that might provide a lead. But we'll probably have to devote some time to it ourselves, after our show of strength for Seraphina tomorrow. Once all this is out of the way, I promise we'll come up with a way to find Dr. Nye. Valkyrie nodded and took another sip, hoping he wouldn't spot the look of guilt that flashed across her face. Fletcher came in. Valkyrie scooched over so he could sit beside her. Everything good? Everyone unharmed? Sorry I'm late. Had a bit of trouble finding the place. How's the coffee? Wonderful, said Valkyrie. You should get some. No, caffeine makes me jumpy, and I'm going straight back to sleep after this. She winced. We're sorry for getting you out of bed, aren't we, Skullduggery? Absolutely, Skullduggery said. And we appreciate you doing this, don't we, Skullduggery? Thoroughly, Fletcher smiled. The way I look at it, I'm not only helping you, I'm also helping the environment. That's one of the great tragedies about keeping magic a secret, isn't it? If everyone knew about us, teleporters could transport people all around the world without a single harmful emission. Makes you wonder if we should just tell them for the sake of the planet. I'm not entirely sure that the war that would inevitably follow wouldn't damage the environment all over again, Skullduggery said. You should have more faith in mortals, Fletcher countered. Not all of them are war-hungry simpletons, you know. No, Skullduggery said. But they do tend to scare easily, and when people are scared, they lash out. Fletcher adjusted his hair slightly. You have such a dim view of the people you fight every day to protect. I'm just waiting for them to prove me wrong. Fletcher looked at Valkyrie. Please tell me you have a cheerier outlook on life. You can't be as miserable as him. You just can't. She smiled. I believe that people are good. Thank you, Fletcher responded. Most of them, anyway. Okay. I mean, not any that I've met, but you can stop there, he said. Wow. The two of you must have fun saving the world for people you don't even like. I'm joking, said Valkyrie. I'm not, said Skullduggery. I believe people are good, Valkyrie continued, though flawed. And given all the information and enough time, they will do the right thing. Skullduggery picked up his hat from the seat and put it on the table. And I believe that life is arbitrary, and when time moves on, it will be as if we never existed. Do you want any pie? No, said Valkyrie. Then we should probably get going. You've changed. Fletcher said, not moving. The both of you. You have. Remember when we used to be a team? Remember the energy? The excitement? The laughs? Whatever happened to all that? When who used to be a team? Skullduggery asked. The three of us, said Fletcher. And Tanif and Ghastly. 
And you? Yes, me. You never took me seriously, but I was a vital part of the team. You were the boss. Valkyrie laughed, and Fletcher smirked. I upped out more than that, and you know it, he said. You just don't want to admit that I've grown. Hey, I understand. You knew me when I was a kid. Now I'm an adult, and I have a job. Educating young people. Moulding young minds. I have responsibilities. Obligations. We're both alphas. You probably feel threatened by me. Also, you're jealous of my hair. I get it. I'd be jealous of it too. But I propose, right now, that we leave the past in the past and from this day on, treat each other as equals. What do you say, Skullduggery? Fletcher stuck out his hand. Skullduggery observed it for a moment, then extended his own hand and picked up his hat. You're funny, Fletcher said, nodding as Skullduggery put the hat on and stood. That was well done. Thank you, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie left a tip and got out of the booth after Fletcher, and they went outside and he teleported them home. He dropped Skullduggery beside the Bentley and then left Valkyrie in her living room. She gave him a hug and he vanished, and Zena came bounding in. Valkyrie had a few hours sleep and then drove to Roarhaven to meet the Prince of the Darklands. Chapter 22 The Fangs was quiet this time of the morning. Vampires may not have been harmed by the sun, but they weren't known to be early risers. The only people on the streets were those coming back from a night shift. She followed the directions Dusk had given her and came to a theatre, a few years old and never used. She went round the back, found the opened door and climbed the stairs. With each step, she took the next one slower. This could be a trap, of course. This was very likely a trap. It was so likely a trap that Abyssinia would have known that Valkyrie would be thinking that and would then dismiss it because of how likely it was. So then the possibility of this being a trap became even more likely. Eventually, her thoughts became so confusing that she just marched up the rest of the stairs and emerged onto the roof of the theatre. There was a man standing here, waiting. He was thin and had tightly shaven silver hair and pale scars on his pale skin. You must be Kason, said Valkyrie. His smile was fleeting, uncertain. There was a nervous energy about him, like an animal getting ready to bolt. Valkyrie proceeded with caution. How are you coping with being back in circulation? I have good days, and bad ones, he said. He had a soft voice. I'm having a good day now, in case you were wondering. I'm not going to attack you, or anything like that. I keep thinking I should attack you because... because we're on different sides. I keep thinking that too. Isn't that odd, how we think that? How we're almost ready to... to do that? For no reason other than the people we associate with. It is strange, yes. Kason's eyes dipped. You're friends with the skeleton, he mumbled. I am. The skeleton murdered my mother. He killed her, yes, but she came back. His eyes flickered up, and he gave another faltering smile. I'm very confused, he said. I don't blame you. He was seized, all of a sudden, by an intensity that made Valkyrie want to step back. The skeleton took my mother away from me. He raged. When I needed her, he hurt her. He killed her. She's only alive today because he was too weak to finish the job. I hate him, and I want to kill him and everyone he knows. And as suddenly as it had arrived, the rage passed. He started crying. Valkyrie waited a moment. What can I do for you, Kason? She asked softly. Why are we here? It took him a moment to answer. It was a moment he spent wrestling with thoughts she'd never be able to understand. My mother, he said eventually. She has spies. I heard one of them say that you're looking for someone, some thing. 
A Krengarian. She frowned. Dr. Nye, yes. I know where it is. I heard my mother say. Valkyrie forced herself to wait. Is it important that you find this creature? Kason continued. If it's important, then I'll tell you, but you need to tell me something first. It's important. I need Nye to help my sister. What do you want to know? Greymire Asylum, Kason said. Where is it? I've never heard of it. But you can find out, can't you? You're a detective. You, you can ask someone. Maybe the skeleton knows. I can find out, sure. You tell me where Nye is, and I'll find where... No! Kason screamed. You tell me where Greymire Asylum is, and then I help you. You first! You! Valkyrie held up her hands. Okay, okay, I'll do that, I will. Kason hugged himself and shook his head, muttering. What's in there that's so important for you? She asked. Kason tapped his forehead. It's from my mind. My mind is... I can be quite erratic and... And there's a cure for you in the asylum? He nodded. A cure, yes. A cure for me in Greymire. K-49. I know some really good doctors I could introduce you to. So does China, for that matter. Kason blinked. China. China sorrows? She raised you, right? She took you in and she raised you like you were her own child? His face contorted. Hatred etched into every line and hollow. China betrayed me. China gave me to Serafina to torture. She lies. She is nothing but darkness and coldness and lies. I'm going to kill her. We're going to hunt her down and kill her. And kill anyone who stands with her. We're going to tear her apart. We're going to make her scream. We're going to make her bleed. We're going to... He stopped breathing quickly, forcing himself to calm down. No, oh, he said. My only hope is K-49. My only hope is in Greymire Asylum. Find out where it is, and I'll tell you where the Krenga is working now. Meet me here in two days, but... At night. I don't like the day. It's too... Meet me at night... Monday night, then, she said. When it's dark. Ten o'clock? Yes, yes, ten o'clock. At ten o'clock, you will tell me what I need to know, and I will tell you how to find the creature you seek. Chapter 23 All things considered, that had gone pretty well. Valkyrie checked the time. Serafina wasn't due to arrive for another ten minutes, and the high sanctuary was only five minutes away. She'd make it over there by noon, no problem. China had told her to dress formally, but she hadn't quite known what that meant in this instance. She wasn't going to be wearing a dress. She'd known that much. Nothing with heels, either. In the end, she had decided that black jeans and a smart coat were formal enough. Plus, they allowed her to fight to the death if the situation called for it which was always a bonus. This was a good day, Valkyrie decided. She hadn't walked into a trap, and she'd managed to strike a deal with a guy who looked like he was barely keeping it together. If Skullduggery had been with her, she just knew he'd have said the wrong thing, and it would all have imploded. It was a good thing she hadn't told him. It was definitely a good thing, and he would totally understand. Totally. She came round a corner and braked. There was traffic. There was actual traffic. No, 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 she muttered, craning her neck to see past the line of cars. This was unheard of. For one thing, apart from Old Town, the streets of Roarhaven were designed to flow unimpeded. That had long been a bragging point, another area where mages could feel smug when discussing their mortal cousins and their constant traffic woes. For another... Valkyrie hadn't even known that there were enough cars in Roarhaven to form a traffic jam. 
Most people here used the tram system. Why didn't you all take the tram? She shouted, even though no one could hear her. People walked by. People crossed the road, darting between Valkyrie's slow-moving car and the slow-moving car in front. Large groups of people. Very large groups. Some of them held signs. She finally got closer, and a city guard officer checked her sanctuary tags and waved her into the circle zone, and she sped down the ramp to the parking area beneath the high sanctuary, then sprinted for the elevator tiles. She rose up into the foyer, looking around for someone she recognised. There were city guard officers and cleavers everywhere. Sanctuary staff rushed to and fro. The air had a nervous energy to it. Cerise, holding a clipboard, saw her immediately, despite the chaos, and swept over to her, taking her gently by the arm. You are required outside, she said, the calm at the centre of this storm. The high superior is approaching Shudder's gate. I'm so sorry I'm late, Valkyrie said. I didn't expect the traffic. There are a lot of people out there. Yes, said Cerise. There are. The doors opened and a blast of noise hit them. It looked like the entire circle zone was filled with people, divided by a thin line of cleavers. More people joined either side. They waved placards. They shouted. Cerise left her at the top of the steps and Valkyrie crossed an actual red carpet to hurry over to Skullduggery. He was in a dark blue three-piece with a crisp white shirt and a blue tie. His hat was perfectly placed. Just in time, he said. This is a bigger deal than I'd thought, she responded, actually having to raise her voice to be heard over the restless crowd. People have come from all over the world for this. Serafina Day hasn't been spotted in public for decades. She has a lot of fans. He shook his head. Only half of them are here supporting her. The others are protesting. Valkyrie took another look and realised one half of the crowd was arguing with the other. She turned back to Skullduggery. Cerise called Seraphina the High Superior. Skullduggery said something that Valkyrie didn't hear. What? she said. He stepped closer and extended his hands to either side, and the air around them rippled. Her ears popped slightly as the sound of the crowd was muted. Is that better? he asked, keeping his hands where they were. Much, she said, speaking at normal volume again. Seraphina is the head of a different branch of Faceless One's disciples, he told her. The Legion of Judgment. Valkyrie nodded. Now that sounds like a fun and accepting place of worship. The Legion views Mevolent as their messiah and reckons that his interpretation of their teachings, and I would use air quotes here if my hands were free, and if I were the sort of person to use air quotes, is the true way. Creed, on the other hand, has a supposedly gentler approach. But Creed denounced Mevolent during the war for being too soft. And yet now the church is all about fluffiness and acceptance. Makes you wonder if Archcanon Creed is being entirely honest, doesn't it? He must love the fact that Seraphina's visiting. The visit has, I've heard, caused something of a split within his congregation. But I'm sure there's a part of him, tucked away somewhere, that will be happy to see his little sister after all these years. Valkyrie's eyes widened. Their brother and sister? Did everyone know this except me? Probably. She glared. You did this before. Did I? With China and Mr. Bliss. You didn't tell me they were brother and sister until, like... Well, I don't think you did tell me. I think someone else did. Magical society is a small world, Skullduggery said. People have brothers and sisters all over the place, right where you least expect them. Parents, too. Cousins, aunts and uncles. And everyone looks the same age, Valkyrie said. I'll never get used to that part of it. So, which is bigger, the Legion of Judgment or the Church of the Faceless? The Church has more physical places of worship, but most worshippers keep their membership secret, so it's very hard to say which is bigger. 
And more and more mages are turning to the faceless ones with every week that passes. Valkyrie made a face. Why? People need something to believe in. Even sorcerers. The more they learn, the more they uncover about life and magic and alternate universes. The more they search for a greater meaning. But the faceless ones don't care about any of them. People are strange, Skullduggery said, and brought his hands back together, and the noise closed in on them once more. The three elders arrived, nodded to Skullduggery and Valkyrie, and took up their positions in front of them. Then China came out, looking amazing. She winked at Valkyrie and took her place at the very top of the stairs. The crowd went quiet as Serafina's convoy came into view, black cars and SUVs, reinforced with armour and with protective sigils engraved into their doors. The cleavers directed them round and then through the circle, making sure they stayed clear of the grasping, clutching hands of the people. As they neared, colour washed across the air, and Valkyrie realised that the High Sanctuary's force field had been extended. A section opened so that the convoy could pass through. It stopped at the base of the steps. One of Serafina's security people, a woman in black, opened the door to the middle car, and Serafina Day stepped out. Chapter 24 She was... glorious. Tall and solid and strong, Serafina wore a red dress, stained black at the edges. The skirt wrapped tightly around her waist and flared out at the ends. The bodice had a rib cage, made of actual ribs, and it opened at the chest to reveal a necklace of finger bones. Bracelets, also made of bone, rattled on her left wrist. Her long chestnut hair was held back by a headpiece formed from what looked like a human skull. Sheepers, Valkyrie whispered. Half the crowd cheered with bottomless adoration. The other half hurled insults and obscenities. It would have been amusing if the wide-eyed fanaticism wasn't so scary. Serafina ascended the stairs alone. Once at the top, she embraced China. My magnificent girl, Serafina said. It's so good to see you again after all these years. You look radiant, China responded. Serafina kissed both China's cheeks. As do you. Belated congratulations on your new position. You thoroughly deserve it. If anyone can whip the sanctuaries into shape, it's you. China smiled. You're far too kind. Allow me to introduce you to my council of advisors. This is Grand Mage Aloysius Vespers of the English Sanctuary. Vespers shuffled forward and struggled to bow. Welcome to Rawhaven, High Superior. The tales of your legendary beauty are all true, I see, even to old eyes such as mine. Serafina bowed slightly. Have we not met before, Grand Mage? You seem familiar to me, perhaps without the beard. Vespers chuckled. I am afraid not, High Superior. I would remember meeting someone as striking as you. He shuffled back, and Praetor stepped forward. This is Grand Mage Gavin Praetor, said China, of the American Sanctuary. Praetor bowed deeply, but kept his eyes locked on Serafina's. It is an honour, High Superior, to be in the presence of someone so bewitching. Surely, Grand Mage, you are used to it by now, Serafina responded. Is the Supreme Mage not more bewitching than I? Is she not the most beautiful woman you've ever laid eyes upon? Praetor smiled. I would certainly not like to choose between you, High Superior. How thoroughly gracious, Serafina said. And this is Grand Mage Sturm und Drang of the German Sanctuary, said China. I believe you know each other. Drang gave a curt bow. High Superior? 
Serafina smiled. No exaltations about my timeless beauty, Sturman. I can call you that, can't I? I believe once you make an attempt on someone's life, you grant that person permission to use your first name. Drang remained impassive. That was a long time ago. Serafina's smile grew smaller, but somehow even more glorious. Was it? China seized this moment to step between them and steered Serafina towards Skullduggery. And you remember Skullduggery Pleasant, of course. How could I forget a man such as this? Serafina said and tapped her finger bone necklace. I believe one of these is yours. I believe you may be right, Skullduggery said, coolly. And this, said Serafina, must be the infamous Valkyrie Kane, the girl who very nearly destroyed us all. I suppose I am, Valkyrie responded. How do you do? Very well, thank you, Serafina answered and swept her arm back. Her security person, the woman dressed in black, came up the steps. Allow me to introduce my sister, Rune. Rune was as tall as Skullduggery, and she had broad shoulders, an impressively square jaw, and flat, expressionless eyes. Her dark hair was tied back in a functional bun, and she managed to make the suit she wore seem like a military uniform. We've met before, Skullduggery said. I'm aware, said Rune. A silence followed. How was the journey? China asked. Long, said Serafina. How I miss the days when everyone had a teleporter at their disposal. You miss them when they're gone, don't you? But don't worry. Carrival Academy is training up the next generation of teleporters and I'm sure they'll be available to hire in a few short years. Quite said Serafina, and her smile dimmed a fraction before returning, as brilliant as ever. Please come inside, China said. It's far too cold to be standing out here like this. Serafina gave a gentle nod, turned to the crowd and waved. This drove her supporters into a frenzy. It didn't go down well with the protesters. One of them threw a bottle of water. It bounced harmlessly off the force field. Serafina blew a kiss. Valkyrie stood with Skullduggery, watching the procession as it threaded its way into the high sanctuary. Are we done now? she asked once they were alone. We are, he said. The crowd started chanting competing slogans at each other as the cleavers moved to break them up. I talked to Kaysen, Valkyrie blurted. Skullduggery tilted his head at her. I didn't know how else to say it, she said. I thought blurting might be the best option. She looked at the crowd. It was showing no signs of dispersing. You must be talking about some other Kaysen, Skullduggery said slowly. Nope, she replied. It's the one you're thinking of. You know, your son, Kaysen. He wanted to meet me, and we met. First of all... Skullduggery said. He's not my son. You don't know that. You told me yourself there are all kinds of magical ways to make a baby that don't require the usual process. I'm going to say it again. He's not my son. Second of all, why didn't you tell me? I am telling you. Why didn't you tell me before you met him? It could have been a trap. That's why I didn't tell you. It was a risk, but it was a risk I was ready to take. He had a proposal that he wanted to talk to me about. It was all very fine and undramatic. I mean, he's obviously a very traumatised person, but he didn't try to kill me or anything. Well, that's a good start, I suppose. He did say he wanted to kill you, though. That hardly seems fair. The only bad thing I ever did to him was kill his mother. And she came back. That's what I told him, Valkyrie said. I think he's conflicted about the whole thing, but he still wants to kill you. So 
this proposal of his, he claims to know how to find Dr. Nye, and he says he'll tell me if I tell him where Greymire Asylum is. Skullduggery tilted his head to the other side. Greymire, eh? He says there's a cure there. I think it's called K49 that'll help soothe his mind. So do you know where Greymire is? Not exactly. Can you find it? I don't know. Valkyrie frowned. Is that doubt in your voice? Greymire Asylum doesn't exist, Skullduggery said. Not officially, anyway. It has no staff, and it has no patients. No one knows anyone who's ever worked there. Okay, so it's a secret psychiatric hospital. No, Skullduggery said. It's not a psychiatric hospital at all. It's what was once called a lunatic asylum, as barbaric as that sounds. Sorcerers driven mad by magic were sent there, only the most dangerous, only the worst cases. They were locked away so that the rest of us could forget about them. China would know where it is, wouldn't she? She won't tell us. I wouldn't tell us either. Greymire is best left forgotten. Well, said Valkyrie, that's not really going to work for me. We'll grab Kason, Skullduggery said. The next time he comes to visit, we'll grab him and send someone into his head. We'll find out what he knows. No. Valkyrie, we've been looking for Nye for months and we haven't come close to it. Kason is our only lead and I'm not going to risk that by trying something sneaky. Besides, his head is so messed up that I doubt a sensitive would be able to learn anything useful, even if we did grab him. Kason came to me with a proposal and I've accepted. It sounds like you've already decided. And it sounds like you're trying to overrule me. You can't tell him where Greymire is, Skullduggery said. Even if you knew, you couldn't tell him. That information is too dangerous to be let out into the world. We'll find Nye on our own. It's just a matter of time. Too much time has passed already. Alice is eight years old. She deserves a normal life. We'll give it to her, I promise. We just need another way. The other ways aren't working. Your ways aren't working. This is my way. Are you going to help me or will I have to do it alone? He looked at her. I'll help you. Of course I will. But you must understand what we'll be doing. Greymire Asylum contains the worst of the worst, Valkyrie. Sorcerers whose names you've never heard because no one wants to utter them aloud. To pass this information to someone like Kason. If we're discovered, we'll be arrested for treason. They wouldn't arrest us. Who'd order it? China? China wouldn't arrest us. Not without good reason. Which this would be. Valkyrie looked at the crowd, then raised an eyebrow. And what do you think would the punishment be for breaking into Greymire Asylum? Why would we do that? If we found this K-49 thing, we wouldn't have to tell Kason where Greymire is, would we? We give him his cure, he tells us where Nye is. That could work. So, if China won't tell us where Greymire is, how do we find it? The only place I can think of where it would be written down is in the diaries of the Grand Mages. But they were all destroyed when the desolation engine went off in the old sanctuary. There has to be someone apart from China who knows. There may be one person. There you go, said Valkyrie, grinning. I knew you'd think of something. Chapter 25 The crowd that filled the circle zone a few hours earlier had finally dispersed. There had been a lot of shouting and sign-waving, but Omen didn't have a clue what had been going on. Someone was visiting, he reckoned. Someone important. He waited beside the fountain, his coat zipped all the way up to his chin. He should have worn the coat he'd got here in the city, 
the one guaranteed to keep you warm no matter what. But instead he'd chosen the other coat, the one made by mortals, because it did a better job of hiding the extra weight he was still lugging around. This was a dreadful coat. It was freezing. At a little past four, the mortal ambassadors came out of the high sanctuary and down the steps. Ornia parted company with them before they got on the tram that would take them back to the humdrums. She was wearing a coat made by sorcerers. She didn't look chilly in the slightest. I'm so sorry I'm late, she said. The reception got in the way of everything and the meeting ran over and it was just... It was bedlam. Have you been waiting long? No, he said. Not long at all. She glanced at the clock. I can't even go for coffee with you, she said. I told my parents I'd be back by half four to help with the shop. He came out here for nothing. Not for nothing, said Omen. It's always good to see you, and I can ride back with you. But that's really out of your way. It's Saturday. What else have I got to do? She laughed, and they caught the next tram and settled in their seats. Who was the reception for? Omen asked. Ornia soured. The wife of Mevolent. Seraphina Day. In my dimension she's been dead since before I was born, but here she lives, and it is Mevolent who is dead, which of course is far preferable. Did you get to meet her? She frowned. No. Why would I want to meet anyone like that? I just thought it would be... I don't know, actually. So, um, the meeting you had, what was it about? Ornia shrugged. The usual. It was us voicing the concerns of the people in our community and the high sanctuaries, um, what's the word? People who love rules and filling out forms. Oh, I know it. I know the word you're thinking of. It's, um, it begins with a B. Bureaucrats, said Ornia. Yes. Us on one side, the high sanctuaries bureaucrats on the other. They make notes and lists and tell us no, using every other word but no. Sounds annoying. It can be. But it's how things get done here. And to be honest with you, it's still far, far better than what we had back home. What day did you say it is again? Saturday. She nodded. So it's once more time to thank you for making me an ambassador. He laughed. I get the feeling you're good at it. I do enjoy it, I have to say. Some of the other ambassadors got bored or too busy, so they're not coming to the meetings anymore, but I really like it. I like making a difference, and I like people paying attention to what I have to say. I'm the youngest ambassador we have. It's, um, uh, it's cool. I'm glad, Omen said, smiling. How's the shop? It's doing okay, Ornia replied. It's smaller than the one we used to have, but it's obviously in a much safer neighbourhood. Well, usually. What do you mean? Ornia shrugged. There are people, sorcerers, who have started coming into the humdrums and, you know. What? They offer to protect our businesses for money, but if you don't pay, bad things happen. Seriously? Omen asked, keeping his voice low. Have you told the city guard? The city guard are usually the ones doing it. Omen stared at her, then sat back. You hadn't heard? Ornia asked. About any of this? No, said Omen. I mean, I don't pay that much attention to the network, but I'm sure I'd remember something like that. It hasn't been reported. The Supreme Mage would prefer to handle this without causing a scandal. She says sorcerers still like to congratulate themselves on taking us in, even if they do hide us away in a corner of the city where nobody else goes. She says they would not appreciate these unfortunate developments. But that's awful. Yes. But that's like, really awful. Everyone should know about this. It can't be allowed. If people knew what was going on, it would stop immediately. Would it? Ornia asked. We're setting up our businesses and our shops and our services and everyone my age is going to school. But for the vast majority of us, we're working for sorcerers. We're cleaning their houses and taking care of their children and preparing their food. 
They don't really care about the bad things that are going on because they don't... Don't what? They don't view us as equals, Ornia said. I don't mean you, and I don't mean all sorcerers, but a lot of them. Omen didn't know what to say. Wow. Yeah. We're horrible. No, you're not. We are horrible, terrible people. You're cool, said Ornia, smiling again. Many sorcerers are cool, but some are not. What's the Frank Sinatra song? That's life. You know Frank Sinatra? She grinned. We're making our way through the music of this dimension. At first, it was all noise and none of it made sense. But the more we listen, the more we love. My father is a big fan of Frank Sinatra. He hopes to see him in concert one day. My mother, she's into the Beatles and the Monkees. Great bands, Omen said, nodding. Of the Beatles, she loves John the most. She wants to write him a letter. Uh, I think John Lennon is dead. Oh, said Ornia. Oh, she will be disappointed. Frank Sinatra's dead too. Ornia winced. My father will not be happy. What about you? Omen asked. Do you have a favourite band or singer or whatever? She hesitated, then shook her head. I'm not going to say her name, in case you tell me that she's also dead. I'd rather live in a world with her in it. Thank you very much. Well, OK, said Omen, smiling. That sounds fair enough. There were very few people travelling this line today, so it didn't take long to reach the humdrums. Ornia pressed the button to stop, and she stood. Thanks for coming out, she said. Sorry we didn't have time to do anything. That's OK. Omen said. He tried to think of a funny line to part with, but by the time he'd come up with something, Ornia was already waving and hopping off. The tram pulled away, and he shrugged. It hadn't been that funny anyway. The only other passenger on the tram, a girl in a big coat who had been sitting at the other end, got up and walked over and sat beside him, actually sat beside him, he felt his face go red and felt his heart in his chest. She was going to chat him up. She was going to chat him up. He decided, then and there, that he didn't care what she looked like under that hood. He was going to say yes when she asked him out. She pulled down the hood and he shrieked. Quiet! Colleen Stint said, punching his arm. Ow! He yelled. What part of quiet didn't you understand? They stared at each other. Then he leaped up, spun round, expecting the other members of First Wave to charge at him. Colleen sighed. There's no one else here. Where are they? He demanded. Where's Yenon? I'm the only one who came. Would you please stop freaking out? It's embarrassing for you. Pretty sure that they were, in fact, alone, Omen glared at her and backed away. He sat down opposite. What are you doing here? he asked. How did you even get past Shudder's gate? Nero, she said. Don't worry, he doesn't know it's you I came to see. I asked if I could tag along the next time he teleported into Roarhaven. He's been, I don't know, distracted lately, so he didn't ask any questions. Omen frowned at her. Why has he been teleporting into Roarhaven? You really think they'd tell us? He narrowed his eyes. What do you want, Colleen? We need your help. Me, Perpetua, Sabre and Disdain. We want to get away from Abyssinia. But you are away from Abyssinia. You're here. Why didn't the others come with you? Colleen made a face. We don't want to come to Roarhaven. Everyone here knows that we left with Yenon and joined up with Abyssinia. Can you imagine the way they'd look at us? Can you imagine what they'd say about us? Then where do you want to go? Nowhere with sorcerers, Colleen responded. We just want a few years away from all this craziness. When it's over, when people calm down, maybe then we'll come back. But right now we want to blend in with the mortals. Maybe somewhere in Australia or California, somewhere with a beach. Why? 
Why do we want a beach? Why are you leaving Abyssinia? Colleen hugged herself. We never wanted to be there. We thought we did. We'd let Mr. Lilt convince us that we were bigger and better than everyone else, and that Abyssinia would let us take what was ours. And what is yours? I don't even know, Colleen said, her shoulders slumping. I think we just wanted to be respected. And we didn't want to wait for it. We wanted it now. We wanted to be on the winning side. Does that sound stupid? Very much so. I don't know why we fell for it, Omen, okay? Maybe because we were in a gang and we all thought we were cool and then Lethe told us we were awesome, that we were first wave and Razia was there and Nero back when he was behaving normally and it was all exciting and cool and fun. You were hanging around with murderers. Yes, I know. Thank you, Omen, for stating the bloody obvious. When you were, Omen mumbled. Colleen looked away. Isadora's dead. Something turned in Omen's chest. Oh. Yeah. He'd never had someone he knew die before. Not one of his contemporaries, at least. Someone his own age. Someone he'd passed in the corridor. How? Colleen cleared her throat. <clears throat> Yenon killed her. What? She tried to leave, said Colleen. In fact, no, she didn't try. She just wanted to. She was finding out how she could, but Abyssinia... Well, Abyssinia can read your mind, you know? Yenon did it? Yes. Sort of. What do you mean? There was this whole big ceremony, Colleen said. You know that round thing that hovers over the energy field in Coldheart? The dais? Is that what it's called? I didn't know that. Anyway, yeah, the dais. We were all on it. The convicts were looking down at us. Abyssinia was making a speech, and Isadora was standing right on the edge of the dais. She was crying. I was crying. She was apologising and begging and... And Abyssinia told Yenna to push her off. And he did it? Yes. I, I think Abyssinia helped. I think maybe she got into his head. Maybe gave him encouragement. Maybe took over. I don't know. But yes, he pushed Isadora off. She was my best friend. Since then... We've all been too scared to try anything. So why now? Omen asked. Something's about to happen. They won't tell us what, but we're going to have to hurt some people, I think. We don't have any time left. We have to get out in the next few days. We need your help. Omen nodded. Tell me everything. I can get Skullduggery and Valkyrie to... No! Colleen said sharply. Why not? They'll use us to get to Abyssinia, or they'll get us to answer questions or whatever. But all we want to do is get out and then disappear. They'll help you. They'll also help themselves. Oh, I mean, come on, that's what they do. If they know that something bad is about to happen, they'll have to, like, solve the problem, won't they? I suppose. We've got no interest in that. It's too dangerous as it is. We're not going to risk anything more. You can't tell them about this. You can't tell your brother either. He's just like them. Promise me, Omen. Colleen, you can trust them. Promise me or I'm getting off this tram and you'll never see me again. Omen sighed. I promise. What do you need? Papers, she said. Oh, Colleen... Birth certificates, medical histories, all the mortal papers we've been taught how to replicate. Colin, I'm the worst forger in class, you know that. I barely scrape by. I never do the homework and I cheat on all the tests very, very badly. Colleen squinted. Didn't you get an A on your end of year assignment? Omen went red. I didn't forge that. I just submitted the real certificate. Oh, Omen, I'm really not the person you want for this. You can do it, Colleen said. Well, it's nice that you have faith in me. You have to do it, 
Colleen continued. We have no other choice. We are completely and hopelessly desperate. I wouldn't be here if I had literally any other option. Right. Thanks. Please, said Colleen. I know we're not friends. I know we've never spoken more than a few words to each other and not all of them have been overly nice. But you're the only one we can trust to do this. Please. Our lives are at stake. Fine. Thank you, Colleen said. She took a folder from her coat and passed it to him. Just the four of you? Omen asked. Colleen nodded. Yenin's in too deep to come out. I think the thing with Isadora... He pushed her over the edge, but I think it pushed him over the edge too. He's changed. He's not right in the head. He was never right in the head. Yeah, maybe. What about Laps and Gaul? A look of disgust came over her face. Gaul would follow Yenin into hell. And I think Laps is actually enjoying himself. He was always a bit of a mindless thug, and now he's in his element. The rest of us are just terrified. I'll get it done. But how will I get them to you? I won't be able to get back into Roarhaven, but I'll be able to get to Dublin. If you could sneak out of Corrival and meet me there? Thursday, maybe? How about the spire at three o'clock? Omen nodded. I can do that. Colin pressed the stop button and the tram slowed. Before she stepped off, she turned to him and said, Help us, Omen One Kenobi. You're our only hope. And then she was gone. He'd been Star wars Chapter 26 Feeling better, now that she had confessed all to Skullduggery, Valkyrie listened to the radio while they drove. Skullduggery preferred to drive in silence, but she needed the distraction. Silence made it easier to hear the voices in her head, and that stirred her anxiety. She didn't like that. Anxiety split her in two and hid the stronger part away. Until she found an eye, until she had healed Alice's soul, she couldn't afford to be anything but strong. When she was strong, she was unbeatable. When she was strong, she got things done. Are you okay? Skullduggery asked. His hat was on the back seat and his facade was up. It was one she'd seen before, a dark-haired man with nice eyes. Of course, Valkyrie said. Why do you ask? You're humming. Was I? You were. She hadn't realised. She shrugged. So what? I was humming along to the music. No, he said. The music was playing, but you were humming a single continuous note. She didn't remember doing that. It would have worried her if she'd let it take root in her mind. So who are we going to see? She asked. Are you sure you're all right? Skullduggery, Jesus, I'm grand. I'm sorry my tuneless humming offended your sensitive ear cavities. I was miles away and... And that's it. No big deal. So, this person we're going to visit, who is it? Her name is Mellifluous Golding, he said. She collects secrets. I'm hoping that the location of Greymire Asylum is one she has in her possession. You're hoping... Hope is what we have, Valkyrie, and it has served us well in the past. I am nothing if not a very optimistic pessimist. You're a pessimist? By nature. But you're always so cheerful. My pessimism has nothing to do with my disposition. I'm an optimist. Good for you, I think. Is there a test? Indeed there is said Skullduggery. Do you always expect the best in any situation? Do you have unwavering faith in your fellow human beings? Are you reassured by the certainty that life has a true and intrinsic value? No, no, and yes. What does that make me? He smiled thinly. Conflicted. Valkyrie rolled her eyes. Yeah, I could have told you that. So you're a pessimist, then. Do you expect the best in any situation? 
Generally, no. I try not to have any expectations about anything. That can be quite difficult to do, of course, but it helps me keep an open mind. And what about the unwavering belief in our fellow human beings? If you don't expect anything good from people, you are rarely disappointed. That said, I do have unwavering belief in you, Valkyrie. But you've always been the exception. She smiled at that. And what about the third one? What was it? He looked at her. Am I reassured by the certainty that life has a true and intrinsic value? Yeah, that. Are you? Not at all, he said, and looked back to the road. They passed through a set of gates, took a well-paved road up through a landscaped woodland. When the trees stopped, suddenly, like someone had taken a slice from a pie, the house came into view. It was tall and smooth and exceedingly narrow, no wider than Valkyrie's living room. It curved and sprouted offshoots that linked up with each other. There were few windows. Valkyrie and Skullduggery got out of the Bentley. As they walked towards the double doors of the entrance, Valkyrie called for her magic to blast her upwards, high over the house. She hovered there a little unsteadily and looked down. It was as she'd thought. She descended, landing heavily beside Skullduggery. It's a sigil, she said. The entire house is a huge sigil. Why? What does it do? Nobody knows, except for Mellifluous, he said. Maybe you should ask her. They climbed the three steps and the doors opened, and they were greeted by a striking woman in an emerald green dress with Grace Kelly hair. Skullduggery, she said. Valkyrie. My day is instantly brighter. She stepped forward, shook Valkyrie's hand. Mellifluous Golding, my dear. You are a tall one, aren't you? Valkyrie smiled. Very nice to meet you. And so polite. Mellifluous winked at her and ushered them in. Entrez, entrez, s'il vous plaît. Welcome to Clockwork House. The floors were polished and the ceilings were high. The light came in through the skylights. The walls. The walls were covered with burnished cogs of various sizes. They formed one long trail that flowed up and around and back on itself. There didn't appear to be one ninety-degree turn in this house. All the corners were rounded, which allowed the trail to move from wall to wall. Mellifluous chatted to Skullduggery as she took them through. Wide-open, arched doorways led from one insanely long room to another. They came to what was presumably a living room and sat. All the furniture looked expensive. Mellifluous crossed her legs and adjusted her skirt over her knee. So what can I do for you? We need to get to Greymire Asylum, Skullduggery said. She raised an eyebrow. My, my, that's an unusual one. Very few people have even heard of that god-awful place. Do you know where it is? Valkyrie asked. Me personally? Not a clue, darling. Nor do I want to. Even thinking about Greymire Asylum gives me the heebie-jeebies. I have a policy of staying away from places full of people who'd want to kill me and wear my face. She laughed. <laughs> Morbid. I love it. Is it here? Skullduggery asked. Is it one of your secrets? Very possibly, said Mellifluous. You may ask. Skullduggery looked around. I wish to know the location of Greymire Asylum, he said loudly. A sheen ran across the surface of the cogs. You're in luck? Mellifluous said and got up quickly. This way. They followed the sheen as it moved across the cogs out of the room. Through two more doorways they passed until finally they came to the cog in the middle of a wall where the sheen had settled. I do indeed possess that secret, Mellifluous said. 
I will need two secrets in return, one from each of you. Valkyrie frowned. I don't get it. Mellifluous led the way into another room. Every cog contains a secret. Some are little secrets, some are big, but all are secret for a reason. The reason is what matters. This secret, she said, tapping a random cog, could be the truth behind who killed JFK. While this secret, she tapped another, could be an exam that somebody cheated on twenty years ago. So long as it's important to you, the secret has meaning. It has power. They came to a room with four closed doors along one wall, and Valkyrie realised these were the first interior doors she'd seen. Are any of your secrets here? she asked. Oh, my secret is in the very first cog, said Mellifluous. It's how I started it all. And again, in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't a secret that would change the world, but it was a secret that changed my world. It was my first taken name. From back when I was a man, I took a new taken name and a new gender, and I was reborn as this fabulous creature you see before you. Secrets are secrets. As long as they matter to someone, they matter. So tell me, Valkyrie, do you have a secret? And that would be where I come in, the splinter of Dark Hess whispered into Valkyrie's ear. Chapter 27 Valkyrie jumped, then tried to disguise the jump with a cough. Mellifluous smiled. Is everything all right, my dear? Yes, Valkyrie said, smiling back. She glared at Kess, then looked away, made a show of examining various cogs. Kess walked right by Skullduggery and Mellifluous, and they had no idea she was even there. And there's a reason you haven't told anyone about me, Kess continued. If people knew I was hanging around, after all those people Dark Kess killed, they'd find a way to make me corporeal, just so they could execute me. I think that makes me a particularly juicy secret. I do have one, Valkyrie said, turning to Mellifluous. A, a secret, I mean. I think it should do. Excellent, Mellifluous said, and motioned to the doors. Valkyrie, you will find your cog in the first room. Skullduggery, yours is in the second. Bring them to me when you're finished. Valkyrie hesitated. Who will hear it? Nobody, Mellifluous responded. Not even me. If someone listens to a secret, it's no longer a secret, is it? Valkyrie glanced at Skullduggery, reassured by the slight nod he gave. The cog will know if you're lying, Mellifluous said. The room Valkyrie stepped into was bare, apart from a table, on which sat a cog, average-sized, but duller than the cogs on the walls. She shut the door behind her, and a moment later, Kess walked through the wall. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow at her. I haven't seen you in a while. No offence, Kess said, approaching the cog, but you've been a little bit of a misery guts lately. I mean, ever since you saw the damage you'd done to Alice's soul, it's been pretty bleak to be around you. Valkyrie stared. Wow. I'm just being honest. You could be a little less honest. Where's the fun in that? But I've been keeping tabs on you, you know? Keeping up to date. On things. She grinned. How's Melitza? She's great, thank you. I bet she is. Ignoring the tease, Valkyrie joined her at the table and looked down at the cog. What do I do? Is there a microphone or something? Or do I just, like, talk? Kess had moved over to the wall that separated this room from the room Skullduggery entered. Think I should stick my head in? She asked. Why would you do that? So I can hear Skullduggery's secret. No! Valkyrie said immediately, looking up. God, no! But aren't you curious? He's had so many huge secrets so far. What can he have left? 
He's 450 years old. I'm sure he's got loads of secrets left. And you're not going to listen because it's private. That's not an actual reason, though, is it? Then how about this? If you listen to his secret while he tells the cog, it's no longer a secret. Kess sighed. <sighs> you're no fun. Valkyrie picked up the cog and brought it close to her lips. Hi, she whispered. So, when Dark Kess left, a part of her stayed behind. I'm the only one who can see or hear her. Lucky girl, Kess said happily. Valkyrie glared, then went back to whispering. That's it. That's the secret. Nobody else knows, so... That's it. Is that okay? I hope it is. Anyway, uh, bye. She looked at the cog. Kess peered at it. Did it work? I've no idea. Did it beep? Why would it beep? I don't know, Kess said a little hotly. Things beep when you leave messages. It's not voicemail, Kess. It's part of a magical thingy. I love it when you get technical. I think it's done, Valkyrie said. I mean, I told it the secret. There's nothing left to actually do, so it's done, right? Yes, said Kess. Maybe. Maybe? Maybe the secret isn't big enough. You said it was. Kess made a face. What do I know? I'm a version of you, like three times removed. I'm essentially an idiot. Oh, cheers. Maybe I'm just not that big a secret. But it matters to me, said Valkyrie, and that's what's important. Mellifluous made that perfectly clear. Meh, said Kess. OK, then, what should I do? Kess shrugged. Tell it another secret? I don't have any other secrets. Sure you do, Kess said. You've got loads of things you haven't told anyone. Deeply, hilariously personal things. Valkyrie frowned. None of them are nearly in the same category as being the only person able to see a splinter of a genocidal god. Hey, don't underestimate your own patheticness. Doubt that's a word. Of course it's a word. It's the state of being pathetic, which you are. Are you going to stand there and hurl insults, or are you going to help me come up with something? I can't do both. Fine. Can you think of anything else? Anything bigger? A secret you're keeping even from yourself? If I were keeping a secret from myself, how would I know? I'd know, Kess said, grinning. So you know a secret that I'm keeping from myself? I know one that you're not admitting to. About what? Well, if I tell you, would it still be a secret? Valkyrie stared at her, then shook her head. I don't want to know. What? If I'm keeping it from myself, then there's probably a very good reason. She hefted the cog and walked to the door, but stopped before she reached it and turned. So what have you been doing if you haven't been around me? Not a whole lot I can do, Kess replied. I just focused on staying alive. What do you mean? Kess hesitated. You've got plenty of problems as it is. That's absolutely true, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't tell me yours. Well, I'm... I'm kind of losing my strength a little bit. Valkyrie frowned. How much is a little bit? Like, a big bit. And what does it mean when you lose strength? There isn't a guidebook to any of this, said Kess. So I'm really not sure. But I reckon if I lose enough strength, then I'm going to... Stop. Stop what? Stop existing. What? Kess tried a smile. Kess go poof. But, but no, said Valkyrie, walking over to her. You can't. You can't just stop existing. That's stupid. Kess nodded. I agree. One hundred percent. That is stupid. But, like I said, it seems to be what's going to happen. There has to be something I can do. Nothing springs to mind. You've taken all this time off and you have no thoughts on how to save yourself? Short of heading off after Darkess and rejoining her? Not a clue. So, sorry I haven't been around. 
It takes a lot out of me to find you and get to you and then actually interact with you. Then save your strength, Valkyrie said. Don't appear to me any more. Kess laughed. Are you nuts? You're the only person I can have a conversation with. I love talking to you. It gives me meaning. Also, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, what with your new relationship status and all, you're pretty easy on the eyes. Valkyrie had to laugh, and Kess grinned. I'll be okay, Kess said. We'll work something out before it's too late. But right now, you've got to focus on helping our little sister. That's what's most important. All right, Valkyrie said. I... I wish I could hug you. Yeah, said Kess. Me too. And she vanished. Valkyrie took a moment, then left the room. Skullduggery and Mellifluous were waiting for her. Mellifluous held a cog identical to Valkyrie's. Well now, Mellifluous said, that must have been a very detailed secret. Sorry, Valkyrie said. I was having something of an internal debate. They're the best kind, Mellifluous said. They moved through the house, following the trail of cogs. So many of them. There must have been tens of thousands on those walls, maybe hundreds of thousands. They finally came to the end of the trail. No more cogs, just spokes sticking out from the wall. Mellifluous slid the cog that Skullduggery had given her onto the next spoke in line. It locked into the cog beside it with a satisfying click and a sudden sheen swept over its surface, changing the colour ever so slightly. That will do, she said quietly. Come. She led the way back through the rooms, back to the cog with the secret they were looking for. Mellifluous took that cog off the wall and replaced it with Valkyrie's. The cog clicked. There was a second where Valkyrie thought nothing was going to happen, but then the sheen spread across it. Is that... is that it? she asked. That's it, said Mellifluous. Come this way. They followed her. And what happens if someone finds out one of these secrets? Valkyrie asked. You mean out there, in the world? Mellifluous replied. If that happens, then the secret isn't a secret, and the cog containing it will turn dull and I'll have to find a new secret to replace the one I lost. She shrugged. I don't take it personally. These secrets, they don't belong to me. They came to another door. The room within was small, no cogs on the walls. At its centre sat a contraption. That's the word that sprang into Valkyrie's head. Not a machine, not a device. A contraption. It had pulleys and levers and a gramophone horn, and it was built round a network of dull cogs. Mellifluous slid the secret onto the spoke, spent a few moments rearranging the other cogs round it so that they'd fit, and then stepped away. Pull this lever, she said, and left the room. When the door was closed, Skullduggery reached out his hand. I want to do it, Valkyrie said. I can understand that, he said, moving back. The desire to be the instigator on every step of what is a very personal mission. Yes, Valkyrie said. Also, I want to pull the lever of the whirry thing. She pulled. It gave a deep, satisfying clunk. The gears started moving. It did indeed whir. A hiss emerged from the gramophone horn and then a voice. I, I have a secret, the voice said. It, it's, I shouldn't, I can't, I. Another hesitation. There was a sob. Greymire Asylum, the voice said. It's on, on Inishtrothul. It's hidden there. It's... Oh, God. Oh, God, forgive me. The recording ended, and the cog turned dull. Valkyrie looked at Skullduggery. Inish a what? Inish thraw tool, 
he said. Or you may know it by its anglicized name of Innistrahull. Yeah, said Valkyrie. Never heard of it. It's an island about ten kilometers off the Donegal coast, uninhabited since 1929 or thereabouts. That must be where they built the asylum. Maybe underground. When can we go? Can we go now? You need sleep, he said. We'll go in the morning. Valkyrie wanted to insist, but she was too exhausted to argue. Mellifluous was waiting for them in the living room. Do you have what you need? she asked. We do, Skullduggery said. Thank you. Whatever I can do to further the cause of whatever your cause is, I am willing to do in exchange for more secrets. Tell your friends. She walked them out and stood in the doorway as they went to the Bentley. Valkyrie turned before she got in. What's it all for? she asked. What are all those cogs going to do when they start turning? What's the point of it all? Mellifluous smiled. Oh, Valkyrie, she said. Haven't you guessed? That's a secret too. Chapter 28 It was two in the morning, and the peaks of Coldheart Prison skimmed the clouds, leaving a swirling trail as it continued on its new course. Every week it was set upon a different loop of varying distances and at varying heights and speed. Razia enjoyed watching the birds, up here where nothing could touch them, as they passed through the cloaking shield and an entire island prison suddenly appeared before them. Most of those birds panicked, and after a great deal of flapping, veered sharply away. Some of them, if they were approaching from a particularly unfortunate angle, just didn't have time and flew straight into the side of the buildings. The rocky area behind the beast, the tallest and most imposing of the prison's structures, was littered with broken, feathered bodies. Razia liked to climb along those rocks. It was risky. One unexpected gust of wind would pluck her off her feet and then she'd be falling forever. But worth it for the fresh snacks her pets could enjoy. More than once she'd had to cling to those rocks as whoever was up in the control room had to jolt the invisible prison out of the path of an approaching passenger jet. Those jets could get so incredibly close and Razia would laugh and holler as the engines roared by and wave at the people with their heads resting against those little windows, even though they couldn't see her. They always looked so warm. Sitting on the rocks of Coldheart, Razia was anything but warm, but it was worth it to see Hansel and Gretel so happy. They snapped at the bird carcasses, swallowing chunks of meat and feathers before retracting into her palms like well-fed, psychopathic snakes. She clambered back the way she'd come and hopped over the wall. A convict in one of the watchtowers shouted something down to her that was lost in the wind. It was probably something disrespectful. No matter how many of them she killed, there was always one more willing to say stupid things. She thought about going up there and killing him now, but Abyssinia wanted her to come along when they visited the White House. Razia glanced at her watch. She didn't really have time to kill the convict. Abyssinia liked people to be punctual. Razia made a note of which watchtower it was and then hurried through the heavy doors. The convicts inside were mostly asleep, although a few were wandering around, talking among themselves. They were all pretty excited about the plan. In one week's time, they'd get to wallow in violence and blood and death, and they were very much looking forward to it. She got to the control room. Abyssinia and Nero were already there. Sorry I'm light, Razia said. I was feeding the little ones. You're forgiven, said Abyssinia. Nero's just been... Nero. What's the phrase? Doing a recce, Nero told her. Abyssinia nodded. Nero's just been doing a recce. It's nine o'clock in the evening back in Washington, and President Flannery is still in the Oval Office. Razia grinned. Alone? Indeed. Nero, if you wouldn't mind. Nero nodded, and within an eye blink they were standing in front of Martin Flannery's desk, 
and the president was lurching backwards off his chair. Razia giggled. You can't be here, Flannery said, straightening up. You can't just beam down without telling me. Calm down, Martin, Abyssinia said. Tell your receptionist not to disturb you for the next few minutes. What if someone had been in here with me? Flannery raged. What if the press had been here? I sign a lot of bills at that desk, and there are photographers. Tell your receptionist, Razia said right into his ear. Flannery flinched and fumbled for the right button to push. No one is to interrupt me, he commanded, and then made a show of fixing his tie. What do you want? Razia didn't know how Abyssinia stood the man. If it was her, she'd have pulled out whatever was there in place of his spine months ago. You haven't been keeping me updated, Martin, Abyssinia said, taking a seat and crossing her legs. We agreed that you would. We agreed that it was important. I can take care of my part of the plan, Flannery said, his upper lip curling. Razia resisted the urge to rip that lip away from his face. She'd done that once, to a really annoying bloke from Japan, but admittedly she'd needed a knife to remove it completely. Today, she was willing to see if she could do it barehanded. Abyssinia smiled. I'm concerned about you, Martin. I have my friends to confide in and advise me and talk to, but you, you don't have anyone now that your little assistant is gone. Did you ever find out what happened to Mr. Wilkes? Flannery shrugged. He left. People leave their jobs all the time. The pressure got too much for him. He wasn't up to it. And I don't need anyone to advise me. I have the best advisor right here in my brain. He tapped his head for emphasis. Razia wanted to snap that finger back on itself. I'm just worried about you said Abyssinia. Razia had been thinking a lot of very violent thoughts lately. You should worry about yourself, Flannery shot back. Was this normal? I'm a perfectionist, Abyssinia said. I'm sure you know all about that, Martin. So I worry. As long as everything is in place, the plan will go smoothly. But if even one element is misaligned... For Razia, of course... Normal was relative. Normal changed with each mood. She was a violent person. It stood to reason she'd think violent thoughts. But was there something more? I told you, everyone on my side is ready, Flannery said. They're moving out on Thursday. They'll be in position when we need them. She'd been feeling odd lately. Unmoored. The certainty that had been hers a year ago had abandoned her. Nero was the only one left of her squad. Lethe had been deprogrammed. Smoke had been incinerated. Cadaverous was dead. Destrier was too busy working on his little projects. Now it was only Razia and Nero. And Nero was no longer the amusingly arrogant pup he'd once been. It seemed like his magic, wild and unwieldy, was starting to infect his mind. But such was the curse of the Neoteric. Abyssinia looked around. I do so like this room, she said. Great presidents have stood here, made great decisions. Flannery puffed himself up. Some terrible decisions too, of course, and some terrible presidents. Flannery bristled. My approval ratings are up, he said. Abyssinia smiled. Are they? Everywhere that matters. The country can see that what I'm doing is working. They're not believing the lies they're being told by the liberal media. No one understands the working men and women of this country like I do. No one understands. Will you shut up? Nero shouted. Will you please just shut up? Flannery's face went bright red. All but his lips, which were pursed together in a tight, pale line. What Razia wouldn't give to smash that face in. And there were those violent urges again. The tendency to break things and people that had been with her for her entire adult life was now becoming something she had to actively quash. No matter how much she wanted to, 
She knew she couldn't just wander around killing idiots because they annoyed her. Struth. Leaving a trail of corpses in her wake was not how she had been raised. She was better than that. And yet... No. Indiscriminate killing was what got people thrown in prison for the rest of their lives. She couldn't handle that. Stuck in a cell, cut off from her magic, cut off from the world. And of course, they'd take her pets. She wouldn't be allowed to keep them. In all this craziness, in all this uncertainty, Hansel and Gretel were the only things keeping her relatively sane. Even now, she could feel them in her arms, moving slightly between the muscle and the flesh and the veins. Her palms itched where they emerged. They wanted to come out, to burrow through Flannery's head like an arrow, or, at the very least, to bite that nose off his face. She smiled. They were adorable. She realised Nero was still hurling abuse at the President. For all his wicked ways, Nero was a liberal at heart and he'd been storing up this anti-Flannery rhetoric since Abyssinia had first told them the full extent of her plan. Abyssinia, for her part, wore a quiet smile as Nero went on and on about how stupid Flannery was, how ignorant, how buffoonish. Nero, Abyssinia said at last, that's enough. Nero went quiet. Flannery quivered with rage. Razia doubted he'd actually say anything, though. She'd seen his type before, and figured he was incapable of standing up to anyone who stood up to him. She was right. I have to take a meeting, Flannery said, his voice shaking. Abyssinia stood. Of course, she said. You're a busy man, Martin. You've got a country to run. Flannery nodded. But I will need to do a quick scan of your mind she continued, just to make sure the sanctuaries haven't got to you. I've told you how sneaky they can be. Their psychics could be influencing you even now, and you wouldn't know. Right, said Flannery. Okay. Abyssinia held out her hand and smiled. Would you mind? Flannery hesitated, then came forward. You're such a tall man, Mr. President, Abyssinia said, lowering her hand. Could I ask you to... Another hesitation. Then Flannery got to his knees, and Abyssinia placed her hand on his head. Perfect, she said. Razia hid the smirk that wanted to spread across her face. Abyssinia took her hand off Flannery's head. Everything seems to be in order, and I know I've said this before, but what a wonderful mind you have, Mr. President. One of the greatest, I would imagine. Flannery nodded up at her. And can we agree that you'll be keeping me up to date on any and all developments? She asked. We are at a crucial stage of the plan, and I really need to know that you're doing everything I need you to be doing. Flannery nodded again and started to stand. Oh, don't get up on our account, Martin, said Abyssinia. We'll see you soon. And then they were out of the Oval Office and back in the Cold Heart Control Room. That man's mind is impressively twisted, Abyssinia said, wiping the hand she'd touched him with. Thoroughly uninspired, but impressively twisted. Abyssinia, I'm sorry, said Nero. I didn't mean to have a go at him like that. Perfectly understandable, she responded, giving him a smile. Martin Flannery represents every bad thing about mortals. Their greed, their corruption, their destructive pathology. He's why we're doing what we're doing. Personally, I can't wait until I set off the bomb and we watch the life get sucked out of his body live on air. In the bodies of every living thing in a three kilometer radius, said Razia. Abyssinia nodded. That's definitely going to be the highlight of my day. Chapter 29 Emerging from a troubled sleep, Valkyrie sat up in bed slowly, her hair over her face and her eyes half shut. She could hear the dog on the other side of her locked bedroom door, snuffling at the ground. She checked the time. 
She had another hour before Skullduggery got here. The sun wasn't even up. She pulled on a pair of tracksuit bottoms and a warm hoodie, tied her hair back into a ponytail, and went downstairs, Zena leading the way. She did a few stretches in the hall and went for a run. When she was done, she fed the dog, showered and dressed, and had breakfast. She let Zena out of the house and free to roam, and Skullduggery pulled up a few minutes later. She put on a warm coat and got in the Bentley and immediately turned on the heater. This car is freezing, she said. Good morning to you, too, Skullduggery responded. It took a little over three hours of driving fast to get to Malinhead in Donegal. They parked by the coast. It was raining. It was windy. Valkyrie wrapped a scarf round her neck, yanked a woolen hat down past her ears, and pulled on a pair of thick gloves. They left the warmth of the car and looked out to sea. Do you know where Inishtrahul is? she asked. I do. Would you like to follow me, or... Flying burns through my clothes, she said. I'll take a lift with you, if you don't mind. Not at all. She made sure there was no one to see them, then wrapped her arms round him. They lifted off the ground, drifted over the grass, drifted over the rocks, and once they were over the water, they started to pick up speed. God, it was cold up there. The wind grew stronger, and instead of fighting it, Skullduggery let it twirl them as they caught a ride on the air currents. They flew beside seagulls, then dipped low over the heads of the grey seals looking up at them from the churning water. Inishtrahul was small and rocky. It had a lighthouse, painted white, and a handful of stone houses, many of them missing their roofs. They touched down, and Valkyrie jammed her hands in her coat pockets and stomped her feet to get some feeling back. OK, she said. We're looking for the entrance to an underground psychiatric institution, right? So, there'll be a door. There'll be a door, Skullduggery responded. Or a cave, or a hole in the ground. Valkyrie looked around. This place is small, but it's not that small. This is going to take us days. Not necessarily, Skullduggery said, holding up his hand and splaying his fingers. The air is behaving curiously. It's moving around something large. Valkyrie turned, looked over at the empty expanse of grass and rock. She knew what that meant. The asylum wasn't underground at all. It was invisible, cloaked by the same magic that protected Roarhaven from prying mortal eyes. Well then, let's go, she said. They started walking, guided by the disturbances in the air until finally Skullduggery told her to stop. She looked down. Her right elbow was missing. She took her hand from her pocket and moved it away from her body, and it too disappeared. She was standing on the edge of a cloaking bubble. Look at me, she said, finding clues wherever I... Huge hands emerged from nothing, grabbing her, and a hollow man lunged into sight, forcing her backwards. More hollow men came through, surrounding her, pulling at her, their rough, leathery fingers scratching at her face, getting tangled in her hair, seizing her head, trying to twist it off. She glimpsed Skullduggery, fire in his hands, getting swarmed by the lumbering paper men. Get off! she yelled, her magic darting from her fingertips, and a half dozen of them burst apart where they stood. She was instantly rewarded by green gas blasting into her face. Gagging, coughing, blinded and trying not to throw up, Valkyrie reeled, reaching out, bursting every hollow man she came into contact with. She dropped to her knees, tears streaming, and heavy feet tried to stomp on her. She curled up, focused on the feeling in her chest, letting it expand, letting it flow through and out of her body. She could feel it around her, forming a bubble. She heard hollow men burst as they came close. She heard the hiss of their gas escaping. The hissing died down. The bursting stopped. Time to stand up now, Skullduggery said. I hate that gas, she said, letting him pull her to her feet. She blinked rapidly until her sight returned. Her hat was gone and so was her scarf, 
and she'd burned through her gloves. She'd liked those gloves. They passed through the cloaking sphere, and Greymire Asylum loomed darkly before them. Tall and narrow, it was a building that seemed to consist mostly of spires and spikes and towers, with small barred windows set unevenly into its thick stone walls. It was as if a dozen different architects had all tried to build a section at the same time, and none of them had bothered to check if any of it fitted. The place unsettled Valkyrie. It made her queasy. They walked up the winding path. The doors opened when they approached, groaning on their hinges like a bad horror movie. Noise drifted out. Voices, talking, shouting and screaming, were layered over each other, becoming denser the closer they got. The reception area of Greymire Asylum was vast, edged on both sides by steel stairs that curled upwards into the ceiling. The floor was fitted entirely with white tiles, apart from the strange black pattern that they had to walk over to get to the desk, set behind a cage. There was no one sitting there. By the looks of it, the reception area was not a well-travelled part of the asylum. The doors closed behind them, slowly, with much groaning. Footsteps on those steel steps. They walked over to the stairs on their left as a man in robes came down. He wore a mask, black cloth, eye holes, and two small holes for the nostrils and a hole at the mouth, big enough to fit a straw. His watery eyes peered out at them. Visitors, he said. He sounded surprised. Hello, said Skullduggery. I'm Detective Pleasant. This is Detective Kane. We're from the Arbiter Corps. We'd like to speak to whoever's in charge. The man made a small noise behind his mask and nodded. My name is Brother Boo, he said. I suppose I am the one in charge. Please come this way. They followed him up the stairs. It was slow going. He was a small man with short legs. He didn't move very far, very fast. At the top of the stairs, they came to a corridor that led to another corridor and then to another. The paint on the walls was faded. The walls themselves were damp. There were sections of the floors and ceilings that were just metal grills. Beneath them and above them, People cried and begged and threatened. Brother Boo took them to his office. It was small and smelled of sour sweat. There was a window behind his desk that looked out onto storm clouds. He sat. They sat. Oh, he said, like he just remembered he was wearing a mask. He took it off. His face was round and pale and his hair was decidedly sparse. Well, now he said. This is interesting. As you can imagine, we don't have many visitors to the island. We certainly don't have many skeletons stopping by. It's one thing to hear tales of you, Detective Pleasant, but quite another to see you in the flesh, so to speak. I hope I don't disappoint, Skullduggery said, as if they were old friends. Can I ask, Brother Boo, to what order you belong? Of course, of course, Brother Boo replied. I am one of the surviving members of the Order of the Void. There used to be more of us, but I'm afraid time is a whittler. We have our faith, and we have our duties, chief among them at present being the asylum itself. May I ask you a question now? How did you find us? It's no small feat what you have managed. I confess, Skullduggery said. I read of your location in one of the diaries of Eakin Meritorius. Brother Boo frowned. Were the diaries not lost some years ago? News is slow to reach us out here on the island, but I seem to remember reports of the sanctuary being destroyed. Skullduggery nodded. The old sanctuary is gone, as are the diaries, but I read this some time before we lost them. Ah, said Brother Boo. That explains it. And for what purpose have you travelled here? We're searching for a cure, said Valkyrie. An associate of ours has been left badly traumatised by years of torture, and we're here looking for a way to soothe his mind. 
We heard that we might be able to find such a cure here, something called K-49. I see, said Brother Boo. Do you know what that is? I'm afraid you have been misled, said Brother Boo. We do not so much cure the afflicted here as contain them. We have our doctors, and they work extremely hard, but many of our patients are far too dangerous to risk treatment. Their insanity is the most wicked, the most insidious. They can never be released, because they can never be cured. How many patients do you have? asked Valkyrie. We have 108 in total. And what do they do all day if you're not treating them? What do they do? I'm... I'm afraid I don't understand. They do nothing. They stay in their cells. All day? All day, every day? Yes. We could never let them out, Detective Kane. These are dangerous people. And you don't even try to help them? Brother Boo smiled patiently. We're helping everyone else by keeping them safely within these walls. That's... That's barbaric. No, no. It's the patients who are the barbarians. They have committed crimes so unspeakable, no jail or prison in the world would take them. Greymire Asylum is their home. They're ill, Valkyrie said. They need help. They need chains, Miss Kane. If I may interrupt, Skullduggery said. Brother Boo, this K-49 that our associate is seeking, what is it? I'm afraid I am not required to help you, Brother Boo answered. Grey Mire Asylum falls outside of any sanctuary's jurisdiction. We don't work for the sanctuaries, said Valkyrie. No, but you work within their system of governance and control. Greymire as an institution is separate from all that. The sanctuaries have never wanted to take responsibility for the patients we house and are only too happy to let us continue to work without interference. Well, Valkyrie said, we're interfering now. Brother Boo smiled again. Indeed. She clenched her fists to stop her hands from grabbing him. Brother Boo, said Skullduggery. We're on a mission of some importance. Whatever K-49 is, we need it. Greymire Asylum is obviously one of the most remote magical institutions in the world. You've cut yourself off from the rest of us, probably with good reason. But there must be something you need. Something either magical or mortal that we can get for you. Whatever it is. I thank you for your kind offer said Brother Boo. But the order of the void is entirely self-sufficient. Skullduggery tilted his head. Everyone needs something, he said, good humour in his voice. Brother Boo chuckled. <laughs> Those of us in the order have a motto, Detective Pleasant. In the original tongue, it is Ensevarden ne reviar, in a language you would understand. We require nothing. I am sorry, but regrettably, you must leave without the thing you seek. Brother Boo stood, as did Skullduggery. Valkyrie stayed seated. So you're not going to share it with us, she said. It was very nice meeting you both. If it's a potion or whatever, you could just tell us how to make it. We don't have to take any of yours. Brother Bear will show you out. A large man in robes, wearing the cloth mask, appeared behind them. Skullduggery looked at Valkyrie. She sighed heavily. Fine, she said, standing. Obviously we're not going to get what we came here for. Brother Boo smiled. I'm glad you understand. Before I go, though, could I use the convenience? I'm sorry, said Brother Boo. The bathroom, she said. The jacks, the bog, the loo, the toilet. Brother Boo frowned. The lavatory? Yes, said Valkyrie. Could I use the lavatory? Of course, said Brother Boo. Brother Bear, please escort Detective Kane to the lavatory. Brother Bear turned and Valkyrie followed him. She winked to Skullduggery as she passed. She had a plan. Chapter 30
Brother Bear led Valkyrie down another long corridor. The sounds of sobbing dimmed slightly. Thank you very much, Valkyrie said when they came to a door. She pushed it open. The stench made her gag. Holding her hand over her nose and mouth, she entered. There were three wooden stalls set up inside and exactly zero windows to climb out of. This was dismaying. Her entire plan consisted of sneaking out of a window. So far, it wasn't going well. Brother Bear came in behind her. She looked at him. Right, she said. She chose the middle stall and went in. There was a plank of wood with a hole cut into it. Valkyrie stared in horror. The plank did seem to be clean, though. She turned. Brother Bear looked at her, his hands clasped before him. She closed the door, securing it with a simple latch, and stood there. Well, this was a brilliant waste of time. She looked at the plank and sighed. Now that she was here, she realised that she did actually have to go. She undid her jeans and sat. The door didn't go all the way to the ground, and the stall was barely taller than she was. Hello? she called. Brother Bear didn't respond. She continued. Could you make some noise? I'm just very aware that you can hear everything and... Could you hum or something? Is there a sink out there? Maybe if you turn the tap on, I'd be able to go. He didn't answer. He didn't move. No tap was turned on. Glowering, Valkyrie took out her phone, selected the first song that came up, Time is Running Out by Muse, and played it really, really loudly. She closed her eyes and sang along. When she was done, she left the stall. Thank you for your help, she said to Brother Bear. Oh, look, there is a sink. She washed her hands, dried them on her coat, and left the room. Skullduggery and Brother Boo were waiting outside. Skullduggery tilted his head at her. She rolled her eyes in response. Brother Boo swept his hand towards a corridor. The exit is this way. Valkyrie trudged after them, down one long corridor after another. This place have a gift shop? she asked. I'm afraid I don't understand, said Brother Boo. Of course he didn't. His office was just ahead. They were almost out. But she couldn't just leave. She needed K-49, whatever the hell it was. They passed a corridor on their right. Oh, what's down here? Valkyrie said as she strode through. Excuse me, Brother Boo said from behind her. The exit is this way. Excuse me. Brother Bear was thundering after her. She turned a corner and sprinted to the next and turned, and energy crackled as she shot off her feet, blasting straight up, and then she cut off her magic suddenly, letting her momentum carry her to the grilled ceiling. She managed to get her fingers through the grill and curled them, gritting her teeth against the pane as she hung there. Brother Bear came running. He passed underneath, then Brother Boo scuttling after him. Skullduggery followed. Where is she? asked Brother Boo, a little panic edging through his smug demeanour. Where did she go? Oh, that girl, Skullduggery said. She'd get lost in her own house. She really would. Brother Boo whirled to him. Where is she? I have no idea, Skullduggery said. She does tend to wander off. But don't worry. She will turn up eventually. Her fingers were on fire. Her arms were on fire. Someone walked by above and almost trod on her. You, Brother Boo said to Brother Bear, go that way. If you find her, drag her out of here, do you understand? Detective Pleasant, you will stay with me and we'll go this way. Excellent plan, Skullduggery said. She won't go too far. The moment she gets hungry, she'll come running back. You mark my words. Valkyrie waited until they had gone. Then she let herself drop. Using her magic to control her descent, she landed quietly and shook out her hands, wincing at the pain. She hadn't sneaked through any windows, but this was the next best thing. She went exploring. Chapter 31 After ten minutes of exploring, 
she'd come to the conclusion that exploring was stupid and she hated it, and that this level of the asylum held nothing of interest for her. The only way to the level above, she reckoned, was probably through a heavy wooden door with an army of gargoyles etched into it. A heavy wooden door that wouldn't open for her. It didn't even have a lock that she could pick. Stupid door. The handle rattled and Valkyrie jumped behind a weird old statue of a weird old man. The door opened and a brother emerged, holding a narrow metal rod. On the other end of that metal rod was a collar, secured round the neck of a shuffling patient. He had someone on an actual leash. The brother led the patient onwards, and the door opened again, and a woman came through, dressed in drab grey scrubs and reading through notes. Valkyrie sneaked out from behind the statue, got a hand to the door before it closed. She checked to make sure no one was coming, then sneaked in, found some stairs leading up, and crept onwards. She watched from behind cover as brothers transferred patients from room to room. Not all of the patients were on leashes, but some of them struggled so much they required two brothers to escort them. Valkyrie found more stairs. She was almost to the top when another man in grey scrubs appeared. He frowned when he saw her there, frozen as she was on the steps. Valkyrie put on a smile and continued up. Hello there, she said. You are... Dr. Derleth, he said hesitantly as she reached him and shook his hand. Ah, Dr. Derleth, there you are. I got myself a little lost, if I'm being honest with you. I'm sure I'm not where I'm supposed to be, and I'm probably where I'm not meant to be. She laughed, started to walk, pulling him alongside her before she released his hand. Now then, she continued, hopefully you can help me. Brother Boo told me I could pick up some K-49. He wasn't overly thrilled about the prospect, said something about that's not how we do things in Greymire, but I persuaded him that I couldn't leave without it, and what can I tell you? I can be very persuasive when I want to be. She laughed again. Derleth smiled politely. Um, of course. And how much do you require? Just enough for one. One patient, the doctor murmured. A single vial of K-49 should suffice, I presume. Hey, Valkyrie said, you're the expert, am I right? I barely know what I'm doing, but don't tell anyone else that. <laughs> she laughed. If a single vial will be enough for one person, then yes, a single vial will definitely suit my needs. Well then, Derleth said, our store is this way. He took the lead and she walked alongside. What, um, what do you do exactly? Me? I do a little bit of everything, quite frankly. But if I'm being honest with you, I'd say my true talent lies in administration. Is that so? Yes, it is, Valkyrie said. I can administrate pretty much anything. Show me a spreadsheet and watch me go, as my mother used to say. As long as I don't have to do it here. I don't want to insult you or anything, but all that screaming. She made a face and he chuckled. I understand, he said. It can get to you at first. After a few months, however, I have to say you barely notice it. And if you leave, for whatever reason, it sounds demented, but you miss it when it's gone. He chuckled, and she chuckled, and they both chuckled. One thing I was wondering, though, Valkyrie said, because she couldn't help herself, is uh, what is the point of having an asylum if its aim isn't to help people? Derleth made a sound, halfway between a laugh and a grunt. Ha, ah, yes. You've heard Brother Boo's edict of contain, not cure. That isn't strictly true, of course. The Order of the Void, well, they are who they are. But we doctors do try to help those we feel could benefit from our attention. But they are few and decidedly far between. Mostly, as Brother Boo likes to say, we contain. They turned down another corridor. This place was just one damn corridor after another. How many are you trying to help? Valkyrie asked. The doctor looked pained. At this moment, 
Unfortunately, there are no inmates interesting enough. Valkyrie was struggling to find excuses to pretend to laugh. So why are there even doctors here if you're not out to help anyone? Oh, because who could turn down such an opportunity to conduct this level of research? To what end? For the advancement of psychology, psychiatry, for magic itself. What does magic have to do with madness? More stairs. Up they went. Well, our power is constrained by our minds, is it not? Derleth said. The limits we impose on ourselves are far more effective than anything imposed from without. This is where we explore possibilities. There are rooms, there are entire floors that are designed to open up a patient's very psyche, to give form to whim and to fancy, and through these forms decode the essence of what makes us who we are. It was quieter up here, almost still. I'm not sure I understand, Valkyrie said. No, Derleth replied, peering at her. But you seem like such a bright girl. Valkyrie didn't like the way he said that. I mean, I think I understand, she clarified, but I'm probably wrong, because it sounds like you're saying there are rooms you can walk into in this place where your thoughts become real. Yes, said the doctor. That is exactly what I am saying. But these people seem disturbed and fragile. Wouldn't that do them more harm than good? Derleth smiled again. We have limited interest in doing them good, my dear. And is this legal? What you're doing here? Because, to be honest with you, it sounds a lot like you're torturing these people. Is that what it sounds like? Derleth said, frowning. That is interesting. As for whether our work is legal, I'm afraid such questions don't enter into this conversation. The asylum is beyond the laws of any nation or sanctuary. They stopped at a blue door. You'll find what you're looking for through here, said the doctor. You're not coming with me? Valkyrie asked. I'm afraid not, he said, smiling. We have a new patient with us today. It's time I began the examination. She didn't like his smile. It was a smile just for her, and she didn't trust it. They shook hands, and Derleth walked away, and Valkyrie hesitated a moment before opening the door and walking through. She stepped into a large room, empty white walls, white floor, white ceiling, with another blue door opposite. The air smelled funny in here. She crossed the room and went through. Another white room, a little smaller this time. Another blue door, that same smell. She walked through. White room, blue door. She walked through. The rooms got smaller and smaller the further she went. Valkyrie tried turning back, but they were locking behind her, so she kept going. She could always blast her way out, if it came to that, if this was all some kind of trap. It wasn't normal, that was for sure. Door after door, room after room with nothing in them. Not normal. Not right. The closer the white walls drew, the more her shoulders brushed against them, the tighter the knot in her chest became. She stopped for a minute, closed her eyes, and pictured herself on the beach back in Haggard, the beach and the sand and the sea and all that sky, all the lovely empty space. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly and passed into the next room. She ignored how narrow it was, no bigger than a broom closet. But there was a way out. There was always a way out. That calmed her. On she went. Two more blue doors. They weren't even opening fully now, just enough to squeeze through. She pushed open the next one. She turned sideways. Her left leg went first, and she shifted her hips after it, got jammed a little, but managed. She sucked in a breath, scraped her rib cage between the door and the frame. She brought her hands up to flatten herself as much as she could. For a moment, she was stuck, and panic flashed. 
but it was just her coat bunching up. Once she'd yanked it down, she could turn her head, and then she was through, jammed into the corner of this tiny space. She manoeuvred herself round as she struggled to close the door. It shut and locked, and she reached for the next one. And it didn't open. She tried again. Didn't even budge. Her throat went tight. She knocked. This had to be the last door. It had to be. If the room beyond it was any smaller than the one she was in, then the door wouldn't even open. It had to be the last door, and as such there was probably someone on the other side who was coming forward to turn that handle even now. She knocked again. Hello? She called. It wasn't a call, though. It was a cry. It was panic, edged with hysteria. Could you open up, please? Hello? Open the door, please. Please open the door. The door didn't open. Valkyrie's skin prickled. She was suddenly so very warm. She pulled her coat off her shoulders, banging her elbows as she did so. It got stuck, trapping her arms behind her. Sweating now. Whimpering slightly, she twisted and tore one hand free, then the other, and threw the coat on the ground. It was going to be fine. It was going to be fine. She gripped the door handle and let her magic flow into it. It didn't explode like she'd hoped. It didn't even spark. It certainly didn't open. She slid away from it a little and let the lightning fly. The door absorbed it. No damage. Nothing. Open the door! She screamed. Open this goddamn door! She slammed her forearm into it, kicked it, beat her fists against it, screamed again, screamed for skullduggery. All the while, this little voice in her head telling her to stay calm, to not panic. This isn't permanent. There's a way out. There has to be. There always is. Door in front won't open. Door behind won't open. Valkyrie looked up. The ceiling, twice the height of her. Could she punch through it? Fly through it? Raised her T-shirt to wipe her face, then focused. Magic crackled. She jumped. Landed. Didn't fly. Covered face with hands. Breathing shallow. Quick. Magic wouldn't work if she panicked. Always the way. She couldn't panic. Mustn't panic. Make herself be calm. Forced it. Magic crackled and burst out of her. It hit the door in front and the door behind and hit the floor and ceiling and it crackled and did nothing. And it hit the walls and did nothing. She pulled it in, cut it off, closed her eyes, lips pressed together, making rhythmic murmurs that hummed against her teeth while she tapped her forehead against the door. Tap, 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 tap. Fists clenched, tapping, tap, tap. Hurting now, too fast, too hard, stopped herself, blinking, eyes stinging with sweat. In all this white, a piece of dark. It caught her eye, the wall to her right. It was singed, just slightly. Hope surged, magic surged. Tendrils of energy hit the wall and burned, broke through to the darkness on the other side. Turning as much as she could, she kicked, stomped, bashed the opening bigger. Fresh air. She felt fresh air. She put a leg through, ducked, slid sideways into the dark. Cooler here. Still tight. Still too tight, but cooler. Her eyes adjusted. The darkness got lighter up ahead. Black turned to grey. Started moving sideways. Walls got closer. Squeezing now, her breath held. The walls dragged at her clothes. Just a bit more. Little bit more. Hips stuck. Chest stuck. Head stuck. Whimpering. Trying. Reaching for the grey. The grey went out. Fresh air stopped. Trap. It was a trap. It was a trap and now she was stuck. Tried moving back. Like the way she'd come. No use. Couldn't even turn her head. The walls. The walls were wooden. She could feel that now. A moment ago they'd been smooth. Now they were rough and wooden. 
She did all she could to wonder about that, to occupy her mind with that. Wooden. Her hands, fluttering like moths, felt the wood, felt the splinters, felt the sharp tips of nails. Valkyrie heard something behind her, in the dark, twisted her neck as much as she could, jammed her skull between the wooden boards in front and behind. Help me, she whispered. She reached out and hit a wall, a wall to the left of her, a wall of that same rough wood that hadn't been there a moment ago. With her other hand, she reached into the blackness and touched that same rough wood to the right of her. Help me, she said again. It sounded different, her voice. Closer. She stopped trying to turn her head. She couldn't see anything anyway. There was nothing to see. Only darkness. Valkyrie could hear her own breathing now. It was loud. She was in a box. Chapter 32 Suddenly there was light streaming through the cracks in the wood, and the box tilted, and she cried out as it fell backwards. It hit the floor, painfully. Let me out! she shouted. Let me out! Figures moved, the shadows dancing. People meant enemies. She was used to enemies. She could deal with enemies. Magic flared, filled the box with sizzling, spitting energy, but didn't do any good. Didn't break through. We're going to try to help you, said a voice. The doctor. Let me out! Valkyrie ordered from inside the box, keeping her voice as steady as she could. No, said Dr. Derleth from outside the box. That's not how we'll help you. But while your body may be trapped, the air you're breathing will allow your mind to loosen in all the ways we need it to. You're an interesting case, Detective Kane. Yes, yes, I know who you are. You've tasted godhood, and yet you choose to wallow in human guilt. We'd like to examine that. I don't want to be examined. I'm sure you don't. More figures moved. The box was lifted off the ground, carried. This is pointless, Valkyrie said. You think Skullduggery Pleasant is going to let this happen? You think he isn't demanding to know where I am right this second? I don't care about the skeleton, said Derleth. You should, said Valkyrie. I care about you, Detective Kane. I care about getting to the bottom of you, of what makes you who you are. Aren't you interested in that? I know who I am. Derleth laughed. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid you don't, dear girl. None of us do. Not until we've passed through the crucible. Not until we've succumbed to our greatest fears. They were going down now, down some stairs. The light changed from the steady wash of a bulb to the flickering of flames. Listen to me, Valkyrie said. Listen very carefully. This is important. This is very important and you should listen because this is your last chance. Let me out. Put the box down and let me out and I won't hurt you. This is your last chance. They reached the bottom of the stairs. The footsteps became muted. They were walking on earth. Derleth said something that Valkyrie didn't hear. What? Valkyrie said. I said it isn't a box, Derleth told her. Well, whatever it is, Valkyrie said as they came to a stop. It's a coffin, said Derleth, and the figures lowered Valkyrie into a deep and dark hole. Valkyrie screamed. They were filling in the hole, covering it with dirt. Valkyrie screamed. She lay in the dark. Some of the dirt had slipped through the cracks in the coffin, fallen onto her cheek, her chin, her neck. She didn't turn her head, didn't shake it off. She felt the dirt on her skin until she couldn't feel it any more. It became a part of her, or she became a part of it. Her body was still and cold and heavy, like a corpse. Like a corpse, she lay there with her eyes open, staring at a blackness so black she couldn't tell the difference when she blinked. 
like a corpse. She'd be here forever, lying in a coffin in the dirt. This was where death would catch up to her. She'd slipped away once, but not again. Death didn't forget. She screamed again. It came on like a passing train, and she screamed and kicked and banged and cried and begged. And then the train moved on, and her stillness returned. Time didn't pass. It didn't stay still, either. In the box, time didn't exist. Only Valkyrie existed, a ghost inhabiting the house of bone and meat that she'd been born into. She was her own haunted house. The thought might have made her smile if her mouth still moved. She wasn't panicking anymore. The panic had left her. Meat didn't panic. Meat was meat. Panic was for the living. She remembered living, but only dimly. She remembered her life, but only faintly. All those struggles, all that fighting and running, all that talking and thinking. She knocked on China's door, walked up a hill with skullduggery, ran across a field with a man chasing her, fell to her knees with her guts torn out, slipped in the snow, crawled away from a hollow man, laughed with her parents, sang to her sister, died. The air. They'd done something to the air. Derleth had said so. They wanted to loosen her mind. What did that mean? She felt her mind squirming. Is that what Derleth had meant? Is this what they wanted? It squirmed and squirmed and wriggled in her skull. The folds of her brain turned in on themselves. She couldn't see anything in the darkness, so instead she saw her brain, glistening and wet and moving like many snakes. She pulled back and saw herself. The darkness wasn't a problem anymore. She could see everything. Her face was placid. Her eyes were closed. She opened them and looked at herself, watching herself. Then she closed them again. She looked so dead. So very dead. In the dark. In the dark. Her mind went away in the dark. Something scratched against the wood beneath her. Rats. Something worse. Scratching and scraping. Soon they'd be inside the coffin with her. Crawling over her, biting, burrowing. The wood broke. She heard it splinter. She felt hands in the dark, arms wrapping round her, and then there was cracking and more splintering, and down she went, out of the coffin, into the cold, the earth rumbling, dirt in her hair, dirt in her ears, and her eyes, and her nose. She didn't mind. She was already dead, already a corpse. The grip tightened, and now they were going sideways, and then upwards. She was pulled along, and she didn't think about it. Her thoughts had left her head. There was a pleasing numbness up there now, like everything had gone soft. So, when the tangled tumbleweeds of guilt and shame and loathing came rolling in, their thorns had nothing to scrape against. Through the darkness they rumbled for what could have been a minute, or what could have been a month, and then they exploded up into light, and Valkyrie sprawled onto something wet. Grass. Her body took in air. She hadn't asked it to. Her own weight rolled her onto her back. Her eyes were open. There was darkness overhead, but it was layered, and it had pinpricks of light. Stars. You're home, Billy Ray Sanguine said pulling her to her feet. He wasn't wearing his sunglasses. That was odd. I brought you home. You'll be safe here. 
They were in the back garden of her parents' house. Go on, said Billy Ray. Her legs didn't move. This didn't surprise her. A corpse's legs rarely moved of their own accord. Billy Ray nudged her. Her body put out a foot to stop itself from tipping over. Hey, Billy Ray said, moving round, holding her shoulders. He frowned at her, looked at her with eyes he didn't have. Is this it? Is it over? Have you given up? She looked at him, because that's where her eyes were pointed. I thought you were formidable, Billy Ray said. Thought you were unbeatable. What happened to that girl? She didn't answer, because corpses didn't answer, generally. Go on now, Billy Ray said. Your family is waiting for you. You will be safe at home. He sank into the ground and left her alone. Home. Her body moved its head away. She didn't want to look at the house she'd grown up in, because she wasn't there. She was still in the coffin. This was all some cruel, sadistic trick. That hadn't even been Billy Ray. Billy Ray was... She frowned. Billy Ray was something. She couldn't remember what. It made no difference. She was trapped in a wooden box, and she was dead. And this was a trick. She wasn't here, and this wasn't her house. And her parents weren't in there, and her sister wasn't in there, and all the love and support and the understanding that she'd grown up with, none of that was in there either. She missed it. She missed it all. It was so tempting to let herself believe this was real, because then she'd be able to feel something again, if only a lie, and if only for a moment. Was that so wrong? She moved a foot. Then she moved the other one. One foot and then the other, slowly and heavily. That was how Valkyrie traversed the few steps to the back door. Steering the corpse like an unresponsive car, she reached out its hand and turned the handle. Her body caught its toes on the step through the door. It stumbled, righted itself, closed the door behind it. The cruel trick continued. She stood in the kitchen she'd grown up in. Beyond the cold shell of flesh, there was warmth. It didn't quite reach her. She was tucked away too deeply for that. But she knew it was there, and that was enough. The kitchen was dark. Red digits glowed at her from the oven. The fridge started to hum. Otherwise, the house was silent. She left the kitchen behind her as she moved into the hall. Photographs on the wall, the vase on the side table, and the dish where her parents kept their keys. Unopened letters, bills, probably. Her body took a breath in through its nose, and Valkyrie smelled the house. It smelled right. It smelled like home. Maybe this was real. She got to the stairs. Up there, her parents would be sleeping. Her sister would be sleeping. Up there was her old bedroom, the room where she could be alone and be herself. Up there, she was alive. Her body put a foot onto the first step, and Valkyrie felt something deep in her body's chest. It took another step, and there it was again. A heartbeat. Gripping the banister with one cold hand, her body took the next step, and the next, and Valkyrie could feel her lungs again, and how empty they were. The higher she climbed, the more she felt. Her head was dizzy, her hands and feet tingled as blood remembered to flow through her veins. Up she went, and each step brought her closer to life, until finally she reached the top and gulped in a mouthful of air. Stumbling drunkenly, she made it to her room without waking her family. She closed the door gently, wincing as it clicked, and switched on the light. Posters on the walls, books scattered, clothes strewn, poking out from beneath the bed. The room she'd had when she'd been a teenager. 
She went to the bed and sat. She was alive. Alive. That was good. That was promising. Did that mean all this was real? Call Skullduggery. She should call Skullduggery, and he'd be able to tell her what was real and what wasn't. Another adventure, then. Another secret she'd have to keep from her parents. She was getting used to it by now. She crossed to the wardrobe, opened it. Her reflection looked back at her. She didn't look like a teenager. She looked older. That didn't make any sense. She touched the glass and stepped back, and the reflection blinked like it was awakening from a dream. Valkyrie smiled at it and stepped forward, and then stepped through the glass. She emerged on the other side, and the other Valkyrie stepped back to allow her through, and Valkyrie shook her head suddenly, because this wasn't how it was supposed to happen. This isn't right, she mumbled. What isn't? said the other Valkyrie. This isn't how it works. Of course it is, the other Valkyrie said. I touch the mirror and you come through. But I'm not the reflection, Valkyrie said. You are. The other Valkyrie peered at her. I think you're broken. No, I'm not. I'm just... I touched the glass. You're meant to. I touched the glass, the other Valkyrie said. I did. You just copied me because you're my reflection. Do you? Do you think you're real? Valkyrie narrowed her eyes. I am real. I should call Skullduggery, the other Valkyrie said, and took a phone from her pocket. Valkyrie didn't know why, but she slapped the phone out of the other Valkyrie's hand. OK, the other Valkyrie said. You're going to have to get back in the mirror while I figured this out. Did you hear me? Get back in there. The thought of going back through the mirror suddenly filled Valkyrie with terror. She couldn't go back there. All the bad feelings were back there. All the coldness and the numbness were back there. She shook her head. You're the reflection, she said. The other Valkyrie picked up her phone, slipped it back in her pocket. You stepped through. Yes, I did, but... But something went wrong. I'm Valkyrie Kane. I'm the real Valkyrie. I was just... I was with Skullduggery in Greymire and... And then I went through doors and I was in a coffin and Billy Ray pulled me out and brought me here, the other Valkyrie said. Yeah, I know. That happened to me, not you. Valkyrie shook her head harder. You're getting confused. Oh, I am way past confused, the other Valkyrie said. I don't know what's real and what isn't. They did something to me. The air, it, it made me, it loosened my mind. Maybe this is something to do with that. It probably has, because this doesn't make any sense. But I do know one thing. You are the one who stepped through the mirror. You're the reflection. I'm sorry, but you're not real. And you're going back into that mirror, even if I have to throw you in myself. The other Valkyrie put a hand on Valkyrie's shoulder. Valkyrie hit her latched onto her, hit her again as she fell back. The other Valkyrie went low, grabbed her around the waist, holding on for a few seconds to recover while Valkyrie tried to get at her. Then the other Valkyrie lifted, ran forward and Valkyrie's back hit the wardrobe door and her elbow went through the mirror. The other Valkyrie got a hand to her face and pushed her head into the glass. It was like being pushed under water. Valkyrie took hold of the other Valkyrie's t-shirt and let herself fall backwards through the mirror, slamming the other Valkyrie's face hard into the glass. While the other Valkyrie went reeling, the real Valkyrie scrambled out of the mirror again. She shut the wardrobe door. The other Valkyrie straightened. Blood ran from her nose. Valkyrie raised her hands, and so did the other one, and lightning crackled and flew between them, and Valkyrie winced because she expected it to hurt like hell but it just tingled. The other Valkyrie snarled. They charged at each other. Valkyrie threw a punch that crunched painfully off a forearm. In return, she got an elbow to the jaw that rocked her skull. The other Valkyrie's hands grasped at her, yanked her over a hip, and Valkyrie's face hit the floor and her arm nearly broke. 
She covered up as the hammers came down, tried to turn, but the other Valkyrie was kneeling on her ribs, keeping her in place. So this was what it felt like. Energy crackled around Valkyrie's body, and she shot out from beneath her, across the floor, crashing into the wall and demolishing the desk. The other Valkyrie stumbled, and Valkyrie got to one knee, magic crackling again, and this time she flew upwards, hitting the other Valkyrie like a cannonball, spinning her into the corner while Valkyrie collided with the wall beside the door. Valkyrie collapsed again, clutching her right shoulder. Something was broken. Jesus, the other Valkyrie said. You broke my ribs. Valkyrie groaned, turned over, got up. The other Valkyrie, her face a mask of pain and blood, came forward and threw a right cross that nearly took Valkyrie's head off. You're not real, the other Valkyrie said. You're my reflection. Do you get that? Do you? Valkyrie lunged at her, tried to grab her, tried to sink her teeth into her neck. But the other Valkyrie caught her with a hook just behind her left ear, and all the bones left Valkyrie's body, and she fell, a useless heap. Her hand closed around the other Valkyrie's ankle. She got a knee in the cheek for her effort, and her head hit the wall, and the room darkened. Chapter 33 Valkyrie stepped back as the reflection slumped into unconsciousness. When she was sure it wasn't going to pop up again, she sat on the footboard of the bed and probed her left side. Her ribs were definitely broken. Every breath she took sent a dozen knives stabbing into her, and the leaves she usually took for pain were in the coat that she dropped back in the last of the white rooms. She heaved herself to a standing position. The reflection was still unconscious, but she crept past it anyway, closing the door behind her. She shuffled to the bathroom. It was a minor miracle she hadn't woken her family with all that crashing around. She waited for her nose to stop bleeding, and then washed the blood from her face. She took out her phone, but before she could dial there was a knock on the door, and Cassandra Faros stepped in. You have to hurry, she said. I'm just going to call Skullduggery, Valkyrie said, but Cassandra was shaking her head as she pulled Valkyrie gently out of the bathroom. No time, she said, no time, you're not safe here. But this is my home. Finbar Rong was waiting on the landing. She can get to you here, he told her. We didn't think she could, but she can. You have to keep going before she gets you. Before who gets me? The nemesis of Greymire. I don't know who that is. They brought her to the top of the stairs. It's her, said Cassandra. The nemesis of Greymire came slowly up the steps. She was thin and dressed in rags. Her head was covered in a cloth mask like the kind they wore in the asylum. She carried a sledgehammer, the long handle balanced on one shoulder. What does she want? Valkyrie asked. To punish you, said Finbar, for all the bad things you've done. They backed away from the stairs, and a baby started to cry in Alice's room. Go on, Cassandra said. Take your sister. Run. We'll try to delay the nemesis. She'll kill us, Finbar said to Cassandra. Cassandra shrugged. It won't be the first time we've died because of Valkyrie. He nodded his agreement, and they stayed where they were while Valkyrie hurried to Alice's bedroom. She went straight to her sister's cot, wrapped her in her blanket, and scooped her up. It's okay, Valkyrie whispered, kissing the baby's forehead. I'll keep you safe. Alice stopped crying. Valkyrie stepped out of the bedroom as the nemesis reached the top of the stairs. Cassandra and Finbar ran at her, and the nemesis swung the hammer, caught them both with the same swing. Their skulls crunched. The nemesis flicked the hammer up and around, and balanced it once again on her shoulder. She stepped over their bodies. Clutching Alice tight to her chest, Valkyrie ran through a corridor she didn't remember existing, and kicked open the door at the end. She caught her foot on a rock and tripped, went stumbling, fell to one knee. The grass was wet and quickly soaked into her jeans. She was in a graveyard. The sky was grey. Clouds blocked out the sun. She turned to close the door. But the door wasn't there anymore. 
there was only the nemesis walking towards her. Valkyrie tried blasting it with everything she could muster, but the lightning just hit the creature's skin and then it was gone. There was nothing burnt, nothing singed, nothing damaged in any way whatsoever. The nemesis of Greymire ate up the lightning and carried on regardless. Valkyrie ran between the graves. It was a large cemetery on a hill. The headstones were in lines, like hundreds of dominoes. Valkyrie slipped on the grass, went sliding down for a bit. She came up in a crouch, Alice still safe in her arms. She didn't recognise the name on the headstone beside her, but she recognised the date. Devastation Day. The day Darkess murdered all those people in Roarhaven. She started running again. Every headstone on either side had the same date carved into the granite. She turned right, ran straight across, took a left, went diagonally. Everyone, everyone in this cemetery died on the same day. This way, someone shouted. They waved at her. Hurry! She checked behind her. The nemesis wasn't moving quickly, but she was closing in all the same. Valkyrie ran towards the waving figure. She almost laughed with relief when she reached him. In trouble again, I see, Ken Speckle Grouse said. And you've managed to drag your little sister into this mess with you. How proud you must feel. Valkyrie's relief washed away. I'm helping her, she said. Oh, is that what you're doing? Her life is in danger. Ken Speckle nodded. It is, yes, you know. I told Skullduggery the same thing all those years ago. I told him involving you was obscenely irresponsible. He didn't have much of a choice. Nonsense. He just didn't want to listen, and neither did you. You had your whole life ahead of you, Valkyrie. You could have been happy. Instead, you chose this. And now you want to subject your sister to the same horrors you experienced. I'm saving her. Valkyrie said, anger rising. You can't save anyone, Ken Speckle responded. You couldn't save me, could you? Alice started to cry again. Valkyrie patted her, swaying, and kissed her forehead. I'm going to save her, she said. There was movement out of the corner of her eye, and Valkyrie threw herself down, protecting Alice as she rolled. The nemesis of Greymire's hammer swung lazily into Ken Speckle's chest, lifting him and flinging him over the headstones. Valkyrie slipped, and hands grabbed her, pulled her up. Come on, said Anton Shudder, and led her away from the nemesis. I don't understand any of this, Valkyrie said as they ran. The nemesis is here to punish you, Shudder told her, not looking back. For what? For everything. Why is she after Alice? She's not. She's chasing her. She's chasing you. You're endangering your sister by bringing her with you. I couldn't just leave her there. Why not? There was a strange sound, a deep throb getting louder, and the nemesis of Greymire's hammer came spinning by Valkyrie's ear and hit Shudder in the back. He was propelled forward, off his feet. He fell face down as the hammer thudded to the grass. Valkyrie skidded to her knees beside him. He blinked at her. Run, he said. She hooked her free hand under his arm. Get up. I can't move, he said. Then I'll carry you. You're carrying your sister. Run, Valkyrie. I'm not going to leave you here. Get to Ghastly, Shudder said. He'll take you to safety. Go now. Go. She had no choice. The nemesis was already stooping to pick up the hammer. I'm sorry, said Valkyrie, and ran on. She glanced over her shoulder to see the hammer swinging down towards Shudder's head, but averted her eyes before it hit. There was a church ahead of her. It was small, made of black stone. The door was open. She ran in, closed the door, turned as her eyes adjusted to the new gloom. Pews, an altar and a man sitting in the front row, with perfectly symmetrical scars running down his head. Chapter 34 Ghastly Bespoke looked round. His smile was tired. 
I've been waiting for you. The nemesis is chasing me, Valkyrie said. You won't be able to break through that door, Ghastly responded. Sit. She sat beside him. Alice gurgled happily. Do you know what's happening? Ghastly asked. Do you know where you are? Valkyrie did her best to focus on a thought that flitted through her mind too fast to catch. Not really, she said. You're in Greymire Asylum, Ghastly told her. Do you remember Greymire? Yes, she said. Of course she did. She was there right now, looking for K-49. They're doing something to my mind. Sort of. They're making me go crazy. Just a little. They gassed me. So this isn't real. This is in my head. No, said Ghastly. It's real. I'm not the real me, but you're the real you. And you're sitting in a real church. But it's a church that didn't exist until you saw it. This floor of the asylum, it transforms to reflect the inner workings of your mind. The longer you stay here, the deeper it goes, and the harder it is to find your way out. It's how they examine their patients. And why do they send the nemesis? He looked at her. They don't. The nemesis just appears. A hammer pounded on the church door. She wants to get in, Ghastly said, standing. I should let her. Valkyrie jumped up. What? I have to let her in, said Ghastly, walking towards the door. Valkyrie ran round him, planting herself in his path. Why would you do that? She's here to punish you. I don't want to be punished. Ghastly smiled for the first time. Of course you do. The nemesis wouldn't be here if you didn't. There are 1,351 graves out there because of you. I didn't kill them. Darkest did. It happened because of you, Ghastly said. They all died because of you. I can't be held responsible for... You were warned about her. The sensitives had the dreams. They had the visions. They told us she was coming, and they told us all the horrible things she was going to do. And you knew that was your future self. You knew that if you stayed on this path, if you stayed with magic, with skullduggery, then you would become her. But instead of turning away, you stayed. You couldn't even consider depriving yourself of the adventure, of the wonder. You wanted so much to be different, to be exceptional, to be important, that you walked right into that future and you allowed it to happen. The people in those graves, they died because of your arrogance. Finbar and Cassandra, Ken Speckle and Anton and even Billy Ray Sanguine. They died because of your hubris. I died because of your ego. And so did she. Valkyrie frowned. So did who? Ghastly moved past her and walked towards the door. The pounding was getting heavier, shaking the door on its hinges. So did who? Valkyrie shouted, and noticed that Alice wasn't gurgling any more. She pulled the blanket aside, but there was just another fold beneath. She pulled that fold down, pulled down the next one, held Alice away from her so she could figure out how to get at her. And then the blanket slipped from her grip and unravelled as it fell, and the bones of her sister clattered to the stone floor. Valkyrie sucked in a groan and fell backwards, crashed into a pew, her hands scrabbling for purchase, trying to keep herself upright. Daylight, dim and cold, slanted across the church and the nemesis of Greymire came inside, and ghastly turned to Valkyrie. You deserve this, he said. There was a door behind her. Valkyrie sobbed and shouldered it open, went stumbling into darkness. She lit up her hands, stone walls on either side. She ran. None of this could be real. 
ghastly. The others, they were dead. And Alice... Alice wasn't a baby any more. That was wrong. Her thoughts were wrong. She tried to slow her mind down, but it was travelling too fast. She couldn't focus, couldn't do it. So she stopped running, and she held her sister's face in her mind. This was all for Alice. All of it. Helping her. Healing her. Saving her. Making her whole again. That's what this was. That was the only thing that mattered. She burned that image into her thoughts until that's all there was. Until nothing distracted her. Nothing tugged at her. Her sister was all that mattered. Her sister was her whole world. She could think now. Her thoughts travelled the path they were supposed to travel. This was better. This was sanity. She opened her eyes. She was in a large room with white walls. She turned. Dr. Derleth was standing there. You are interesting, he said. Chapter 35 Valkyrie shoved him, sent him hurtling off his feet, feeling the power that burned in her eyes. What did you do to me? she snarled. He gazed up at her curiously. I took a peek into your mind, he said. Just a quick one. Just to see if you were filled with all the interesting things I suspected. And you were. It was delightful. You gassed me! A paltry amount, Derleth said. Barely worth mentioning. All the gas did was unscrew the lid. Whatever happened after that was all you. It wasn't real. That's right. It was a hallucination. Oh, no, Derleth replied. No, no, no. You went insane. Valkyrie pulled the magic out of her eyes, drew it back inside her. Bull, she said. That's a load of... It was an illusion. Your mind broke, my dear, said Derleth. Snapped like a twig. That's what this place does to people, even us doctors. He smiled. You're one of us now. Valkyrie picked him up by his coat. Give me what I came for. Forgive me, Derleth said. But you have no idea what you came for. You think K-49 is a pill or a serum or a treatment? You are stumbling around in the dark, my dear. Attempting to interfere in matters you simply do not comprehend. You'd be far better off. Valkyrie slugged him across the jaw, and the doctor crumpled. Do not patronize me, she said to his unconscious form, then stepped over him. She left the room through the blue door and hurried down the first set of stairs she came to. Avoiding the doctors and the brothers, she slipped through a rusted door where all the crying and moaning was coming from. There were metal doors on either side of her. Cell doors. She started walking. The patients couldn't know she was there, and yet there were suddenly a hundred fists hammering on those doors, and she quickened her pace, hands at her ears, trying to block out the cacophony that followed her. This place was insane. Every corner she took led to more moaning and crying and hollering, more metal doors with their numbers peeling off. Valkyrie stopped. The door beside her had a number. Eighty-four. She stepped back, looked around. There, on the wall, the letter N. K-49 wasn't a cure. It was a cell. She ran back the way she'd come, back to the stairs, and she went down, down again, and down again. She kept going until she came to floor K, and she found a map on the wall, covered in grime. She wiped it as clean as she could, and found K-49 with her finger. It was coloured differently from the others. It was green. Valkyrie stepped back. On the floor, there was a faint green line. She followed it through a series of rooms, and the air began to taste cleaner, fresher, and she kept going, until finally she burst out into the lashing rain, and above her, the tallest of the asylum's towers loomed against the grey clouds. 
K-49. Valkyrie hurried over. The tower appeared to have only one window, right at the very top. She reckoned she could make it all the way up there before her clothes started to scorch. Probably. She crouched slightly and drew in her magic, feeling it in the pit of her stomach. She straightened as she released it and burst upwards, trailing a stream of white energy. The ground fell away and the tower flitted by, and then she was at the window, grabbing the bars with one hand while she sat, one bum cheek on the ledge, letting the energy fade. The wind pulled at her hair. Valkyrie prized open the window and slipped inside. A grey-haired old woman sat in a chair beside the bed. It was warm in here, and there was a small music box open on a side table. It played a tune Valkyrie couldn't place. It was beautiful. Hypnotic, almost. She shook her head to wake herself up. Excuse me, she said softly. Sorry? Hello? She moved round until she was standing directly in the old woman's line of sight. But those old eyes didn't even register her presence. Valkyrie knelt by her. Hello? My name's Valkyrie. I'm looking for something in this room, something that would... She didn't know exactly how to put this. Something that would help soothe a troubled mind. Do you know what that could be? The old woman didn't bother to respond. Valkyrie knew how she felt. She could have stayed here listening to that music for the rest of her life, too. But there was something. Something she had to do. Alice! Valkyrie slapped herself in the face to wake up, and as discreetly as she could, she searched the old woman and the chair she sat upon. Next, she went to the bed, then the dresser. She picked up the music box, checked it for hidden compartments. It was wooden and had a studded metal disc that turned in its centre. The lid closed and the music stopped, and the old woman murmured. Hello? Valkyrie said softly. The old woman shook her head and made a noise. An angry noise. Valkyrie felt a buzzing at the base of her skull. Her thoughts clouded. Then there was pain. She dropped to her hands and knees, and the music box fell open on the ground beside her, and the music resumed playing. The pain went away, and the buzzing stopped, and a moment later the old woman settled down. Valkyrie stared at the music box, then picked it up and stood. I'm going to have to take this, she said. I'm sorry. I don't want to upset you. I don't want to hurt you. But I know someone who needs this urgently. I'm sure the doctors here have another one they can get for you. You're going to be fine. You're going to be okay. She went to the window, opened it, sat up on the sill and swung her legs out. She looked back at the old woman sitting in the chair. I'm really sorry, she said, and closed the lid and let herself fall. Before her magic had a chance to start crackling around her, Skullduggery swooped in, caught her, and kept going, rising higher into the darkening sky, leaving Greymire Asylum behind. Chapter 36 Carival Academy slept. The floorboards creaked, the ceilings groaned, the classrooms and corridors, the cafeteria and cloakrooms stood empty and dark, waiting to be filled and Omen Darkly crept like a fat ninja through the shadows. No, damn it, not fat. That was mean. Even he had to admit that. He wasn't fat any more, for a start. Well, he was, but not as much as he used to be. The word fat was unnecessarily harsh. He had to work at being kinder to himself. That's what Axelia said. And that started with cutting out the insults his mind lobbed at him when he did stupid things like sneak through school at night. He knew full well why his mind tossed these words at him. It was all a defence mechanism. He used them so that when other people called him names, it didn't hurt as much. Pretty basic psychology. But that didn't mean it was any better for his self-esteem. He needed to watch that. His self-esteem was hooked up to life support as it was, 
We didn't need Omen tipping it out of its bed. Carrival was different at night. Without the students, without the constant murmur of conversation, Omen realised just how big the place was. The corridors were ridiculously long and strangely wide. The stairs swept upwards at odd angles. The rooms had a weird symmetry to them, their placement eccentric yet precise. No doubt it was all in order to channel the energies of its students, to focus their minds and their magics. But in the dark like this, it was just... spooky. Also, the place played tricks the further Omen crept. He was sure there was someone watching him, someone following him. He hurried on. Up the main stairs he went, onto the first floor. He slowed at every corner, peered round in case a teacher had been working late. For all he knew, some of his teachers lived in their offices. Peccant, for instance. There was a man who slept at his desk, Omen was sure, or at the very least, hung from his ceiling. He definitely didn't go home. He didn't have a wife or kids waiting for him, or a dog that would sit in the hall with its tail wagging whenever it heard his keys in the door. Peccant lived for his job. You could tell from the lines etched into his grim face. Peccant's very existence was one long experiment to see how humourless a living person could actually be. Omen turned, frowning into the gloom. He was sure. That time he was sure he'd heard something. But if it had been a teacher, they wouldn't be sneaking around behind him. They'd be calling his name and issuing a detention. So, if he was being followed, he wasn't being followed by a member of staff. Which was a thought that in no way made him feel safer. He continued on. It might have been a student. Maybe Gerontius or Morvan had been awake when he'd sneaked out of their dorm room. Maybe they were both following him, wondering where the hell he was going at this time of night. That was likely. Well, kind of likely. It's just that they had both looked sound asleep when Omen had slipped out. Or maybe it was no one. Maybe it was Omen's imagination. Maybe he was paranoid because he was doing something that he could get into a lot of trouble for. More than a lot. He was, after all, about to help some actual wanted fugitives. He slowed down. Oh, God. Oh, what the hell was he thinking? The classroom was right ahead. Beyond that door was all the equipment he'd need to start forging the documents Colleen and the others were waiting for. But going through that door, turning on those machines, that could get him arrested. Actually arrested. He turned, walked back the way he'd come. He couldn't do it. He couldn't. They were fugitives. They had thrown their lot in with Abyssinia. Yenin had tried to kill him, for God's sake. Of course, he wasn't doing this for Yenin. He was doing this for the others, who had realised what a mistake they'd made. Everyone made mistakes. Omen made plenty. Was he prepared to point at their latest mistake and say, This is the one that will define you? Or was he going to help them get past it? He had stopped walking. Of course he had. He turned again, muttering to himself, and trudged on to the door. He raised his hand to turn the handle. Such an ordinary door. Such a plain and ordinary door. Beyond it lay unimaginable risk. Beyond it his freedom hung in the balance, as did the lives of a bunch of people who never particularly liked him, but who needed him right now who were depending on him. All that behind this one plain, ordinary, boring old door. Omen steeled himself, grasped the handle, turned it, opened the door and stepped in. Nope, wrong door. Chapter 37 there was a buzz of excitement Sebastian hadn't felt in a long time. Forby had been keeping them all informed over the last few days, detailing how he was closing in on Darkess's signal. 
Sebastian doubted anyone in the group knew what Forby was talking about, but no one was in the mood to complain. They'd gathered in Lily's front room. Forby was the only one standing. Kimora was squeezed between Bennett and Ulysses on the couch. Tarry perched on the left arm of the chair in which Demure was curled. Sebastian sat in the other armchair, leaning forward, waiting. Lily! Demure screeched. Coming, coming, Lily said, hurrying in from the kitchen with a tray of finger food. Would anyone like some sandwiches? I've got ham, cucumber and egg. Kimora, I've got gluten-free sandwiches for you. I found this fantastic recipe. Lily, Kimora interrupted. Thank you for caring, but I swear to God, if you don't sit down right this second. Sorry, sorry, Lily said. She put the tray on the coffee table and went to sit on the arm of Sebastian's chair. He leaped up immediately. It's your chair. You sit, I'll stand. Nonsense, Lily said. You're the guest. I prefer standing, honestly. Will you both stop being so damn polite and sit down? Ulysses barked. Lily perched. Sebastian sat. Um, he said. I suppose I hereby call this special meeting of the Dark Kess Society to order. Forby, please update us on how the search is going. Forby smiled. The search is not going, he said. The search is over. I found her. Cheers broke out. Everyone jumped to their feet, started hugging each other. Only Sebastian kept his eyes on Forby. Tell us, he said. I managed to zero in on her signature, Forby said, just like it hoped. I won't bore you with the details. I know how you all love my details. But essentially, what I did was build a scanner based on the device we'd recovered from the Leibniz universe, a device that kept open a portal between dimensions. A few days ago, I got a spike in readings that I told you about, which was my first indication that I'd found the dimension we'd been looking for. I repeated the scans eight times, just to be absolutely sure. And you are? Demure asked. You're absolutely sure that she's there? I am. And if you're reading her energy signature, that means she's alive, right? No, Forby said. Her energy signature is merely her presence. I've got no way to check for life signs. Any other signatures? Sebastian asked. Forby hesitated. Yes, he said at last. Many. And could these energy signatures belong to faceless ones? There's a high probability, yes. The house went silent until Lily clapped her hands. But that doesn't mean they're alive now, does it? She said. It might be an entire reality full of the corpses of faceless ones, with Darkess sitting on top. Absolutely, said Sebastian. So now that we know where she is, how do we get to her? We can use the portal device, can't we? Tarry asked. That's where we've hit a snag, Forby said. I thought I could use the device to open a portal without requiring a shunter. Unfortunately, that has proven to be beyond my capabilities. It's not the end of the world, said Lily, shrugging. I'm sure we can club together to pay a shunter to open the portal, can't we? Then your little doohickey will keep it open while we search. We can't pay a shunter the same as the High Sanctuary does, said Forby. And they're all on exclusive contracts anyway. I doubt we'll find one willing to do some illicit freelance work. I might know of one, said Ulysses. They all looked at him. You know one of the shunters working for the Supreme Mage? Sebastian asked. No, Ulysses answered. Not one of those, but I do know another. I kind of reached out to him when Forby picked up the first trace. Demure narrowed her eyes. How much is he charging? Nothing, actually. He'll open the portal for free? Ulysses nodded. That's what he said. All we have to do is sneak him in past the walls. Why doesn't he shunt in? Bennett asked. He can't be much good if he can't even shunt into the city. Actually, Forby said, nobody can shunt in. The High Sanctuary has set up blockers all over Roarhaven to stop Mevelin's forces from doing just that, 
should they decide to invade. I'd like to see them try once we've got Dark Hess back, Terry said, folding his arms. She'd wipe them out with a wave of her hand. There were a few laughs, a few nodding heads. Sebastian kept his eyes on Forby. Will the shunter be able to open the portal with the blockers in place? Forby allowed himself a small smile. He will? I helped build the blockers, so I know a way to block them. I'm pretty sure nobody will even notice there's a gap. So if we sneak this shunter guy in, Sebastian said, he'll open the portal right here and the device will keep it open. Then what do we do? Forby let out a long, long breath. <sighs> then one of us, maybe two, goes through. Into another dimension? Demure asked, suddenly unsure. Yes, said Forby. Probably not me, though. I mean, I would, but someone has to stay here and make sure the device doesn't break down. What will we need? Bennett asked. Like spacesuits or something? I don't know yet, Forby answered. It's entirely possible, I suppose. The environment could be toxic, it could be hazardous, and it could be overrun with faceless ones. So, yes, it might be unfriendly. And how do we find Darkess? We'd be stepping into a whole other universe. She might be on a completely different planet. She won't be, said Forby. In fact, from my calculations, she should be within 100 kilometres of where the portal opens. If you're lucky, you could emerge and be right beside her. There's no way of judging. Sorry. Lily looked around. So Darkess is within 100 kilometres of where we're standing right now? Yes. Forby said, 100 kilometres and, you know, a few hundred million dimensions that way. He pointed left. Everyone ooed softly. Everyone except Sebastian. That's assuming there'll even be a planet on the other side of that portal, he said. We might step through into empty space. Forby gave a little cough. <clears throat> it's possible, he said. But if there is a surface for you to walk on, you'll be carrying a portable scanner that should lead you right to her. You'd need to take food, supplies. This suit takes care of all that for me. I'll have to go, alone. No, said Bennett. We can't let you do that. It's too dangerous. Sebastian didn't answer for a bit. Then he nodded. Yeah, you're right. Although... Forby said. Your suit does make you the perfect candidate. Sebastian made a face beneath his mask. Does it, though? Couldn't we rustle up a spacesuit for, I don't know, Terry? I can't go, said Terry. I have a job. They'd never let me take the time off. Have you asked? You're really the only one of us who could go through, Forby said. We don't know that, Sebastian responded. That version of Earth might have a breathable atmosphere and abundant food and water. It might be amazing. Lily stepped over to him, put a hand on his shoulder and said, You're the plague, Doctor. You're our leader and you have our respect. But you are going. Sebastian sighed. Yeah, I know. I'll go with you, said Bennett. Thanks, dude, but no. I'm the only one dressed like an idiot, so I'll have to do this alone. He turned to Ulysses. Looks like it's a plan. When will your shunter be available? He's ready now, said Ulysses. It'll take him a day or two to get here, though. I'll need that time to build a portable scanner, Forby said. And I think I can get my hands on a submachine gun, said Demure. Sebastian frowned. How can you get a submachine gun? And why would I need one? I have a shady past, Demure said, and that world might have monsters you'll need to shoot. Oh, said Sebastian. Oh, yeah. Good point. Who is your shunter friend anyway? Lily asked. Ulysses hesitated. Everyone looked at him. He's not a friend, said Ulysses. I've never actually spoken to him. He's more... 
a friend of a colleague of an acquaintance of someone I used to know. Ulysses, said Sebastian. Who is he? Nadir, said Ulysses. It's Silas Nadir. Chapter 38 Omen was exhausted. He'd been up all night forging those documents, and he still wasn't finished. He had one more night of work ahead of him, maybe two. It was bad enough when he was doing that stuff to get a passing grade, but it was so much harder when there were people actually depending on him not to mess it up. Pressure. Omen wasn't good with pressure. He also wasn't good with sneaking around and breaking the rules and helping known fugitives. The school day hadn't even started, and already he was a paranoid wreck, imagining that everyone was staring at him and whispering about him. Every corner he turned, he expected cleavers to be waiting on the other side, or worse still, skullduggery and valkyrie. But that was nonsense. No one had seen him. No one knew what he was up to. Nobody at all. Hello, Omen, said Skullduggery, and Omen screamed. Everyone else in the corridor stared. Skullduggery tilted his head. You seem... jumpy, he said. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm fine, Omen responded. What was the point of lying? Skullduggery knew. Obviously he knew. Why else would he be here? It would be better for Omen if he confessed now, immediately. Just got it all out there. Wow, said Omen. I'm sorry. Oh, God. He'd forgotten how to speak. His limbs were suddenly so incredibly heavy, and his tongue was an alien creature in his mouth over which he had no control. Would you like to have a chat, Omen? Skullduggery asked. He couldn't cry. He wouldn't. Everyone was watching. If he started blubbering, that would be the only thing anyone would ever say about him. When Omen Darkly was arrested, he cried like a stupid little baby. No. Omen would not be remembered like that. He would maintain his dignity. He would be cool at all times. You're taking an awfully long time to answer my question, Skullduggery said. Sorry. Omen blurted. That's okay. I'm so sorry. It's fine, really. Valkyrie asked me to stop by, and I think she said, chat. So here I am. My apologies for arriving before your classes have even begun, but my days tend to fill up fast, so I'd really like to get this out of the way as soon as possible. Omen frowned. You... You want to chat? Yes. Um, about what? You can pick the topic, Skullduggery said, starting to walk. Omen hurried to keep up. Oh, we don't have to chat about anything in particular. That's what's so nice about chatting. It's not as formal as a talk, and you can flit from subject to subject as you wish. Oh, said Omen, the panic receding. Cool. Uh, I could... I could talk to you about school, about how my lessons are going. No, said Skullduggery. That's boring. I don't want to do that. Right. Sorry. Valkyrie seems to think you might be feeling left out of things. Are you feeling left out of things? Because you should be. It's safer for you that way and also safer for us, as we don't have to worry about where you are, and if you're dying, or something dreadful like that. To put it mildly, I'm not really sure why I'm here, but the fact remains that here I am, and so, if there's anything you want to get off your chest, then... He waved his hand. Thank you, said Omen. You're quite welcome. While I wouldn't go so far as to say that you're like a son to me, Omen, or a nephew, or even the nephew of a close family friend, I do, nevertheless, view you as a young person who has entered into my orbit and who I now must deal with. That's very sweet of you. 
I am surprisingly sweet. People often say that. A first-year boy ran up. My great-great-grandfather fought beside you in the war, he announced breathlessly. He still talks about it. You probably wouldn't remember him. It was so long ago, and you fought beside so many people. But I also have a marvellous memory, said Skullduggery. What's his name? Bernan Howbeit. Howbeit, Skullduggery murmured. Yes, I do remember him. He fought at the Siege of Lions, didn't he? Yes, sir, the boy said, beaming. He was dreadful, Skullduggery said. Oh, said the boy. How is he? Is he doing well? He's, he's doing fine, sir. Excellent, Skullduggery said, and marched on. What's it like, Omen said, keeping up to have everyone staring at you wherever you go. It can be trying, especially if it interferes with an investigation. There are times when it's intrusive and unwelcome, and there are times when all I want is to be left alone. But you must keep in mind that it doesn't happen outside Roarhaven or the magical communities. In the mortal world, I get to wear a disguise. You could wear a disguise here, too. I could, Skullduggery said. But then how would people recognize me? They reached the stairs as the bell rang, and by the time they reached the bottom, the corridors were emptying. What class do you have now? Skullduggery asked. Maths, Omen said, with Mr. Peckant. He doesn't like it when I'm late. I'll talk to him. It'll be fine. Which way is the cafeteria? Omen pointed and followed as Skullduggery strode on. The dining hall was empty, apart from the catering staff behind the counter, clearing up the last of breakfast. Omen took a seat while Skullduggery went to ask for something. He came over a moment later with a carton of juice, which he put in front of Omen, and then sat. Omen frowned at the carton. Thank you. I find that people like to drink when they chat, Skullduggery said. It gives them something to do while they listen and formulate responses. It's Blackberry. Do you like Blackberry? That's fine, said Omen. It's just... This is something you'd give to a kid, isn't it? Skullduggery nodded. Omen tried a smile. Only I'm not a kid. I mean, you wouldn't have given a carton of juice to Valkyrie when she was fifteen, would you? Dear me, no, Skullduggery said. So you kind of... You see me as a kid, then? Yes. Right. Does that upset you? No, Omen said. Well, a little, yes. Like, you don't view me as an adult. Because you're not an adult. But you viewed Valkyrie as an adult. Skullduggery nodded. So you viewed Valkyrie as an adult when she was fifteen, but you don't view me as an adult when I'm fifteen. Exactly, said Skullduggery. Why not? Valkyrie had, to borrow a phrase, the weight of the world on her shoulders when she was fifteen years old. She had been offered a glimpse into her own future that was little more than a nightmare. She had to grow up a lot faster than normal, and I certainly didn't help matters the way I acted. A moment passed. If you don't want the juice, I can take it back. No, Omen said quickly. I'll drink it. He popped it open and took a sip. Refreshing. Would you change any of it? He asked. With Valkyrie, if you could. Skullduggery put both elbows on the table and interlaced his gloved fingers. From a practical point of view, no. She was integral to saving the world on multiple occasions. But do I wish I could change some things, looking back? Yes. I don't regret introducing her to our world. Her entire existence opened up from that point onwards but if somehow I could simultaneously have allowed her to grow up in her own way, at her own pace, 
to experience the things that she needed to experience. I would have. Those experiences are important. You're young, Omen. You think adulthood will never get here. You want all this strife, all this uncertainty to be over, yes? Omen nodded. It's never over. It's just replaced by different sorts of strife and different sorts of uncertainty. And don't believe anyone who tells you that their childhood days were the best years of their life. I'd hate to have to go through mine again, and I much prefer being an adult, even one without any flesh. But if everyone's so uncertain all the time, Omen said, how do they know what to do with their lives? Like, right now everyone in my class is filling out these senior year's agenda forms, where you're basically deciding what discipline you want to focus on. Skullduggery tilted his head. That's a part of your curriculum. They've made that into something you can be tested on. Pretty much. Skullduggery took off his hat and put it on the table beside him. The people here at the Academy are trying to figure out the optimal way to teach the next generation of sorcerers. They want you to be the best and the brightest. Something like this, a school on this scale, with these resources, has never been attempted before. Because of this, they're going to make mistakes. You think the SYAs are a mistake? Choosing your discipline is a personal matter, Skullduggery said. You have practically all of them at your fingertips right now at a fraction of their potential. By the time your surge hits, you'll either have figured it out, or you won't. If you're not specializing in one thing in particular, you'll be an elemental. I personally chose this discipline, and I have to say, it's not so bad. You can fly, said Omen, grinning. I can fly, indeed. And I've passed on that knowledge, so now other elementals are flying, too. What I'm telling you is that it sorts itself out. You don't need to fill out a form to decide what you want to be. You just need to listen to yourself. Flying wouldn't be so bad, maybe. It does grant you a fresh perspective on things. I just don't know what I'm going to do, said Omen. I don't want to disappoint my parents even more than I already have. Quite a couple, your parents. Do you know them? I met them at the last Requiem Ball, almost ten years ago now. They were... Intense? Yes, that sounds like them, all right. Omen slurped some more juice. Could I ask if, when you were a kid, you liked your parents? Skullduggery hesitated. I liked my mother. I'd even go so far as to say, I loved my mother. I had disagreements with my father. I didn't mean to make it sound like I don't love my parents, Omen said quickly. I do, of course I do. I'm just, I'm just not really sure if they love me. Skullduggery's head tilted again. Sorry, said Omen, giving a shaky laugh. You probably think that sounds really pathetic. Parents should love their children, Skullduggery said. It doesn't always happen that way, unfortunately. Things go wrong. Some people aren't built for it. But you're not pathetic for wanting something that should naturally be yours, Omen, and never be afraid to be sad. The wind does not break a tree that bends. That's... Wow. Is that like some ancient proverb that you picked up on your travels hundreds of years ago? It is, Skullduggery said. Also, it's written on the back of your juice carton. His phone buzzed, and he read the message, then picked up his hat and stood. I have to go now, Omen. I'm under instructions to remind you to stay away from America. Will you do that for me? Yes. I mean, 
I already promised Valkyrie, but yeah, I'll stay away. Can I ask why, though? I'm sure Valkyrie will tell you once it's all over. For now, you should really get to class. Omen paled. But aren't you coming with me to talk to Mr. Peckant, to tell him why I'm late? You'll be fine, Skullduggery said, walking away. Uther Peckant is a very understanding man. I don't think you know him very well. But Skullduggery was already gone. Ah, oh, damn it, said Omen. Chapter 39 When the dreams came, Valkyrie was trapped in that coffin again, being buried alive by all the people who'd died because of her. She screamed and begged and pleaded, and all they did was laugh and throw down more dirt. She woke, hot and tangled in sweat-soaked sheets. She sat up and cried until her insides quivered. When she was all cried out, she dragged herself into the shower and stood under the hot spray until she'd stopped shaking. She put on some clothes, fed Zena and herself, and then she worked out, ignoring her phone when it rang. She had another shower, a longer one, and dried her hair and dressed properly. The phone rang again. She didn't answer it. A message came through from Skullduggery, telling her that Oberon Guile had a lead regarding crepuscular vies. She should have answered it, but she didn't want to go anywhere, didn't want to leave the house. So she lifted the lid of the music box and sat on the edge of her bed, staring at the wall. The jingly-jangly thoughts quietened and fell obediently into place. The vision involving Omen and Augur was still on track to happen the way Valkyrie had seen. They were still in danger. Working with Oberon Guile could possibly help to avert that future. She stood. Helping Oberon meant helping Omen. That was her priority right now. Well, one of them. Valkyrie frowned. Was today Monday? Today was Monday, she was pretty sure. She'd arranged to meet Kason tonight. Could she get to America and back before ten? With Fletcher she could. He was so handy. The phone was ringing again. How long had it been ringing? How long had she been sitting there? She closed the lid of the music box. Time to get back to work. Forty minutes later... She was standing with Skullduggery and Oberon Guile outside an apartment building in Tucson, Arizona. Skullduggery was wearing a façade. Valkyrie was wearing a coat and holding a photograph of a man in a military uniform, staring straight at the camera. His name's Thomas Bolton, Oberon said. He spent twelve years in the U.S. Army, and then he quit to join a private company. No one I've talked to seems to know which private army, however. Valkyrie passed the photo to Skullduggery. We could find that out pretty easily, she said. I have no doubt, Oberon responded, taking the photo back. My detective skills only go so far before they fall over and die. From what I've been able to gather, though, he's making a living as a mercenary these days. And what links him to crepuscular vise? Skullduggery asked. A very thin thread, Oberon admitted. I know a lot of ex-cons, a lot of disreputable people, but only one of them had even heard about a sorcerer matching Vise's description. So I followed that trail, shaky as it was. Talked to one person who sent me to another who sent me to another... And eventually, I got chatting to a plumber from Philadelphia. I mean, he's a sorcerer, too. But he needs to earn a living, you know? Anyway, Bolton's his ex-brother-in-law. A real dirtbag, from what I've been told. Thanksgiving before last, the plumber starts to get the feeling that Bolton knows about us. You know, the magic thing. He reckons Bolton's new employers know about us, too. So a few days later, he follows him, ends up sneaking around a warehouse where a bunch of military guys are congregating. 
but he's a lot better at plumbing than he is at sneaking, so he gets discovered, and a guy with a freaky-looking face, his words, not mine, and answering to the name of Crepuscular, proceeds to beat the living hell out of him. He manages to run, and Bolton doesn't see him, so the plumber goes home, convinces his sister to finally end her crappy marriage, and gets on with his life. That's actually pretty good detective work, said Valkyrie. You think so? You show potential, Skullduggery said, and looked up at the apartment building. It was a rather nice building, as buildings went. Is Mr. Bolton at home right now? As far as I can tell, yes, he is, Oberon replied, and I'm pretty sure he's alone. They took the elevator up. Valkyrie used to be nervous stepping into elevators, especially old ones, paranoid that they'd break down between floors and she'd be trapped for hours. Right now, she wasn't worried too much about anything. It was nice. Skullduggery led the way to Bolton's apartment. He pushed at the air and the door burst open and he went in first. The apartment was open plan. Doors to their right and left, the bedroom and bathroom presumably, and then the kitchen and the living room sharing the same space. Everything was stylish and expensive. Whoever Bolton worked for, they obviously paid a hell of a lot of money. Thomas Bolton came running out of the bedroom with a gun in his hand, and Skullduggery waved and a wall of air hurled Bolton backwards. He landed on a coffee table and bounced off, hit the TV, the gun clattering into the corner. We have some questions, Skullduggery said, but Bolton's hand was at his ankle, and when he stood he had another gun and he was firing. Oberon dodged back out of the apartment while Valkyrie threw herself behind the kitchen island. Skullduggery grunted as bullets pulled at his jacket, and he spun and went down on one knee, hand clutching his shoulder. The firing stopped. There was the click of a magazine being ejected, and Valkyrie stood, hands crackling. Bolton saw her mid-reload, and barely dodged the lightning she sent his way. It scorched the wall behind him. Bolton scrambled for the window, firing without looking, forcing Valkyrie to duck. When she looked up, he was already climbing out. She hurried over to Skullduggery as Oberon ran in. I'm okay, Skullduggery said. Catch him before he gets away. Valkyrie knelt, tried to pull his hand away from his shoulder. Did he shoot you? Did he hit you? He damaged my jacket, Skullduggery said. But when she managed to pull his hand away, his facade's skin was rippling and fragments of bone fell to the floor. It's just my clavicle he said. I have a spare. Valkyrie, we can't let him get away. She nodded, straightened, backed up so she could see out of the window. Bolton was running across a neighbor's roof. Anger curling her lip, she crouched, energy crackling around her whole body. Then she launched herself forward, out through the window, across the roof, her fists out in front, and at the last moment she brought her hands in and slammed her shoulder into Bolton's back, and he flipped, windmilling off the roof while Valkyrie flew on. She applied the brakes and got her legs under her, feet slapping the rooftop at a run. When she finally stopped, she let herself slide down the roof and then jumped, landing in the same back garden in which Bolton was just getting to his feet. He rushed her without hesitation. She could have blasted him, but she let him come, let him grab her, let him try to hit her, and then she hit him an elbow straight to the chin. He grunted, stepped back, realised she was gripping his sleeve. He tried to pull his arm free, and Valkyrie stepped into him, the point of her elbow to the sweet spot at his sternum. He gasped, and she hammered her fist into his nose, then hit him three more times, all to the jaw. His knees crumpled, and she thought he was going down, but instead his arms encircled her just below the hips. She could do nothing as he picked her up and then threw her down again, hard. The breath left her lungs and he was on top, and it was all Valkyrie could do to hold on to him, to pull him close. He struggled to get free, struggled to get some distance to throw a punch. 
but she had one arm wrapped around the back of his neck and the other wrapped around his right arm, while her ankles locked together around his waist. Bolton struggled and cursed. Valkyrie held on and sucked in a welcome breath of cold air. I'll kill you, Bolton snarled through gritted teeth. Kill you, freak, kill all of you. He spat right in her face. She roared and seized his head with both hands and put enough juice into her palms to throw him backwards. He landed and rolled and she was up, stalking over, ready to fry him, ready to cook him where he lay. Then Oberon was jumping down, stepping in between them, his hands up, and he was saying something and blocking her way, and all she wanted to do was throw him aside and kill this piece of... She stopped. She didn't want to kill him. She didn't want to kill anyone. Valkyrie backed off, hands at her head, and Skullduggery was there, holding his shoulder. I need to get home, she muttered to him. I need to get home before I hurt him. I'll call Fletcher. Skullduggery said. Oberon, can you handle Mr. Bolton from here? Oberon looked uncertain. You want me to question him? Interrogating a suspect is no big deal, Skullduggery began, and went on to say something funny that Valkyrie was only half listening to. The voices in her head. They were screaming at her. Chapter 40 Fletcher teleported them to Skullduggery's house on Cemetery Road. Valkyrie had recovered enough to insist on helping Skullduggery with his injury. I want to see your clavicle room, she said to him after Fletcher had left them, injecting more frivolity into her voice than she was feeling. I don't have a clavicle room, Skullduggery insisted. Valkyrie was pretty sure he was lying. The house was, as always, immaculate. The living room had a large TV that was only used when Valkyrie was around. There were two armchairs. The fireplace was empty. The kitchen was stark. There were no photographs anywhere. No keepsakes. No curios. Skullduggery took off his jacket as he walked deeper into the house. There were bullet holes in his waistcoat too. Does it hurt? Valkyrie asked, following. Not any more, he said. Is your facade damaged? It'll be fine in a few hours. You really don't have to worry about me. He looked back at her. How are you? She smiled and frowned at the same time. Me? I'm fine. That's some temper you're developing. He spat at me, Skullduggery. Also, come on, he shot through you and your jacket, and it's a nice jacket. It is a nice jacket, Skullduggery murmured. The first room on the left was essentially a giant walk-in wardrobe. It was one of three in the house. This one had three-piece suits of varying shades of blue and black. The greys and charcoals were in the room across the hall. Skullduggery chose a suit of the deepest, darkest blue and laid it on a small table. If you wouldn't mind, he said, taking off his tie. Valkyrie flashed him a smile. I don't mind at all. He folded the tie, put it away in his tie drawer, and took a smashed clavicle from his pocket and looked at it for a moment before tossing it in a box. Pick another one out for me, would you? Sure, she said. Where? The library, he said. Gordon's first book. Falkyrie left him to change clothes. She went to one of the largest rooms in the house, a library with bookcases on every wall. She found her uncle's books, pulled out a rare first edition of the cult horror Caterpillars and reached into the space it had occupied. She located the hidden lever with her fingers and pulled it, and the bookcase swung open. Valkyrie stepped into a room lined with mirrors. In the centre of the room, on a series of glass shelves that rose from floor level to head height, there were enough bones to build a complete skeleton many times over. Valkyrie traced her finger over the clavicles and picked up the longest as Skullduggery came in behind her. He held out his hand, but she stepped up. I'll do it, she said. 
she unbuttoned his shirt a little and pulled it gently to one side. Flicking on her aura vision, she watched as his aura shrank away from the clavicle as she moved it in. Then quite suddenly it latched on, and the bone clicked, jerking out of her grip slightly and settling into place. Thank you, Skullduggery said, buttoning his shirt. Dare I ask where you got all these spare parts? A lot of them I've picked up along the way, he said. Some have been donated by friends. Does that happen? Friends give you their bones? They leave me their bones, yes. That's weird. Nice, but weird, but mainly nice. Wouldn't it be cool if we could heal Alice so easily? What do you think it'll do to her? Healing her, I mean. Skullduggery hesitated. I don't know. It might be fine, Valkyrie said. She mightn't even notice. That's a possibility. Or it might traumatize her, right? Another possibility. Valkyrie started walking and he followed. No matter what I do, I always seem to be about to hurt my sister. I mean, how can that be fair? How can healing her damage her in a whole new way? It shouldn't be allowed. No, it shouldn't. Do you think I should do it? We've had this conversation. Yes, but now we're closer to it happening. So, do you think I should do it? It's not my... She turned to him. Skullduggery, please. Just tell me. Should I do it? Yes. Even with everything that could go wrong? She's broken, Skullduggery said. You can fix her. Is she, though? Is she broken? I mean, she's her. This is who she is, and it's who she's been for the last six years. But she's not who she was born to be, he countered. Permanently happy is not a natural state. It should be, said Valkyrie. God, how great would that be? You go through life with a smile on your face, and even when things go bad and you lose people, none of it makes any difference, because you're happy all the time. But she's not whole. You keep saying that like it's a terrible thing, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, if you lose a part of yourself, you come in here, you pick up a spare bone and you slot it in, and then you walk out and you're still the same you. It's not like that with the rest of us. We're not so easy to put back together. If we lose a part of ourselves, it's gone for good. His head slowly tilted. If you could heal yourself, would you? I... I don't... If you could throw away the guilt you're carrying around, would you do it? We're not talking about me, she said, annoyed. We're talking about healing. This isn't... Would you wipe away all the bad thoughts in your head? It doesn't matter what would you wipe away... No! She snapped, as energy crackled from her eyes. Okay, I wouldn't. But there's a difference between Alice and me. Alice doesn't deserve any of this. None of it was her choice. And you think you deserve to suffer? How many times do I have to tell you that this isn't about me? She tried to bury the anger, but it kept growing. You're twisting this. You want me to say something or admit to something, and I don't know what you want. She spun, walked out. She had to. The anger was boiling, magic darting between her fingertips. Getting hard to see. Had to get outside. Had to fly. Skullduggery's hand on her arm. You don't deserve to suffer, Valkyrie. Let go. It's not your... Her magic flexed and hurled Skullduggery back, and Valkyrie ran for the back door and it opened to let her out, and then she was flying, screaming at the sky. Chapter 41 She flew back to Grimwood because her clothes were in tatters. Another outfit ruined. She dumped the remains in the outside bin and let herself into the house. Zena followed her in, squirming between her legs as she tried to walk. 
Finally, Valkyrie sat on the stairs and cuddled her, eyes fixed on the floor. It was like she'd been out drinking and lost control and did something horrendously stupid from which there was no recovery. Except she didn't drink and she had no one to blame but herself. Her phone remained silent. No messages. No calls. He was okay. She was sure he was okay. She hadn't blasted him that hard. She didn't think. No, he was fine. She knew he was. The reason he wasn't calling to check up on her was undoubtedly because he was furious with her. Or he hated her. Or he was disappointed in her. She didn't know which one was worse. She moaned into Zena's neck. Zena licked her face. Valkyrie gathered the embarrassment and shame and guilt and self-loathing and, as she always did, wrapped them in a ball and kicked them into a corner of her mind. They'd roll back again the moment she weakened, but she couldn't afford to feel them right now. She had to meet Kason. She patted Zena, went up to her bedroom, and instead of pulling on some fresh clothes, she went straight to the music box and opened the lid. The tune washed through her mind. That ball of guilt and whatever else was swept out to sea. She wouldn't be seeing it any time soon. She smiled. She was breathing normally again. This was good. This was nice. She could have stayed there all evening, listening to that music. It was a shame she had to give the box to Kason. Valkyrie frowned. Kason. Something to do with Kason. Her eyes snapped open wide. She checked the time, staring at her phone in disbelief. She'd been standing there for two hours. Impossible. That was impossible. She closed the lid. The music stopped. She was going to be late. She pulled on fresh clothes, grabbed the music box and jumped in the car. By the time she got to the fangs, she was very late. Music box in hand, she jumped out of the car, but instead of running up the stairs, she blasted off her feet, landing on the theatre roof. It was empty. She'd missed him. Bizarrely, she didn't panic. This was a problem. Yes, a serious one, but she could still hear the tune from the music box in her head, and it kept the panic at bay. Options. She had options. The obvious one was to find Dusk and see if he had any way of contacting Kason. Failing that, she'd wait. It wasn't the most dynamic of strategies, but she had something that Kason needed, and he would find a way to approach her again. And if he didn't... She'd find Nye herself and hang on to the music box, which wasn't a bad consolation prize. You're late, said a voice from behind her. Valkyrie hadn't even heard him approach. The music in her head had possibly made her too calm. Smiling at that, she turned. Sorry, she said, but I'm here now. If it was possible, Kason looked even more frazzled now than he had when she'd first seen him. Poor guy. He'd feel better soon, though. Yes, he would. Did you do it? he asked. Did you find out where it is? Of course I did, said Valkyrie. It wasn't easy. I mean, the whole process from beginning to end, it was, and I do not use this word lightly, fraught. Kason tugged at his sleeve. Where is it? he asked. Tell me where the asylum is. I can do better than that, said Valkyrie holding up the music box. Kason looked at it for no more than a moment. Then his eyes flickered to hers. What's that? It's your cure, she said. Such a silly boy. This is what they use to soothe the voices in your head. It's what you wanted. I don't want that, Kason said, frowning. A cure isn't a... It isn't a music box. That familiar rage gripped him, and he screamed. It's not something you can hand me! Whoa, said Valkyrie. She was starting to panic. Wait a second here. Calm down, all right? This is what I found. This is... This is it. It has to be. It soothes the mind. That's not what I need. But I took this from K-49. 
His eyes widened. You found it? he asked, his voice suddenly soft. You were at Greymire. Where is it? I... I can't tell you. It's what we agreed. Valkyrie didn't understand this. She shook her head. I thought if I brought you the cure, you... There is no cure! He roared. There's no music box or antidote that can help me. I can't tell you, she repeated, trying to be calm. It's too dangerous for someone like you to know. The patients in that place, if they got out... Kason came forward quickly, both hands closing around her left wrist. He was suddenly so calm, but he talked really fast. I thought you wanted to help your sister, he said. If you... If you tell me where Nye is, I'll... No more deals, said Kason. We had a deal, and you broke it. That makes you a deal-breaker. I can't trust a deal-breaker. That Crengarian you want, I'll get a message to it. Tell it you're closing in. Tell it to move on. You'll never see it again. Never, ever. There's got to be something else I can do for you. I've spent decades being tortured, Valkyrie. My needs are simple. There is nothing you can give me that I could possibly want, except for Greymire Asylum. He released her wrist and stepped back. Don't go, she said. He started to walk away. Say hello to your sister for me. What's the cure? Kason turned. If it's not the music box, she said, or it's not a serum or an antidote or whatever, then what is it? It's a person. A doctor? Kason shook his head. A patient, then. The woman. He didn't respond. Valkyrie chewed her bottom lip. If I tell you where Greymire is, she said at last, you'll only break her out. I have no interest in any of the others. I have your word on that. You let that one woman out. The rest stay where they are. You have my word. And you'll tell me where Nye is. I promise. OK, she said. OK, I'll tell you. Valkyrie sat on the roof and listened to the music box. She had panicked. That was unlike her. It was understandable, of course. She had a lot on her plate, and a lot on her mind, and a lot everywhere. Plus, she was still fragile. Greymire Asylum had done a number on her, and no mistake. But it was fine now. The music box was making it all fine now. Valkyrie took out her phone and called Skullduggery waited for him to answer. Hello, he said. She closed the music box so she could think properly. I'm sorry, she said. OK. No, she said. I'm really sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I didn't mean to do it. It just... It just flashed out of me and I couldn't stop it. That's OK, he said. I should have let you leave when you wanted to leave. Did I hurt you? No. It looked like I hurt you. Only a little bit. Are you around? Can I see you? I'm in Roarhaven. I'm still at home. Ah, right. She sighed. I messed everything up, didn't I? Not everything, he said. I take it you met Kason. Was the music box what he wanted? No. Skullduggery, I... I had to tell him where Greymire Asylum was. He paused. OK, he said. OK. We'll say Abyssinia broke into your mind. You'll have to reinforce that idea in your head, because China will be using the best sensitives she's got to find out what went wrong. So your defences better be in place. I don't really have any defences, though. Then you need lessons. I know some people who can... Skullduggery, I'm telling you, it's not as bad as you think. Kason just wants to break the old woman out. What old woman? The old woman in the tower. She's all he wants. 
Who is she? He didn't say. Can you... Can you forgive me? Of course. Without hesitation. Thank you, she said, and then put some energy in her voice. Because I'm going to need your help. You definitely are. Valkyrie smiled. I know you're freaking out about this, but I really don't think it's going to be that big a deal. Why would China even think it was me who told him where the asylum was? I know I shouldn't have. I know you told me not to, but I mean, OK, so what? I think you're worrying too much. And what about Nye? The smile turned to a grin. I know where it is. You'll never guess. Try, though. You'll never get it. But try. I'm really not in a guessing mood. Go on, try. He sighed. <sighs> OK, let's see. Is it... An underwater lab! She shrieked. What? She jumped up. An underwater laboratory. Under the water, in the ocean. Can you believe it? Isn't that so cool? Have you ever been to an underwater lab before? I'll be honest with you, Skullduggery said. I have not. And haven't you always wanted to? Very much so. She twirled on the rooftop. Then tomorrow we're going to an underwater lab. Don't we have just the coolest job ever? Chapter 42 The whole class was silent and sat in twos, staring at each other, straining to broadcast a single word into the mind of their partner. A metronome talked. Miss Wicked stood and watched. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Omen sat opposite his brother. Augur's left eye was bruised. He had a cut along his cheek that was already half healed. Some of his hair appeared to be singed. None of that mattered. What mattered was the word. The word was hello. Miss Wicked clicked her heel against the floor. Everyone's eyes immediately closed. Omen breathed slowly, in and out. He visualised a tunnel opening in his mind. On the other end of that tunnel was his brother. There was nothing else. There was only the tunnel. Tuck, tuck, the metronome, the tunnel. Tuck, the tunnel. Hands went up. Omen heard the rustling of movement. He ignored it. He focused. He could do this. All he had to do was broadcast the word. Hello. 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 More rustling. More hands going up. Omen ignored them. It didn't matter to him how many other people in the room were managing to do what they'd been assigned. It only mattered what Omen managed to do. The tunnel. Augur sat at the other end of it, Omen knew. He was just sitting there, waiting, his mind open ready for Omen to throw that word in there. That was a little bit of pressure, Omen wasn't going to lie. And the pressure was actually a little distracting, kind of made it hard to focus on what he had to do. But he ignored it, just like he was ignoring the rustling of movement and the idea that everyone else in the class had already done this and they were all waiting for him. Just like he was ignoring his itchy ankle and his itchy cheek. That was maddening the itchiness. The more he avoided thinking about it, the more the need grew. Talk. Breathing. That was important. Breathing was as important as emptying the mind, maybe more important. Whether the mind was empty or full, you still needed to breathe. Of course, too much attention could be paid to the breathing. Right now, for instance, all of Omen's concentration was on taking air into his lungs and then blowing it back out again. This wasn't what he needed to be focusing on. He needed to be focusing on the task at hand. He needed to be focusing on the fact that Miss Wicked expected him to do well. Miss Wicked. No, no. He focused on the tunnel. On the tunnel. Not on Miss Wicked. On the tunnel. On telepathy. On the word. Not on Miss Wicked. Not on... Damn it! Augur? Miss Wicked said. Are you receiving anything? Um said Augur. Any words? Miss Wicked pressed. Any images, even? Omen opened his eyes. 
The whole class was looking at him, Augur included. Augur's eyebrows were raised slightly, but he suppressed a grin as he turned to Miss Wicked. Not really, miss. Almost, though. We're getting closer. Okay, Miss Wicked said, stopping the metronome. We've done enough for today. We're going to be continuing with this for the rest of the week, until every one of you can broadcast at least a couple of words. Once that's done, we shall venture out of the classroom and continue somewhere that is not a controlled environment. It all becomes a lot trickier when you have distractions all around you. Any questions? Axelia raised her hand. Will we be taught how to stop people from reading our minds? Miss Wicked nodded. Yes, but not in this module. First you learn how to do it. Then you learn how to stop it. Anyone else? No? Good. Dismissed. Omen picked up his bag as everyone started filing out. He turned to Augur. What? he said, a little more defensively than he'd intended. Nothing, Augur responded. Then why are you grinning? I'm just happy, Augur said. He passed Omen, put a hand on his shoulder and leaned in. I will never look at Miss Wicked in the same way again. I swear to God. Omen sagged and Augur walked out, grinning even more broadly. Omen followed him, aware that Miss Wicked was watching him leave. He glanced up, saw the unimpressed look on her face, and hurried on. Chapter 43 Skullduggery was waiting for her on the pier in Haggard. Valkyrie was feeling better this morning less manic. She'd had the music box on all night as she slept, and as a result she was a lot more... steady. I'm sorry, she said. I know I apologised, but I am sorry for yesterday. It's okay. I didn't mean to do it. I know. I didn't want to do it. It just happened. You lost control of your magic, Skullduggery said. I understand that. You don't have to apologize. I've already forgiven you. Thank you, she said. Can I have a hug? Of course you can, he said, and they hugged. Feel better? Much, she said, and looked at the sea. So where is it? Where's what? This boat you said we're getting. I assume it's a boat and not a submarine or something. I don't think I'd like being in a submarine. Very enclosed. It's a boat, Skullduggery said, nodding. Or a ship, to be more precise. They're very touchy about things like that. Who are? Pirates. She gaped at him. We're getting a lift with pirates? It's a pirate ship. It stands to reason that there'll be pirates on it. Her eyes narrowed. What kind of pirates? The modern kind or the the old-fashioned kind? With the eye patches and the cutlasses and the parrots? Yes. Also, they're ghosts. It's a ghost ship. It's a cursed ship. And they're ghost pirates. A cursed ship is different to a ghost ship for a variety of reasons, but mostly because we wouldn't be able to travel on a ghost ship. We'd just fall right through the deck. Are they friendly? Ghost pirates? As a rule, no. As a matter of fact, I'm a little surprised that they agreed to do this. I always thought they hated me. Why would they hate you? Skullduggery shrugged. We all do things in our youth that would not be considered wise. I'm no different. What did you do? I was sixteen years old. In London, William Shakespeare was putting the finishing touches to Romeo and Juliet. France had declared war on Spain. The steering wheel had just been invented, but wouldn't come into common usage for another three hundred and two years. And I had stowed away on a merchant ship in search of adventure, as was the custom at the time. Wait, Valkyrie said. Is this where you first met Ghastly? It is indeed, Skullduggery replied. 
We were both arrogant, brash young men back then. Insufferable, really. Wow, you've changed so much. He ignored that. Bonds are formed when you stow away on the same ship, you know. Friendships are forged. Get to the pirates. Three weeks into our voyage, we were set upon by the King's Fury, the most feared ship on the seven seas, captained by Edgar Dudgeon, a man with a heart as black as coal. The ship and its crew had been cursed. They needed to find the treasure of Bravo Cortez within a year, or they would spend eternity as wraiths upon the waves. By the time they boarded our little merchant vessel, they had eleven days left in which to find this treasure. They were desperate, raiding every ship they passed, killing everyone they found if they didn't know anything that could help them. And nobody did. Ghastly and I managed to convince Captain Dudgeon that we knew where the treasure of Bravo Cortez was hidden. In exchange for our crew's freedom, we'd take them there. And where did you actually take them? He shrugged. Left a bit, right a bit, straight on. Essentially, we led them nowhere for eight days. On the ninth day, however, we performed a spectacular escape, after which we were promptly recaptured. Valkyrie frowned. Can it really be called an escape if you're caught again immediately? Yes, I don't think it can. This is my story, Valkyrie. You can have your own story, where things can be called whatever you want them to be called. Right now, this is mine, and this is how it happened. So, on the tenth day, we escaped for a second time, and were recaptured once more. There are limited places to run on a ship. On the eleventh day, when it became clear that we didn't know anything, Captain Dudgeon prepared to kill us. By making you walk the plank? by getting us stabbed with swords. Oh. You look so disappointed. No, that's fine. We were surrounded, sharpened blades leveled at our hearts, snarling faces. It's just, Valkyrie said, what's the point of being a pirate and doing pirate stuff if you don't take advantage of the fact that you have a sea and you have a plank and you can make people walk off that plank into that sea? That's all I'm saying. It seems like it'd be a missed opportunity to do anything else. I think you've become overly fixated on the plank. They're pirates, though. They're not highwaymen or... Can I finish my story? Valkyrie sighed. Sure. Thank you. Where was I? They had you surrounded, but obviously you escaped. He tilted his head. Don't say it like that. Like what? Like that. Dismissively. It was a wonderful escape. There was fighting and swordplay and fireballs and clambering up the rigging and swinging from masts. It was very, very exciting. Okay, said Valkyrie. So tell me about that. Well, I just did. Oh, just there. You were right. Valkyrie said. It was very exciting. He was starting to sound grumpy. So we fought them until the deadline passed and the curse hit and that's the end. How did you get off the ship? It doesn't matter. No, Skullduggery, it does matter. I'm sorry if I ruined your story. Please tell me how it ends. He didn't respond. Please? She asked. We jumped off and swam. She blinked. That's it? It was a long swim. Even with our magic, we could have drowned. Okay. I was almost eaten by a shark. Yeah? I mean, it was a small one, but yes. Didn't you once tell me that the story of how you met Ghastly wasn't very exciting at all? And yet it's full of fighting and escape attempts. He shrugged. We'd just met. I didn't want to appear to be bragging. Yes, she said, because that would have totally given me the wrong impression of you. They looked at each other. They're here, Skullduggery said, and Valkyrie turned to watch a thick fog rolling in.
there was a shape within that fog, a darkness, and that darkness sharpened to a point as a prow burst through the fog, and the king's fury came after it, a huge ship with black sails and the jolly Roger fluttering from the highest mast. Awesome, Valkyrie whispered. The king's fury veered away from the pier, and Skullduggery wrapped an arm round Valkyrie's waist, and they lifted off the ground. They landed on deck as the ship turned back to open waters, not slowing down even for a moment. Grizzled ghost pirates stared. Valkyrie could just about see through them. It was weird. Captain Dudgeon, Skullduggery said, nodding to a pirate with a long black beard and a three-cornered hat. Very good to see you again. Dudgeon peered at them. I don't seem to be understanding, he said. Skullduggery tilted his head. What would be the problem? Dudgeon bared his teeth in confusion. The upper row was golden. The lower row was rotten. Valkyrie didn't want to know how he'd ever eaten anything. We're here to facilitate passage for a landlubber named Skullduggery Pleasant and his companion, Dudgeon said. At no stage did anyone mention a talking skeleton. Skeletons are bad luck on ships, said one of the other pirates. Probably. Throw it over the side, said another. Ah, uh, no, Skullduggery said. You see, I am Skullduggery Pleasant. It's me, Captain. Dudgeon frowned. You're the boy. Indeed, I am. What happened to you? I was killed, Skullduggery said, and I came back to life without my flesh. Highly unconventional, I grant you, but then I've led a highly unconventional life. As have we all, have we not? He looked around, nodding to the pirates. They just gazed back. You're alive, then? Dudgeon asked. In a manner of speaking. A pirate raised his hand. How come you don't fall apart? Magic. And where's that other fella? Dudgeon asked. The scarred fella. Did he change too? He looked at Valkyrie. Did he turn into you? Not quite, she responded. My name's Valkyrie Kane. Thank you for welcoming us onto your fine ship. Dudgeon grunted. Fine ship indeed. Most feared ship of the seven seas, so it is. I've heard. You must be very proud. The captain peered at her. Aye, he said again, then turned and shouted. All right, you scurvy-ridden sea dogs. You know where we're going. Make haste. Valkyrie smiled to herself as the ghost pirates hurried back to work all around her. Every now and then, life definitely had a way of delighting her. Chapter 44 They're going to kill us, aren't they? Valkyrie murmured to Skullduggery two hours later, as they stood together on the prow of the ship. The king's fury cut through the waves, faster than it had any right to, blowing her hair back off her face. She was freezing. Her clothes were damp with sea spray, and she tasted salt on her tongue. They're going to try, Skullduggery responded. She sighed. Are we at least getting close to Nye's underwater lab? Judging by our speed and our trajectory, we should be approaching the coordinates Kason gave you as we speak. I just wish we could meet people who didn't want to attack us all the time. It's a sad state of affairs, all right. She tied her hair into a ponytail. Okay, then, she said. We may as well get it over with. They turned to face Captain Dudgeon and his crew, their cutlasses already drawn. I'd like to say this is entirely unexpected, Skullduggery announced. But unfortunately, it is not. Dudgeon grinned. Surprised! Skullduggery tilted his head. No, I just... I just said that. When? Just then. Dudgeon scowled. Well, I didn't hear you. 
You're right in front of me. It's hard to hear every little word over the wind and the sea and the... Anyway, you'll be wanting to shut up now. You're our prisoners, and you remember the policy for prisoners on the King's Fury, don't you? If I recall correctly, they don't last long. Right you are, said Dudgeon. Over four hundred years ago, you tricked us into an eternity trapped as ghosts. For four hundred years, we've been planning our revenge. But I came to you. And now you're in our grasp. No, Skullduggery said. My point is, in all these four hundred years, you had to wait until I came to you. That's not very good planning. We didn't have much of a choice, Dudgeon snarled. We were cursed to never again set foot on land, thanks to you and your scarred friend. You can't blame Skullduggery and Ghastly for what happened, though, said Valkyrie. You got the curse put on yourselves. You spent a year trying and failing to find the treasure of whoever. Bravo, Cartag! came a chorus from the pirates. In the last, what, eleven days, Skullduggery and Ghastly may have led you on a wild goose chase, or whatever the nautical equivalent of that is, but if you're honest with yourselves, you'd have to admit that you wouldn't have found the treasure anyway. In fact, Skullduggery chimed in, because you believed us when we told you we knew where it was hidden. Your last few days as mortals were happy ones. We gave you that. We gave you that happiness. The pirates frowned, started muttering amongst themselves. Finally, Dudgeon shook his head. No, he said. You gave us false hope, and that's the worst kind of hope there is. It's entirely possible that we'd have found someone who genuinely knew where the treasure was buried. Instead, we put our faith in two horn swagglers. The ghost pirates repeated that word. Horn swagglers and shook their fists and their cutlasses, and generally looked very, very angry. There was no talking their way out of this situation. Valkyrie could see that now. The pirate closest to her looked away to grouch to his friend, and Valkyrie stepped in with a right hook to the jaw. In theory. In practice, her fist passed through his head, and he jumped back, startled. Everyone else fell silent. You can't do that, he shouted. You can't just put your hands through me. My body is a sovereign entity. Another pirate, a particularly thin one, sighed. You don't have a body, Tristan. I have the form of one. I have the memory of one. I didn't mean to put my hand through you, Valkyrie clarified. I just meant to punch you. I didn't know that would happen. I'm sorry. Yeah, said a pirate from the back of the crowd. Calm down, Tristan. Shut up, Bernard! Tristan screeched. Please excuse me, Valkyrie said. I haven't had a lot of experience with ghosts. I didn't know the rules. I'm genuinely sorry. Tristan took a deep breath and nodded. Very well, he said. I'm willing to forget this. It was a shock and it was very distressing, but, but I just want to put it behind me and move on. I forgive you. Thank you, said Valkyrie. Are you both quite finished? asked Dudgeon. Because if you don't mind, I'd rather like to get to the killing part of the afternoon. Valkyrie frowned. How are you going to kill us if we can't touch each other? Dudgeon smiled an unpretty smile and stepped forward, his finger raised. You can't touch us, Skirly, but we can touch you. He poked Valkyrie in the chest. She felt it. Well, said Valkyrie, that hardly seems fair. Life isn't fair, said the captain. Life isn't designed to be fair. We're born unequal. Some are strong, some are weak. Some fast, some slow, some clever, some not. Some have the luck about them. Others wallow in misfortune. Fairness means nothing. And so you must take your opportunities when they present themselves. And I intend to take this opportunity to kill the man who condemned us to this fresh hell. Valkyrie raised a hand. 
Does that mean I can go? Dudgeon considered it. No! But I wasn't even there. I had nothing to do with any of this. We're still going to kill you, though. Oh, man, Valkyrie muttered. Captain! A pirate yelled from the crow's nest on the very top of the main mast. Ship to starboard! Closing fast! It's the savagery! They all turned. A large patch of impossibly dense fog was moving towards them fast. Ah, bugger, muttered Dudgeon. Then he shouted, Avast, ye lads! Prepare for battle! The deck was suddenly a scramble of ghostly bodies, some of them passing through Valkyrie. She shivered every single time. The savagery? she asked Skullduggery. Another cursed ship, he told her, captained by a bloodthirsty maniac and crewed by the most merciless killers on the Seven Seas. I thought the King's Fury had the most merciless killers on the Seven Seas. He shook his head. The King's Fury is the most feared ship. The savagery has the most merciless killers. Which is worse? He shrugged. Much of a muchness, really. Chapter 45 The savagery loomed out of the fog, a great beast with a sharp prow. Her masts were taller than the masts on King's Fury, and she was longer and fatter. Valkyrie could see the leering, screaming faces of the crew and the cutlasses they waved over their heads. She frowned. Are they going to hit us? The savagery collided with King's Fury, and Valkyrie was thrown backwards. She slammed against a couple of barrels, her heart lurching as violently as the ship itself. The two ships sailed onwards, side by side, ploughing through the waters. Ropes were thrown from the savagery. Ghost ropes. The savagery's crew boarded. Suddenly, the ghost pirates were screaming and shouting and trying to kill each other. Valkyrie watched them fight, watched them hack and slash and stab and swing. It was hard to keep track of it all. She switched on her aura vision, and that was better. Skullduggery pulled her to her feet, and they dodged between the fighting, those cutlasses coming awfully close. One of the pirates, she couldn't tell which side he was on, saw her and decided he wanted to kill something made of good old-fashioned flesh and blood. He came for her, and she watched her hand rise, watched her lightning leap from her fingertips and connect with the pirate's aura. The aura convulsed and exploded into nothingness, taking the pirate with it. The other pirates stopped fighting. They stared at her. Valkyrie switched off her aura vision. You killed him, said someone. She can't have, said someone else. You can't kill what's dead. She did, a pirate close to her whispered. Skullduggery stepped forward. We should probably be leaving now, he announced. Captain Dudgeon, thank you for the ride. It was very much appreciated. To everyone else, feel free to get back to the fighting. But the pirates weren't looking at her any more. Valkyrie turned as something swooped down, bony arms wrapping round her, then heaved her off the deck and away from the ship. She looked down to the sea churning below, to the long serpent body that disappeared beneath the waves. Long hair, wet and knotted and twisted with seaweed, whipped across her face. Valkyrie pulled one arm free, used it to push herself back, but the creature's grip was too strong. A long face appeared between that curtain of hair, old and lined, the cheeks hollow, the nose hooked, the eyes sunken but bright. The sea hag gave her a smile of rotting teeth and breath that stank of fish, and then they plummeted into the water. Chapter 46 Oh, it was cold. She had thought she was cold before, standing on the deck of the King's Fury, but that was nothing. That was a summer's breeze compared to this. The cold surrounded her. It seeped into her. It divided her mind and cleaved her thoughts, then swept them to one side and filled what was left with the cold and the dark and the wet. Valkyrie focused on what little she could still feel, the arms round her, the body against her. She opened her eyes 
but her vision was obscured by dark hair, her own or the sea hag's, she couldn't tell. The sea hag, from all those years ago. She turned her head, saw the hag's serpent body, long and writhing, coiling into the dark. She saw Skullduggery moving towards her like a torpedo, but the serpent body convulsed and slammed into him, and the sea hag pulled Valkyrie away and brought her twisting downwards. For the first time she thought about air, and thought about how little of it she had in her lungs. Her instinct was to struggle and bite, to reach up and plunge her thumb into the sea hag's eye. But the sea hag was drowning her and desperate exertions were only going to use up whatever oxygen she had left. So she calmed the hell down and brought her magic out to play. Her whole body crackled and the sea hag released her in an instant, screaming as she recoiled, and Valkyrie broke away, flying now through the water. Her lungs burned. She fought the urge to suck in a breath. She piled on the speed. Any moment now she'd burst into the air. Any moment now any moment. But it was dark, dark and getting darker. Dimly she knew she'd been twisted around, had lost her sense of up and down, but the darkness meant that she was going down, getting deeper. Valkyrie arched her back, swung her arms up, pulled out of the dive and headed in the opposite direction. The darkness was following her now. It was dark everywhere. Her lungs were steel traps, but they burned, they were on fire, and they were setting off fireworks in her brain. The crackling faded. She was slowing, didn't know where she was. The crackling stopped. She drifted. The cold came in again. But it was nice this time. It soothed her. It played with her hair and prized at her lungs. Open up. Just a little. After everything she'd done, all the terrible things. All she had to do was open up and let the water in, and she wouldn't have to feel bad any more. A shape moved in the darkness. Long hair, serpent tail. Hands gripped her, a face, a mouth on hers. A kiss. Sweet oxygen rushed down her throat to her lungs, inflating them, expanding them. Strength exploded within her, ran to her numb toes and the tips of her tingling fingers. It filled her mind with thoughts. The kiss broke off. Valkyrie raised her hand and lit it up like a lantern. It wasn't the sea hag who held her, but a young woman with soft lips, beautiful eyes and glorious hair. Valkyrie couldn't help it. She looked down, down past the torso down to where the hips swelled and the fishtail began. A fishtail, not a serpent tail, a fishtail. A mermaid, a proper mermaid. The mermaid kissed her again and Valkyrie took what oxygen she could and then they were travelling, moving astonishingly fast with apparently very little effort. As tightly as the mermaid was holding her, Valkyrie was aware of every rhythmic swish and sway. The way the creature moved was hypnotic. There was a light in the dark, then more lights as they drew closer. The underwater laboratory was a series of brightly lit glass bubbles, like upturned goldfish bowls as big as houses. The mermaid took Valkyrie to the smallest bowl, and they swooped in underneath and slowed as they came up, breaking through to the surface. Valkyrie gasped, sucked in air blinking quickly to clear her vision. The mermaid took her to the edge of the pool and gave her a little push up out of the water. Valkyrie's hands and knees were suddenly on dry, solid ground. It was warm here too, and filled with plants. They grew from pots and hung low from the domed glass ceiling. A path of stone led to a door. Valkyrie stood and turned. The mermaid rested both arms on the edge of the platform, and smiled up at her. Hello, the mermaid said. Hi, my name is Una. What's your name? Valkyrie. That's not your real name. No, said Valkyrie. It's my taken name. Oh, said Una. We only have one name down here. It's simpler. 
It's very nice to meet you, Una. You saved my life. Una shrugged her bare shoulders. Are you here to see Dr. Nye? I am. Is it here? Una nodded. Do you work for it? Valkyrie asked. Una laughed. <laughs> we don't work for anyone. How many of you are there? There are enough. I don't want to be rude or anything, but could I ask what you are? What do I look like? A mermaid. Another smile. I am a maiden of the sea. You can call me a mermaid if you like. Valkyrie took off her coat, looked around for somewhere to hang it, then just laid it wetly on the ground. Thank you for saving me. You're welcome. The sea hag is unpleasant. She certainly hasn't changed much since we first met. Una raised an eyebrow. Do you know her? Not really, but the first time I met her she was living in a lake. Una laughed. <laughs> yes, we heard about that. It is indeed a pity she didn't stay there. I don't think she likes you. I think you might be right. Are you feeling unwell? You're shivering. The water's pretty cold, but I can warm up, Valkyrie said, and held out her arms, letting her magic crackle. Una stared in wonder, her eyes reflecting the light show. Valkyrie stopped before her clothes began to scorch. She was warmer and a lot drier, even if her clothes and hair were still damp. That was beautiful, Una said. Did you happen to see my friend before you saved me? Valkyrie asked. He's a skeleton in a suit. A suit of clothes? Yes. Your skeletons wear clothes? Just him. That is most odd, Una said. But then I find the human obsession with clothes to be a source of endless puzzlement. When I was on the surface, humans followed me around and insisted on covering me with fabric. They were very insistent. You were on the surface? Long ago, said Una. Did you... did you have legs? Oh, yes, Una said, with feet and everything. On the surface we have legs. In the seas, we revert to our natural state. Wow. But I have never understood clothes. They have their uses. They keep us warm and dry, and shoes protect our feet, and pockets are cool. Pockets? That's where we keep stuff. But my friend, the skeleton, have you seen him? Is that him there? Una asked, looking over Valkyrie's shoulder. She turned. Skullduggery waved to her from outside the bubble. She pointed at the pool, and he nodded and sank from sight and a moment later he broke through the surface of the water and rose up until he could step off onto the platform. You're alive, he said to her. You lost your hat, she replied. I did, and that is unfortunate. He moved his hands away from his body and the water drifted from him in droplets. He guided them back to the pool, then brushed at his jacket. But I would choose you over a hat every time. What? I'm just saying that I'd... It would be a choice. He stopped brushing and looked at her. Sorry? You'd need to actually choose between me and your hat? It wouldn't be an automatic thing? You'd have to pause and consider the options? Ha! Huh, Skullduggery said. I had thought that what I'd said was a good thing. Now I see that it wasn't. I apologise, and will now change the subject. He stepped towards Una, hand outstretched. Hello. Una rose up and shook his hand. You are Skullduggery, she said. I am Una. I take it you are here to see Dr. Nye also? Indeed. Is it in? That depends, said Una. Do you promise not to kill it? I can't actually promise that, no. Una pointed at the door. In which case, the doctor is through there, she said, and smiled. Chapter 47 Beyond the door was a passageway of glass, a tunnel encircled by water. Fish pulsed around Valkyrie and Skullduggery as they walked, slashes of colour emerging from the dark, and then sinking back into it once again. It was hypnotic, restful. 
Valkyrie's eyes refocused on her reflection, and she scowled. My hair's gone frizzy. I didn't want to say anything, Skullduggery responded. I was talking to the pretty mermaid with her glorious hair, while I looked like I'd electrocuted myself, which I suppose I kind of had. She did her best to smooth her hair down, but it didn't do much good. There was a circular door ahead of them, metal, almost as wide as the tunnel itself, with a wheel in its centre. Skullduggery gestured for Valkyrie to go ahead, so she spun the wheel and heard a click and had to put her shoulder to it to get it to move. Once she had it moving, the door swung freely and she stepped over the lip and into a large, brightly lit glass dome which housed the laboratory. Music was playing. Something classical. Dr. Nye didn't look up from the microscope it was stooped over. Of course, it said. Of course you're here. Of course you would find me. Of course you could not leave me in peace. Hello, Doc, Valkyrie said, all smiles as she wandered over. Nye wasn't wearing its surgical cap today, so its mottled scalp, decorated with a few wispy strands of hair, was hers to examine the closer she got. There were some sores on that scalp. A few had scabbed over. A few were open and weeping. Nye raised its head. Its eyes, yellow and small and far apart, blinked quickly and its long, thin mouth twisted at one corner in annoyance. It didn't have a nose, just another open wound. Is Whisper here? Valkyrie asked. She's cool. I liked her. I know I've only met her once, and that was when I was threatening you and demanding to know where Abyssinia was, but I think we could be friends. She hated you, said Nye. I don't think that's true. She despised you. She told me so. Valkyrie shrugged. First impressions aren't really that important, though. That's what I always say. It's on the third or fourth impression that you really start to build up an idea of who a person is. So, is she here? I have switched patrons, said Nye. So Whisper is no longer my bodyguard. Switched, eh? Skullduggery said. So you're no longer working for Seraphina Day. Did you know that's who you were working for, up there in that castle, in those mountains? At the time, I did not, said Nye. And who are you working for now? Nye looked at them both. Why are you here? it asked. Is this about Abyssinia again? I do not know where that woman is, and I have no wish to ever see her again. It's not about Abyssinia, said Valkyrie. It's about your work. And what work would that be? Your work on the soul. Nye nodded and stood. It was about ten feet tall, not nearly as tall as it had been when Valkyrie had first encountered it. Krengarians of a certain age tended to shrink, apparently, right up until their death. Nye picked up a tray of petri dishes with its long-fingered hands and took it to a nearby desk. And if I help you? We leave, Valkyrie said. We just walk out of here without putting you in shackles and slinging you back into Iron Point Jail. Very well, it said. Please make this quick. I have a lot of work to do. We want to know how to heal a soul, Valkyrie said. Hmm, said Nye, and didn't move for a moment. Then it looked up. You don't. You can't. A soul is not a physical thing, and so it cannot be hurt. If it cannot be hurt, it cannot be healed. But a soul can be broken. Pieces go missing. It is then a matter of finding the missing pieces and allowing it to put itself back together. And how do we do that? That all depends on the type of death experienced. Some souls dissipate. Some roam. Some barely move from the spot where the death occurred. 
I cannot say why one death is different to another, and even my studies have yielded contradictory results. The secrets of the soul, I think, were never meant for the likes of us. Nye smiled. That doesn't mean I will not seize them when I can, of course. I'm looking to repair my sister's soul, Valkyrie said. Where do I start? First, tell me where and how she died. She died in Roarhaven, killed by the Death Touch Gauntlet, Valkyrie said, revived with a sunburst. Interesting, said Nye. Not the sunburst. The sunburst is just a tool. But the gauntlet was designed to kill even those who would normally be able to recover from the slight inconvenience of death. At a single touch, it stops the body and the brain from functioning and eradicates any magic that might circumvent one's mortality. It does this by scattering the soul. The essence of who we are splinters and vacates the physical form. That didn't happen with Darkess, Valkyrie said. I'm sorry? Darkess had taken over my body. The gauntlet was used to kill me and to kick her out. She wasn't splintered. I would imagine Darkess's soul to be vastly different to other people's, Nye said. I would have loved to have examined her. Yeah, said Valkyrie. I'd have loved to see you try. If the gauntlet scattered Alice's soul, Skullduggery said, then where are the pieces? Nye sat back. I assume the girl is responsive? Aware? She's completely normal, said Valkyrie, apart from the fact that she never gets sad. Then she was revived in time for at least part of her soul to return to her body. If you can retrieve the other fragment or fragments, I believe you can reattach them. But I find it interesting that you wish to pursue this course at all. Your sister cannot get sad, yes? That sounds like a happy life. Why would you want to reunite her? with the aspect of her soul that brings sorrow. She's damaged, said Valkyrie. I need to fix her. Perhaps she would argue that she doesn't need to be fixed. I'm not having this conversation with you, Valkyrie said. I'm responsible for breaking her apart and I'm going to put her back together. You're going to tell me how to do that. First we need to know how to find the fragments, Skullduggery said. Do you have a way for us to do that? Nye hesitated. You do, Skullduggery said. But you don't want to tell us what it is. It's not that, said Nye. It's merely... It's a device, and you don't want to part with it. Nye sagged. Valkyrie picked up a box with wires poking out of it. Is this it? No, said Nye. She dropped it. It smashed on the ground, and Nye gasped as she picked up something else. Is this it? Here it is, Nye said quickly, scuttling over to an old globe in a brass stand. Please, don't break anything else. Skullduggery took the globe. It was about the size of a football. How do we use it? he asked. It will need to latch on to what remains of the girl's soul. Nye answered. Once it has done this, it will find whatever fragments there are and direct you to them. And once we've located the fragments, how do we retrieve them? A simple soul catcher should suffice. Once you have collected all the errant fragments, you will need to isolate your sister and then simply break the soul catcher. The fragments will return home. And the soul will put itself back together once they're inside her? Indeed. It's that easy? The process should be straightforward, yes. Valkyrie smiled, laughed. Well, 
OK, then. OK. This is good. This is great. And now, said Nye, a warning. Chapter 48 Valkyrie's smile failed. A warning? It is entirely possible that the fragments have remained independent, Dr. Nye said. If, however, a fragment has found a host, then it is inside a living being with a soul of its own. Because of the damage it has sustained, there is a possibility that the fragment will have merged with this other soul in order to maintain its integrity. If this has happened, Skullduggery said, how do we separate it from its host? If it has merged fully with its host's soul, said the doctor, there will be nothing you can do. That fragment is now gone. If, however, it has not merged fully, then the sister will need to be nearby. Her presence should pull the fragment to her. Valkyrie looked at Skullduggery. We have to go. Instead, Skullduggery folded his arms. He tapped a finger against his chin. Skullduggery? Doctor, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie can see souls. Nye's small eyes widened. She can. I can see auras, she corrected. Same thing, Skullduggery said. What's more, Doctor? Her powers seem to be directly attuned to them. Just a short time ago, I witnessed what appeared to be the full dispersal of a ghost. Nye stared at Valkyrie. You killed a ghost? No, she said immediately. I mean, I don't think so. You can't kill a ghost, can you? Instead of bringing her sister with us to coax out the fragment, couldn't Valkyrie do it? Skullduggery continued. If she can see the soul and touch the soul, surely she'd be able to separate the soul. Yes, Nye whispered. Yes, this would be entirely possible. In theory, I... I should go with you to observe. This could help my research in innumerable... Forget it, Valkyrie said. We're not teaming up. Skullduggery, we have to go. Skullduggery nodded. I have just a few more questions for the good doctor. She put her hand on his arm. For all we know, a part of Alice's soul is just about to merge with someone else. We have to go now. Skullduggery, please. You go say your goodbyes to the mermaid, he responded. I need to know how to work this globe. One minute, said Valkyrie. I promise. She nodded and hurried out the way she came. Una still rested her elbows on the edge of the platform. She's been waiting, she said, rolling her eyes as the sea hag rose up from the water behind her. I don't have time for you, Valkyrie said. The sea hag's sneer was not a thing of beauty. You think you can dismiss me so easily? After what you've done? What have I done? Valkyrie said. Really now? What have I done that's so terrible that you're still trying to kill me? Is it really that I was rude to you over ten years ago? Seriously? The sea hag said nothing. I don't have time for these little vendettas that people like you seem to love. I've got enough going on without adding your drama to the list. So allow me to say I'm sorry. I'm so dreadfully sorry for being rude to you once upon a time. Are we over it now? Are we? The sea hag folded her long arms and a mermaid's head broke the surface of the pool behind her. Blonde hair. Beautiful. Another appeared beside her. And another. All looking at the sea hag. All intent. All focused. Valkyrie frowned. Hold on a second, she said. They burst upwards and they had spears in their hands, harpoons, and they drove them into the sea hag's torso and the sea hag thrashed and screeched. Valkyrie jumped back as the mermaids kept their grip on the weapons, keeping the sea hag from swimming away. 
With gritted teeth and bulging muscles, they forced her backwards, moving her torso out of the pool and onto the platform. Another mermaid rose, handed a harpoon to Una, and with a kick, Una propelled herself out of the water completely, her fishtail splitting, forming human legs that drank in and swallowed the scales, and she dropped, the harpoon aimed at the sea hag's heart. Valkyrie lunged, colliding with Una after she landed, but before the harpoon could sink into the sea hag's chest. They went rolling. The harpoon fell. Una's hand closed around Valkyrie's throat, and Una came up to her feet and lifted Valkyrie, slamming her against the glass wall. Valkyrie brought both fists down onto Una's arm and buckled the elbow. But Una went to grab her again with her left hand, and Valkyrie kicked at her newly formed knee, twirled her round, and snaked her arm under her chin. Calm down, she said into Una's ear. Una struggled, and Valkyrie tightened the stranglehold until she stopped. The other mermaids were glaring at Valkyrie, but they were too busy holding on to the harpoons that pinned the sea hag to do anything about it. She hates you! Una managed to garble. She tried to kill you! Lots of people try to kill me, Valkyrie replied. If I took it all personally, I wouldn't have any friends. No one dies because of me, not if I can help it. Skullduggery walked in, the globe tucked under his arm and a soul catcher in his hand. He surveyed the situation. I see, he said, put down the globe and took out his gun. He waved it at the mermaids. Move away, please. Thank you. Move away. One by one, the mermaids withdrew their harpoons and swayed backwards. I'm going to release you now, Valkyrie said to Una. If you try anything, it won't go well for you. Una said nothing until Valkyrie let her go and stepped away. The mermaid glared. This is a mistake. Probably. You will come to regret this. Some day in the future you will need the help of the maidens of the sea and you will not have it. I think I'll cope. The mermaids disappeared under the water. Una glared once again and then let herself fall backwards. The water claimed her and she was gone. Skullduggery put away his gun and handed the soul catcher to Valkyrie. Dr. Nye had a spare one of these lying around, he said. Your friendship with the mermaids didn't last particularly long. Just once, she said, I'd like to meet a new group of people and not be their enemy. Why? the sea hag said weakly. Why did you help me? Helping people is what we do, Valkyrie said. Are you okay? Do you need a doctor? I will heal, said the sea hag, lifting herself up. She started swaying. But I do not understand. You hate me. No, I don't. The sea hag shook her head. None of this makes any sense. I'm not going to just stand around and watch someone get murdered, okay? I don't care who they are. I... I may have misjudged you. That's okay. From the tangle of her hair, the sea hag drew a small golden bell. Grimacing in pain, she leaned forward, placing it in Valkyrie's hand. I owe you a debt, she said. Don't worry about it, said Valkyrie. Just heal your wounds and carry on with your life. I will. The sea hag's smile was awful and smelled of fish. Thank you. Why do they try to kill you anyway? Skullduggery asked, picking up the globe. The sea hag swayed back to the pool. They have always hated me and mocked me for how I look. I'm not beautiful like they are. I don't have a dainty fish tail like they do. I also eat their young. I'm sorry, Valkyrie said. They're young, said the sea hag. The eggs they lay, I eat them sometimes. Valkyrie stared. Thank you again, the sea hag said. 
If you ever need my help, ring my bell, and I will be there. She sank into the water and was gone. Huh, Skullduggery said. Oh, God, said Valkyrie. You may have allied yourself with the wrong side, Skullduggery said, rising off his feet and drifting over the pool. Valkyrie jumped and he caught her, his arm round her waist. It's just she's so ugly, she said, and they're all so pretty, so I naturally assumed they were secretly the bad guys because they were ganging up on the ugly one. I thought... I thought... A common mistake, Skullduggery said as they sank down. The water rushed out of their way and surrounded the bubble of oxygen the lower they went. Just because someone is ugly on the outside doesn't mean they're not even uglier on the inside. The reverse is also true for the beautiful. The trick, you see, is to never assume anything, she finished. Quite. With Valkyrie holding the soul catcher and Skullduggery holding the globe and Valkyrie, they moved down and then sideways, away from the glass domes of the laboratory, away from the light and the warmth. They travelled into the cold and the dark, the water flowing all around them, and Valkyrie stopped talking. To talk was to use up oxygen and to risk distracting Skullduggery. She looked at the bell in her hand, then put it in her pocket, careful not to let it ring. <laughs>